Are we here? We all here? Can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, I'm going to be starting, um, going to be reading a new book series. Same author, Darren Chan. Going to be reading his uh, Demonata saga. Going to start off with the first book, Lord Loss. And I hope you are all ready. Here we go. Start off with a little poem. Lord Loss sows all the sorrows of the world. Lord Loss seeds the grief starched trees. In the center of the web, lowly Lord Loss bows his head. Mangled hands, naked eyes, fanged snakes his soul line. Curled inside like textured sin, bloody curdled sheets for skin. In the center of the web, vile Lord Loss torments the dead. Over strands of red, Lord Loss crawls, dispensing pain, despising all. Shuns friends, nurtures foes, ravages hopes, breeds woe. Drinks moons, devours suns twirls his thumbs till the reaper comes. In the center of the web, lush Lord Loss is all that's left. Chapter one, Rat Guts. Double history on a Wednesday afternoon. Total nightmare. A few minutes ago, I would have said I couldn't imagine anything worse. But when there's a knock on the door and it opens and I spot my mum outside, I realize life can always get worse. When a parent turns up at school unexpected, it means one of two things. Either somebody close to you has been seriously injured or died, or you're in trouble. My immediate reaction, please don't let anybody be dead. I think of dad, Gret, uncles, aunts, cousins. It could be any of them. Alive and kicking this morning, now stiff and cold, tongue sticking out, a slab of dead meat just waiting to be buried. I remember Grant's funeral, the open coffin, the shining flesh, having to kiss her forehead, the pain, the tears, Please don't let anybody be dead. Please, 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 please. Then I see mum's face, white with rage. And I know she's here to punish, not comfort. I groan, roll my eyes and mutter under my breath. Bring on the corpses. The head's office. Me, Mum, and Mr. Donnellan. Mum's ranting and raving about cigarettes. I've been smoking behind the bike shed, the oldest cliche in the book. She wants to know if the head's aware of this, or what the pupils in his school are getting up to. I feel a bit sorry for Mr. Donnellan. He has to sit there looking like a schoolboy himself, shuffling his feet and saying he didn't know this was going on, and then he'll launch an investigation and put a quick end to it. Liar. Of course he knew. Every school has a smoking area. That's life. Teachers don't approve, but they turn a blind eye most of the time. Certain kids smoke. Fact. Safer to, the, safer to have them smoking at school than sneaking off the grounds during breaks and at lunch. Mum knows that too. She must. She was young once, like she's always reminding me. Kids were no different in mum's time. If she stopped for a minute and thought back, she'd see what a bloody embarrassment she's being. I wouldn't mind having a go at me at home, but you don't march into school and start laying down the law in the headmaster's office. She's out of order, big time. But it's not like I can tell her, is it? I can't just pipe up with, 
Oi, mother, you're embarrassing us both, so shut your trap. I smirk at the thought. And of course, that's when mom pauses for the briefest of moments and catches me. What are you grinning at? She roars. And then she's off again. I'm smoking myself into an early grave. The school's responsible. What sort of freak show is Mr. Donnellan running? la di la di la di la di la di la Boring. Her rant at school is nothing compared to the one I get at home, though. Screaming at the top of her lungs. Blue bloody murder. She's going to send me off to boarding school. No, military school. Yeah, let's see how I like that. Having to get up at dawn each morning and do a hundred press-ups before breakfast. How does that sound? Is breakfast a fry-up or some cereally yogurty crap? Is my response. And I know the second it's out of my mouth that it's the wrong thing to say. This isn't the time for the famed Grubbs Grady brand of cutting edge humor. Cue the enraged mum fireworks. Who do I think I am? Do I know how much they spend on me? What if I get kicked out of school? Then the clincher, the one mums all over the world love pulling out of their hats. Just you wait until your father gets home. Dad is not as freaked out as mum, but he's not happy. He tells me how disappointed he is. They've warned me so many times about the dangers of smoking, how it destroys people's lungs and gives them cancer. Smoking's dumb, he says. We're in the kitchen. I haven't been out of it since mum dragged me home from school early, except to go to the toilet. It's disgusting, antisocial, and lethal. Why do it, Grubbs? I thought you had more sense. I shrug wordlessly. What's there to say? They're being unfair. Of course smoking's dumb. Of course it gives you cancer. Of course I shouldn't be doing it. But my friends smoke. It's cool. You get to hang out with cool people at lunch and talk about cool things. But only if you smoke. You can't be in if you're out. And they know that. Yeah, here they stand, acting all Gestapo, asking me to account for my actions. How long has he been smoking? That's what I want to know. Mum started to referring to me in the third person since Dad arrived. I'm beneath direct mention. Yes, Dad says. How long, Grubbs? I don't know. Weeks? Months? Longer? A few months, maybe, but only a couple a day. <laughs> if he says a couple, he means at least five or six, Mum snorts. No, I don't, I shout. I mean a couple. Don't raise your voice to me, Mum roars back. Easy, Dad begins, but Mum goes on if she, as if he isn't there. Do you think it's clever, filling your lungs with rubbish, killing yourself? We didn't bring you up to watch you give yourself cancer. We don't need this, certainly not at this time, not when- Enough! Dad shouts, and we both jump. Dad almost never shouts. He usually gets very quiet when he's angry. Now his face is red and he's glaring, but at both of us, not just me. Mum coughs as if she's embarrassed. She sits, brushes her hair back off her face, and looks at me with wounded eyes. I hate when she pulls her face like this. It's impossible to look at her straight or argue. I want you to stop, Grobs, Dad says, back in control now. We're not going to punish you. Mum starts to object, but Dad silences her with a curt wave of his hand. But I want your word that you'll stop. I know it won't be easy. I know your friends will give you a hard time, but this is important. Some things matter more than looking cool. Will you promise, Grubbs? He pauses. Of course, that's if you're able to quit. Of course I'm able, I mutter. I'm not addicted or anything. Then will you, for your sake, not ours? I shrug, trying to act like it's no big thing, like I was planning to stop anyway. <laughs> sure, if you're going to make that much of a fuss about it, I yawn. Dad smiles, Mum smiles, I smile. Then Gret walks in the back door, and she's smiling too, but it's an evil Big sister superior smile. Have we sorted all our little problems out yet? She asks, 
voice high and fake innocent. And I know instantly, Gret grasped me up to mum. She found out I was smoking and she told the cow. As she swishes past, beaming like an angel, I burn fiery holes in the back of her head with my eyes and a single word echoes through my head like the sound of ungodly thunder. Revenge. I love rubbish dumps. You can find all sorts of disgusting stuff there. The perfect place to go browsing if you want to get even with your annoying traitor of a sister. I climb over mounts of garbage and root through black bags and soggy cardboard boxes. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to use or in what fashion, so I wait for inspiration to strike. Then, in a small plastic bag, I find six dead rats, necks broken, just starting to rot. Excellent. Look out, Grit. Here I come. Eating breakfast at the kitchen table. Radio turned down low, listening to the noises upstairs, trying not to giggle, waiting for the outburst. Grit's in her shower. She showers at least twice a day before she goes to school and when she gets back. Sometimes she has one before going to bed too. I don't know why anybody would bother to keep themselves so clean. I reckon it's a form of madness. Because she's so obsessed with showering, mum and dad gave her the ensuite bedroom. They figured I wouldn't mind, and I don't. In fact, it's perfect. I wouldn't have been able to pull my trick if Gret didn't have her own shower, with its very own towel rack. The shower goes off, splatters, then drips, then silence. I tense with excitement. I know Gret's routines inside out. She always pulls her towel down off its rack after she's showered, not before. I can't hear her footsteps, but I imagine her taking the three or four steps to the towel rack, reaching up, pulling it down, and... On cue! Screams galore! A shocked single scream to start, then a volley of them, one running into the other. I push my ball of socky cornflakes aside and prepare myself for the biggest laugh of the year. Mom and dad are by the sink, discussing the day ahead. They go stiff when they hear the screams, then dash towards the stairs, which I can see from where I'm sitting. Gret appears before they reach the stairs, crashes out of her room, screaming, slapping bloody shreds from her arms, tearing them from her hair. She's covered in red, towel clutched with one hand over her front, even terrified out of her wish, there's no way she's going to come down naked. What's wrong? Mom shouts. What's happening? Blood! Gret screams. I'm covered in blood! I pulled the towel down! I... She stops. She spotted me laughing. I'm doubled over. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. Mom turns and looks at me. Dad does too. They're speechless. Gret picks a sticky pink chunk out of her hair, slowly this time, and studies it. What did you put on my towel? She asks quietly. Rat guts! I howl, pounding the table, crying with laughter. <laughs> I got rats at the rubbish dump! Chop them up in there! I almost get sick I'm laughing so much. Mum stares at me. Dad stares at me. Gret stares at me. Then, you lousy son of a... I don't catch the rest of the insult. Gret flies down the stairs ahead of it. She drops her towel on the way. I don't have time to react before she's on me, slapping and scratching at my face. <laughs> What's wrong, Gretelda? I giggle, fending her off, calling her by the name she hates. She normally calls me Grubich in response, but she's too mad to think of it now. Scum! She shrieks. Then she lunges at me sharply, grabs my jaw, jerks my mouth open, and tries her hardest to stuff a handful of rat guts down my throat. I stop laughing instantly. A mouthful of rotten rat guts wasn't part of the grand uber joke. Get off! I roar, lashing out wildly. 
Mum and Dad suddenly recover and shout at exactly the same time. Stop that! Don't hit your sister! <laughs> She's a lunatic! I gasp, pushing myself away from the steaming Gret falling off my chair. He's an animal! Gret sobs, picking more chunks of guts from her hair, wiping rat blood from her face. I realise she's crying. Serious waterworks. And her face is as red as her long, straight hair. Not red from the blood, red from anger and shame and... fear? Mum picks up the dropped towel, takes it to Gret, and wraps it around her. Dad's just behind them, face as dark as death. Gret picks more strands and loops of rat guts from her hair, then howls with anguish. Oh, they're all over me! She yells, then throws some of the guts at me. You bloody little monster! You're the one who's bloody, I cackle. Gret dives my throat. No more! Dad doesn't raise his voice, but his tone stops us dead. Mum's staring at me with open disgust. Dad shooting daggers. I sense that I'm the only one who sees the funny side of this. It was just a joke, I mutter defensively before the accusations fly. I hate you! Gret hisses, then bursts into fresh tears and flees dramatically. Cal, Mum says to Dad, freezing me with an ice-cold glare. Take Grubich in hand. I'm going to try and comfort Gretelda. Mum always calls us by our given names. She's the one who picked them, and she's the only person in the world who doesn't see how shudderingly awful they are. Mum heads upstairs. Dad sighs, walks to the counter, tears several off... Tears off several sheets of kitchen paper and mops up some of the guts and streaks from, of blood from the floor. After a couple of silent minutes of this, as I lie uncertainly by my, by my upturned chair, he turns his steely gaze on me. Lots of sharp lines around his mouth and eyes, the sign that he's really angry, even angrier than he was about me smoking. <sighs> you shouldn't have done that. He says, it was funny, I mutter. No, he barks, it wasn't. She deserved it, I cry. She's done worse to me. She told mum about me smoking. I know it was her. I remember the time she melted my let soldiers and cut up my comics. And there are some things you should never do. Dad interrupts softly. This was wrong. You invaded your sister's privacy, humiliated her, terrified her senseless. And the timing. You... He pauses and ends with a fairly weak... Upset her greatly. He checks his watch. <sighs> Get ready for school. We'll discuss your punishment later. I trudge upstairs miserably, unable to see what all the aggro is about. It was a great joke. I laughed for hours when I thought of it. And all that hard work, chopping the rats up, mixing in some water to keep them fresh and make them gooey, getting up early, sneaking into her bathroom while she was asleep, carefully putting the guts in place. Wasted. I pass Gret's bedroom and hear her crying pitifully. Mum's whispering softly to her. My stomach gets hard, the way it does when I know I've done something bad. I ignore it. I don't care what they say, I grumble, kicking open the door to my room and tearing off my pajamas. It was a brilliant joke. Purgatory. Confined to my room after school for a month. A whole bloody month! No TV, no computer, no comics, no books, except school books. Dad leaves my chess set in the room too. <laughs> no fear my chess-mad parents would take that away from me. Chess is almost a religion in this house. Chris and I were reared on it. While other toddlers were being taught how to put jigsaws together, we were busy learning the ridiculous rules of chess. 
I can come downstairs for meals and bathroom visits are allowed, but otherwise I'm a prisoner. I can't even go out on the weekends. In solitude, I called Gret every name under the moon the first night. Mum and Dad bear the brunt of my curses the next. After that, I'm too miserable to blame anyone. So I sulk in moody silence and play chess against myself to pass the time. They don't talk to me at meals. The three of them act like I'm not there. Gret doesn't even glance at me spitefully and sneer the way she usually does when I'm getting the doghouse treatment. But what have I done that's so bad? Okay, it was a crude joke, and I knew I'd get into trouble, but their reactions are way over the top. If I'd done something to embarrass Gret in public, fair enough. I'd take what was coming, but this was a private joke, just between us. Just between us. They shouldn't be making such a song and dance about it. Dad's words echo back to me. And the timing. I think about them a lot. And Mum's when she was having a go at me about smoking just before Dad cut her short. We don't need this. Certainly not at this time. Not when... What did they mean? What were they talking about? What does the timing have to do with anything? Something stinks here. And it's not just rat guts. I spend a lot of time writing. Diary entries, stories... Poems. I try drawing a comic. Grubbs Grady, superhero, but I'm no good at art. I get great marks in my other subjects, way better than goat faced Gred ever gets, as I often remind her. But I have all the artistic talent of a duck. I play lots of chip I play lots of games of chess. Mum and Dad are chess fanatics. There's a board in every room, and they play several games most nights, against each other or friends from their chess clubs. The mate Gret and me play too. My earliest memory is of sucking on a white rook while Dad explained how a knight moves. I can beat just about anyone my age. I've won regional competitions, but I'm not in the same class as Mum, Dad, or Gret. Gret's won at national level and can wipe the floor with me nine times out of ten. I've only beaten I've only ever beaten Mum twice in my life, and Dad, never. It's been the biggest argument starter all my life. Mum and Dad don't pressure on me to do well in school or at other games, but they press me all the time at chess. They make me read chess books and watch videotape tournaments. We have long debates over meals, and in my dad's study about legendary games, and grandmasters, and how I can improve. They send me to tutors and keep entering me in competitions. I've argued with them about it. I'd rather spend my time watching and playing football, but they've always stood firm. White Rook takes Black Pawn, threatens Black Queen. Black Queen moves to safety. I chase her with my bishop. Black Queen moves again, still in danger. This is childish stuff. I could have cut off the threat five moves back when it became apparent, but I don't care. In a petty way, this is me striking back. You take my TV and computer away? Stick me up here on my own? Okay, I'm going to learn to play the worst game of chess in the world. See how you like that, Corporal Dad and Commandant Mum. Not exactly Luke Skywalker striking back against the evil empire by blowing up a Death Star, I know, but hey, we've all got to start somewhere. <clears throat> Studying my hair in the mirror. Stiff, tight, ginger. Dad used to be ginger when he was younger, before the grey set in. Since he was 15 or 16 when he noticed the change. So if I follow in his footsteps, I've only got a handful or so years of unbroken ginger to look forward to. I like the idea of a few grey hairs, not a whole head of them like Dad, just a few, and spread out. I don't want a skunk patch. I'm big for my age, taller than most of my friends, and burly. I don't look old, but if I had a few grey hairs, I might be able to pass for an adult in poor light bluff my way into 18 raisin movies. The door opens. Gret, smiling shyly. I'm 19 days into my sentence, full of hate for Gretelda Grotesque. She's the last person I want to see. Get out. I came to make up, she says. Too late. I snarl nastily. I've only got 11 days to go. I'd rather seek them out than kiss your... 
I stop. She's holding out a plastic bag, something white inside. What's that? I ask suspiciously. A present to make up for getting you grounded, she says, and lets it on my bed. She glances out of the window. The curtains are open. A three-quarters moon lights up the sill. There are some chess pieces on it from when I was playing earlier. Gret shivers, then turns away. Mum and Dad said you can come out. The punishment's over. They've ended it early. She leaves. Bewildered, I tear open the plastic. Inside, a Tottenham Hotspur shirt, shorts and socks. I'm stunned. The Super Spurs are my team, my football champions. Mum used to buy me their latest kit at the start of every season until I hit puberty and sprouted. She won't buy me any new kits until I stopped growing. I outgrew the last one in just a month. This must have cost Greta a fortune. It's the brand new kit, not last season's. This is the first time she's ever given me a present except at Christmas and birthdays. And mum and dad have never cut short a grounding before. They're very strict about making us stick to any punishment they set. What the hell is going on? Three days after my early release. To say things are strange is the understatement of the decade. The atmosphere is just like when Gran died. Mum and Dad wander around like robots, not saying much. Gret mopes in her room or in the kitchen, stuffing herself with sweets and playing chess non-stop. She's like an addict. It's bizarre. I want to ask him about it, but how? Mum, Dad, have aliens taken over your bodies? Is somebody dead and you're too afraid to tell me? Have you all converted to miseryism? Seriously, jokes aside, I'm frightened. They're sharing a secret, something bad, and keeping me out of it. But why? Is it to do with me? Do they know something that I don't? Like, maybe... Maybe... Come on, have the guts. Say it. Like, maybe I'm going to die? Stupid? An overreaction? Reading too much into it? Perhaps. But they caught short my punishment. Gret gave me a present. They look like they're about to burst into tears at any given minute. Grubs Grady on his way out? A deadly disease I caught on holiday? A brain defect I've had since birth? The big bad cancer bug? What other explanation is there? Regale me with your thoughts on ballet. I'm watching football highlights, alone in the TV room with Dad. I cocked my ear at the weird, out-of-nowhere question and shrug. <laughs> Rubbish, I snort. You don't think it's an incredibly beautiful art form? You never wish to experience it firsthand? You don't want to glide across Swan Lake or get sweet with a nutcracker? I choke on a laugh. <laughs> this is a wind-up. Dad smiles. Just wanted to check. I've got a great offer on tickets to a performance tomorrow. I bought three, anticipating your less than enthusiastic reaction, but I could probably get an extra one if you wanted to tag along. <laughs> no way. Your loss. Dad clears his throat. <clears throat> the ballet's out of town and finishes quite late. It'll be easier for us to stay in a hotel overnight. Does that mean I'll have the house to myself? I ask excitedly. <laughs> no such luck, he chuckles. I think you're old enough to guard the fort, but Sharon, mum, has a different view, and she's the boss. You'll have to stay with Aunt Kate. <sighs> Not no date Kate, I groan. Aunt Kate's, the Aunt Kate's only a couple of years older than mum, but she lives like a 90-year-old. She has a black and white TV, but only turns it on for the news. Listens to radio the rest of the time. Couldn't I kill myself instead? A quip. Don't make jokes like that. Dad snaps with unexpected venom. I stare at him, hurt, and he forces a thin smile. <sighs> Sorry. Hard day at the office. I'll arrange it with Kate then.
He stumbles as he exits, as if he's nervous. For a minute there, it was like normal, me and dad messing about, and I forgot all my recent worries. Now they came flooding back. If I'm not for the chop, why was he so upset about my throwaway gag? Curious and afraid, I slink to the door and eavesdrop as he phones Aunt Kate and clears my stay with her. Nothing suspicious in their conversation. He doesn't talk about me as if these are my final days. He even hangs up with a cheery, Doodle pip, a corny phrase as he often uses on the phone. I'm about to withdraw and catch up with the football action when I hear Gret speaking softly from the stairs. He didn't want to come. No, Dad whispers back. It's all set. Yes, you'll stay with Kate. It'll be just the three of us. Couldn't we wait until next month? Best to do it now. It's too dangerous to put it off. I'm scared, Dad. I know, love. So am I. Silence. Mum drops me off at Aunt Kate's. They exchange some small talk on the doorstep, but Mum's in a rush and cuts the chat short. Says she has to hurry or they'll be late for the ballet. Aunt Kate buys that, but I've cracked that cover story. I don't know what Mum and Co are up to tonight, but they're not going to watch a load of posseurs in tights and jumping around like puppets. Be good for your aunt, Mum says, tweaking the hairs of my fringe. Enjoy the ballet, I reply, smiling hollowly. Mum hugs me, then kisses me. I can't remember the last time she kissed me. There's something desperate about it. I love you, Gribbage, she croaks, almost sobbing. If I hadn't already known something was very, very wrong, the dread in her voice would have tipped me off. Prepared for it. I'm able to grin and flip back at her, Humphrey Bogart style. Love you too, sweetheart. Mum drives away. I think she's crying. Make yourself comfy in the living room, Aunt Kate simpers. I'll fix a nice pot of tea for us. It's almost time for the news. I make an excuse after the news. Sore stomach, need to rest. Aunt Kate makes me gulp down two large spoons of cot liver oil, then sends me up to bed. I wait five minutes until I hear Frank Sinatra crooning. No date Kate loves old blue eyes and always manages to find him on the radio. When I hear her singing along to some corny ballad, I slip downstairs and out the front door. I don't know what's going on, but now I know I'm but now that I know I'm not set to go toes up, I'm determined to see it through with them. I don't care what sort of a mess they're in. I won't let Mum, Dad, and Gret freeze me out no matter how bad it is. We're a family. We should face things together. That's what mum and dad always taught me. Padding through the streets, covering the six kilometers at home as quickly as I can. They could be anywhere, but I'll start with a house. If I don't find them there, I'll look for clues as to where they might be. I think of dad saying he's scared. Mum trembling as she kissed me. Brett's voice when she was on the stairs. My stomach tightens with fear. I ignore it, jog at a steady pace, and try spit and try spitting the taste of cod liver oil out of my mouth. Home. I spot a chink of light in Mum and Dad's bedroom, where the curtains just fail to meet. It doesn't mean they're in. Mum always leaves a light on to deter burglars. I slip around the back and peer through the garage window. The car's parked inside, so they're here. This is where it all kicks off, whatever it is. I creep up to the back door, crouch, poke the dock flab open and listen for sounds. None. I was eight when our last dog died. Mum said she was never allowing another one inside the house. They always got killed on the roads and she was sick of burying them. Every few months, Dad says he. Every few months, Dad says he must board over the dock flap or get a new door, but he never has. I think he's still secretly hoping she'll change her mind. Dad loves dogs. 
When I was a baby, I could crawl through the flat. Mum had to keep me tied to the kitchen table to stop me sneaking out of the house when she wasn't looking. Much too big for it now, so I fish under the pyramid-shaped stone to find the left of the door and locate the spare key. The kitchen's cold. It shouldn't be. The sun's been shining all day, and it's a nice warm night. But it's like standing in the refrigerator aisle in a supermarket. I creep to the hall door and stop, again listening for sounds. None. Leaving the kitchen, I check the TV room. Mum's fancily decorated living room, off limits to Gret and me except on special occasions. And Dad's study. Empty. All coal this, the kitchen. Coming out of the study, I notice something strange and do a double take. There's a chessboard in one of the there's a chessboard in one corner. Dad's prized chess set. The pieces are based on characters from the King Arthur legends. Hand carved by some famous craftsman of the 19th century. Cost a fortune. Dad never told Mum the exact price, never dared. I walk to the board. Carved out of marble, ten centimeters thick. I played a game with Dad on its smooth surface just a few weeks ago. Now it's scarred by deep, ugly gouges. Almost like fingernail scratches. Except no human can drag their nails through solid marble. And all the carefully crafted pieces are missing. The board's bare. Up the stairs, sweating nervously. Fingers clenched tight. My breath comes out as mist before my eyes. Part of me wants to turn tail and run. I shouldn't be here. I don't need to be here. Nobody would know if I backed up and... I flash back to Gret's face after the rat god's prank. Her tears. Her pain. Her smile when she gave me the Tottenham kit. We fight all the time, but I love her deep down. And not that deep either. I'm not going to leave her alone with mum and dad to face whatever trouble they're in. Like I told myself earlier, we're a family. Dad's always said family should pull together and fight as a team. I want to be a part of this, even though I don't know what this is. Even though mum and dad did all they could to keep me out of this. Even though this terrifies me senseless. The landing. Not as cold as downstairs. I try my bedroom. Then Gret's. Empty. Very warm. The chess pieces on Gret's boards are also missing. Mine haven't been taken, but they lie scattered on the floor, and my board has been smashed to splinters. I edge closer to Mum and Dad's room. I've known all along that this is where they must be. Delaying the moment of truth. Gret likes to call me a coward when she wants to hurt me. Big as I am, I've always gone out of my way to avoid fights. I used to think, fear, she might be right. Each step I take towards my parents' bedroom proves to my surprise that she was wrong. The door feels red hot, as though a fire is burning behind it. I press an ear to the wood. If I hear the crackle of flames, I'll race straight to the phone and dial 999. But there's no crackle, no smoke, just deep, heavy breathing and a curious dripping sound my hands on the doorknob my fingers won't move i keep my ear pressed to the wood waiting praying a tear trickles from my left eye it dries on my cheek from the heat inside the room somebody giggles low throaty sadistic not mum Dad or Gret. There's a ripping sound, followed by snaps and crunches. My hand turns. The door opens. Hell is revealed. Chapter 2 Demons. Blood everywhere. Nightmarish splashes and gory pools. 
wild streaks across the floor and walls. Except the walls aren't walls. I'm surrounded on all sides by webs. Millions of strands thicker than my arm, some connecting in orderly designs, others running chaotically apart. Many of the strands are stained with blood. Behind the layer of webs, more layers, banks of them stretching back as far as I can see, infinite. My eyes snap from the walls. I make quick mental thumbnails of other details, numb, functioning like a machine. The dripping sound. A body hangs upside down from the webby ceiling in the center of the room. No head. Blood drops to the floor from the gaping red O of the neck. Even without the head, I recognize him. Dad! I scream, and the cry almost rips my vocal cords apart. To my left, an obscene creature spins around and snarls. It has the body of a very large dog. The head of a crocodile. Beneath it, motionless, mum, or what's left of her. A dreadful howl to my right. Gret, sitting on the floor, staring at me, weaving sideways, her face white, except where it's smeared with blood. I start to call to her. She half turns, and I realize she's been split in two. Something's behind her, in the cavity at the back moving her like a hand puppet. The something pushes Greta away. It's a child, but no child of this world. It has the body of a three-year-old with a head much larger than any normal person's. Pale green skin, no eyes. A small ball of fire flickers in each of its empty sockets. No hair, yet its head is alive with movement. As the hell child advances, I see the diopter to cockroaches. Living feeding on its rotten flesh. The crocodile dog moves away from mum and also closes in on me, exchanging glances with the monstrous child who's narrowing the gap. I can't move. Fear has seized me completely. I look from mum to dad to Gret. All red, all dead. Impossible. This can't be happening. It's a bad dream. It must be. But... Even in my very worst nightmare, I never imagined anything like this. I know that it's real, simply because it's too awful not to be. The creatures are almost upon me. The croc dog growls hungrily. The held child grins ghoulishly and raises its hands. There are mouths in both, it, in both of its palms, small, full of sharp teeth, no tongues. Oh dear, someone says and the creatures stop within spitting distance. What have we here? A man slides out from behind a clump of webby strands, thin, pale red skin, misshapen, lumpy, as though made out of colored dough. His hands are mangled, bones sticking out of the skin, one finger melting into another. Bald, strange eyes, no white, just a dark red iris and an even darker pupil. There's a gaping, jagged hole in the left side of his chest. I can look cleanly through it. Inside the hole, snakes, dozens of tiny, hissing, coiled serpents with long, curved fangs. The hell child shrieks and reaches towards me. The teeth in its small mouths are eagerly snapping open and shut. Stop, artery! The man the monster says commandingly and steps towards me. No, he doesn't step. He glides. He has no feet. The lumpy flesh of his lower legs ends in sharp strips which don't touch the floor. He's hovering in the air. The croc dog barks savagely, its reptilian eyes alive with, un with hunger and hate. Hold, vain, the monster orders. He advances to within touching distance of me, stops and studies me with his unnatural red eyes. He has a small mouth, white lips. He looks sad, the saddest creature I've ever seen. You are Groupich, 
he says morosely. The last of the Grady's. You should not be here. Your parents wished to spare you this heartache. Why did you come? I can't answer. My body isn't my own, except my eyes, which don't stop roaming and analyzing, even though I want them to. Easier to shut off completely and black everything out. The hell child makes a guttural sound and reaches for me again. Disobey me at your peril, artery, the monster says softly. The barbaric baby drops its hands and shuffles backwards, the fire in its eyes dimming. The croc dog retreats too, both keeping their sights on me. Oh, such sadness, the monster sighs, and there's genuine pity in his tone. Parents dead, sister dead, all alone in the world, face to face with demons, no idea who we are or why we're here. He pauses and doubt crosses his expression. You don't know, do you, Grubich? Nobody ever explained or told you the story of lonely Lord Loss. I still can't answer, but he reads the ignorance of but he reads the ignorance in my eyes and smiles thinly, painfully. Hmm. I thought not, he says. They sought to protect you from the cruelties of the world. Good loving parents. You'll miss them, Rubich, but not for long. The creatures to my left and right make me sick, make sick chuckling sounds. Your sorrow shall be short-lived. Within minutes, I'll set my familiars upon you, and all will soon finish. There will be pain, great pain, but then the total peace of the beyond. Death will come as a blessing, Grubich. You will welcome it in the end, as your parents and sister did. The monster drifts around me. I realize he has no nose, just two large holes above his upper lip. He sniffs as he passes, and I somehow understand that he's smelling my fear. Oh, poor Grubich, he murmurs, stopping in front of me again. This close, I can see that his red skin is broken by tiny cracks, seeping with drops of blood. I also notice several appendages beneath his arms, three on either side, folded around his stomach. They look like thin extra arms, though they might just be oddly molded layers of flesh. <laughs> what are you? I moan, forcing the words out between my chattering teeth. The beginning and end of your greatest sorrows, the monster replies. He says it plainly, not a boast. Mum? I gasp. Dad? Gone, he whispers, shaking his head, blood oozing from the cracks in his neck. Remember them, Grubich. Recall the golden memories. Cherish them in these, your final moments. Cry for them, Grubich. Give me your tears. He smiles eagerly, and his right hand reaches for my face. He brushes his mashed together fingers across my left cheek, just beneath my eye, as though trying to charm tears from me. The touch of his skin, moist, rough, sticky, repels me. Without thinking, I turn my back on the hell of my parents' bedroom and run. Behind me, the monster chuckles darkly, clears his throat, and says, Bane, artery, he is yours. With vile, vicious howls of delight, the creatures give chase.
The landing. Growls and grinding teeth getting closer every second, almost upon me. My legs slip. I, I sprawl to the floor. Something flies overhead and collides with the wall at the top of the stairs. The croc dog, vain. A tiny hand snacks on my left angle. Artery's teeth close on the turn ups of, of my jeans. I pull away instinctively, ripping a long strip of material torn clean away. No damage to my leg. Artery rolls backwards, choking on the denim. Vane scrambles to its feet, shaking its elongated crocodile head. My eyes fixes on its legs. They don't end in dog's paws, but in tiny human hands with long blood-stained splintered nails. A woman's. I wriggle past Vane on my stomach and drag myself down the stairs, gasping with terror. Out of the corner of my eye, I spy Artery spitting out the denim, jumping to his feet, rushing after me. Vane crouches at the top of the stairs, reptilian eyes furious, readying itself, herself, to pounce. Just as she leaps, Artery crashes into her. Vane yelps at her companion accidentally, as her companion accidentally crushes her against the wall. Artery wails like a baby, kicks Vane out of the way, and totters down the stairs in pursuit of me. My hands hit the floor. I lurch to my feet and start for the front door. I have a good lead on Artery, who's still on the stairs. I'm going to make it. A few more strides and... Something brushes between my legs at an incredible speed. There's a, there's a sharp clattering sound. The door shakes. At its base, Artery writes himself and grins at me. The grotesque hell child is rubbing his right shoulder where he collided with the door. The fire in his eyes burns brighter than ever. His mouth is wide and twisted. No tongue, just a gaping blood-red maw. I scream incoherently at Artery, then grab the telephone from its stand, the closest object to hand, and lob it with all my strength at the demon. Artery ducks sharply. Unbelievably, the telephone smashes through the door, ending up in the street outside. I've no time to ponder this impossible feat of strength. Artery is momentarily disorientated. Vane's only halfway down the stairs. I can escape if I act quickly. Making a sharp turn, I dive for the kitchen and the back door. Artery reads my intentions and bellows at Vane. The croc dog leaps from the stairs and sail for my face and throat. I bring up an arm and swat her away. Vane's nails scratch my, catch on my arm, rip through the material on my shirt and make three deep gouges in the flesh on my forearm. Yelling with pain, I kick out of the demon's crocodile head. My foot hits just beneath the tip of its snout. Vane's head snaps back as she, and, and she tumbles away with a grunt. I don't stop to check on Artery. I burst through to the kitchen and throw myself at the door. My fingers tighten on the handle. I twist. Wrong way. Reverse the movement. A click. The door opens and slams shut again as Artery rams it. The force of the demon banging into the door knocks me aside. I roll out of harm's immediate way. When I sit up, Artery has recovered and is standing in front of the door, legs and arms spread, the three sets of teeth glinting in the glows of the red light cast by the fire of his eyeless sockets. I back away on my knees from the green, from the green skinned hell child. Stop, growling to my rear, a panicked glance, vain closing in, blocking my retreat. I'm caught between them. Artery smiling. He knows I'm finished. A cockroach topples from his head, lands on its back, rights itself. It starts to scuttle away. Artery steps on the roach and crushes it, holds his foot up to me so that I can see the insect's smeared remains, laughs evilly. A snapping sound behind me, the stench of blood and decay, vain almost upon me. Artery hisses. He wants to join in on the bloodshed, but he's wary. He, he won't desert his post. Better to stay and watch Vane kill me than go for the kill himself and leave the door unguarded. I sense the demon's fear of the one upstairs. He called these two his familiars. That means he's their master. Vane butts me in the back of her Vane butts me in the back with her leathery snout. Growls throatily. It's over. I'm finished. Dead. Like mum and dad. And no, I roar, startling the demons. 
My thoughts flash on the telephone, smashing through the sturdy wood of the front door, an artery, and and the speed of which he was in the speed of which he moved. My eyes fix on the dog flap, much too small to fit through. But I don't think of that. I focus only on escape. I bring my legs up, come to a half crouch, propel myself at the dog flap as Vane snaps for me with the teeth. I fly through the air faster than any human should or could. The fire in, art in artery sockets flares with alarm. The demon snaps at his the demon snaps his tiny legs together. Too late. Before they close, I'm through. Fingers pushing the dog flap up out of the way. Arms, body, and legs following. Shrieks and howls behind. But they can't harm me now. I'm flying outside. Free! Soaring. Arms spread like wings. Exhilaration. Magic. Momentary delight. I feel invincible. Like a... Smash! The backyard fence cut, my, cut short my flight. I hit the ground hard. I come up groaning and wheezing. Right elbow cut where I rocketed off through the wood of the fence. Woozy. I stagger to my feet. Feel sick. I remember the demons. My eyes snap to the dog flap. I turn to run. Then stop. No sign of them. Ordinary night silence. They aren't following. I stare at the dog flap. Tiny. Then are my arms and legs. The three red ravines gouged out by vein. My shirt and jeans ripped from where the demon snagged me. My left shoe missing. Must have come off mid-flight. But otherwise, I'm unharmed. No way! Even if the dog flap had been bigger, I couldn't have dived through it at that speed without scraping myself raw. How did... All questions die unvoiced, as I recall the horror show of the bedroom. Mom! I sob, staggering towards the back door. I pause with my hand on the handle. Almost turn it. Can't. I get down on my knees. Cautiously poke open the dog flap. Peer into the kitchen. No demons. But the many bloody prints on the tiles are proof I didn't imagine the chase. On my feet. Again, I try to enter. Again, I can't bring myself to do it. Memory is too terrifying. The demon's too threatening. If I could help my family, perhaps it would be different. But they're dead. All of them. And I have too much sense, or not enough courage, to risk my life for a tree of corpses. Stepping back from the door, I stare up at the house. It looks like all the others from the outside. No webs, no blood, no more walls and windows. Gret, I mutter mindlessly. I never said sorry for the rat guts. I think about that for a moment, stunned, sluggish. And then I raise my face, open my mouth, and scream. It's a wordless scream. Pure hatred, pure sorrow. It builds from somewhere deep within me and bursts forth with the same impossible force I summoned when lobbing the telephone and artery and diving through the dog flap. The glass in the window shatters and explodes inwards, ripping curtains to shreds, littering floors with jagged, transparent shards. The glass in the houses to either side also explodes and in the nearby cars and street lamps. I scream as long as I can, perhaps a full minute without pause, then lapse into silence, as all-encompassing as the scream. It's an isolated silence, almost solid. No sounds trickle out and none penetrate. After a while, people emerge from the neighboring houses, shaking, making their cautious way to the source of the insane howl. 
I see their mouths moving, but I don't hear their questions or their cries when they enter my house and come racing out shortly after, faces white, eyes filled with terror. I'm in a world of my own, a world of webs and blood, demons and corpses, nightmares and terror. The name of the world from this night on, home. Chapter three, Dervish. Lost, spiraling time, muddled happenings, flitting in and out of reality, momentarily here, then gone, proclaimed by madness and demons. Clarity, a warm room, police officers, I'm wrapped in blankets, a man with a kind face offers me a mug of hot chocolate. I take it. He's asking questions. His words sail over and through me. Staring into the dark liquid of the mug, I begin to fade out of reality. To avoid the return to nightmares, I lift my head and focus on his moving lips. For a long time, nothing. Then whispers. They grow like turning up the volume on the TV. Not all his words make sense. There's a roaring sound inside my head, but I get his general drift. He's asking about the murders. Demons, I mutter. My first utterance since my soul-wrenching cry. His face lights up and he snaps forward. More questions, quicker than before, louder, more urgent. Amidst the babble, I hear them. I hear him ask, Did you see them? Yes, I croak. Demons. He frowns, asks something else. I tune out. The world flames at the world flames at the edges. A ball of madness condenses around me, trapping me, devouring me, cutting off all but the nightmares. A different room, different officers, more demanding than the last one, not as gentle, asking questions loudly, facing me directly, holding my head up until our eyes meet and they give and they have my attention. One holds up a photograph, red, a body torn down the middle. Great, I moan. I know it's hard, an officer says, sympathy mixed with impatience, but did you see who killed her? Demons, I sigh. Demons don't exist, Grobs, the officer growls. You're old enough to know that. Look, I know it's hard, he repeats himself, but you have to focus. You have to help us find the people who did this. You're our only witness, Grobs, his colleague murmurs. You saw them. Nobody else did. We know you don't want to think about it right now, but you have to. For your parents. For Gret. The other cop waves the photo in my face again. Give us something. Anything, he pleads. How many were there? Did you see their faces or what they were wearing? Were they wearing masks? How did you, how much of it did you witness? Can you? Fading. Bye-bye, officers. Hello, horror. Screaming. Deafening cries. Looking around. Wondering who's making such a racket and why they aren't being silenced. Then I realize it's me screaming. In a white room, hands bound by a tight white jacket. I've never seen a real one before, but I know what it is. A straight jacket. I focus on making the screams stop and they slowly die away to a whimper. I don't know how long I've been roaring, but my throat's dry and painful, as though I've been testing its limits for weeks without pause. There's a hard plastic mug set in a holder on the small table to my left. A straw sticks out of it. I use my lips around the head of the straw and swallow. Flat coke. It hurts going down, but after a couple of mouthfuls, it's wonderful. 
Refreshed, I study my cell. Padded walls, dim lights, a steel door with a strong plastic panel in the other half instead of glass. I stumble to the panel and stare out. Can't see much. The area beyond is dark, so the plastic's mostly reflective. I study my face in the makeshift mirror. My eyes aren't my own. Bloodshot, wild, rimmed with black circles. Lips bitten to tatters. Scratches on my face, self-inflicted. Hair cut short, tighter than I like. A large purple bruise on my forehead. A face pops up close on the other side of the glass. I fall backwards with fright. The door opens and a large smiling woman enters. It's okay, she says softly. My name's Leah. I've been looking after you. <sighs> Where am I? I gasp. Someplace safe, she replies. She bends and touches the bruise on my forehead with two soft, gentle fingers. You've been through hell, but you're okay now. It's all uphill from here. Now that you've snapped out of your delirium, we can work on... I lose track of what Lee is saying. Behind her, in the doorway, I imagine a pair of demons, vein and artery. The sane part of me knows they aren't real, just visions, but that part of me has no control of my senses anymore. Backing up against one of the padded walls, I stare blankly at the make-believe demons as they dance around my cell, making crude gestures and mimed threats. Leah goes on talking. The imaginary vein and artery go on dancing. I slip back into the shell of my nightmares, almost gratefully. In and out. Quiet moments of reality. Sudden flashes of insanity and terror. I'm being held in an institute for people with problems. That's all any of my nurses will tell me. No names. No mingling with the other patients. White rooms. Nurses. Leah, Kelly, Tim, Alita, Emilia, and others. All nice. All concerned. All unable to coax me back from my nightmares when they strike. <clears throat> Doctors with names I don't bother memorizing. They examine me at regular intervals, make notes, ask questions. What did you see? What did the killers look like? Why do you insist on calling them demons? You know demons aren't real. Who are the real killers? One of them asks if I committed the murders. She's a grey-haired, sharp-eyed woman, not as kindly as the rest. The bad doctor to their good doctors. She presses me harder as the days slip by, challenges me, shows me photos which make me cry. I start calling her Dr. Slaughter, but only to myself, not out loud. When she comes with her questions and cold eyes, I open myself to the nightmares, always hovering on the edges, eager to embrace me and lose myself to the real world. After a few of these intentional fade outs, they obviously decide to abandon the shock tactics. And that's the last I see of Dr. Slaughter. Time dragging or disappearing into nightmares. No ordinary time, no lazy afternoons or quiet mornings. The murder is impossible to forget. Grief and fear tainting my every waking and sleeping moment. Routines are important, according to my doctors and nurses, who wish to put a stop to my nightmarish withdrawals. They're trying to get me back into real time. They surround me with clocks, make me wear two watches, stress the times at which I'm able to stress the times at which I'm eat at what stress the times at which I'm to eat and bathe, exercise and sleep. Lots of pills and injections. Leah says it's only temporary to calm me down. Says they don't like dosing patients here. They prefer to talk us through our problems, not make us forget them. The drugs numb me to my nightmares, but also to everything else. Impossible to feel interest or boredom, excitement or despair. 
I wander around the hospital. I have a free run now that I'm no longer violent. In a daze, zombified, staring at clock faces, counting the seconds until my next pill. Off the pills, coming down hard, screaming fits, fighting the nurses, craving numbness, needing pills. They ignore my screams and pleas. Leah explains what's happening. I'm on a long-term treatment plan. The drugs put a stop to the nightmares and anchored me in the real world. Step one. Now I have to learn to function in it as a normal person, free of medicinal depressants. Step two. I try explaining my situation to her. My nightmares won't ever go away because the demons I saw were real. But she refuses to listen. Nobody believes me when I talk about the demons. They accept that I was in the house at the time of the murders and that I witnessed something dreadful, but they can't see beyond human horrors. They think I imagined the demons to mask the truth. One doctor says it's easier to believe in demons than evil humans, says a wicked person is far scarier than a fanciful demon. Moron. He wouldn't say that if he'd seen the crocodile-headed vein or the cockroach-crowned artery. Gradual improvement. I lose my craving for drugs and no longer throw fits, but I don't progress as quickly as my doctors anticipated. I keep slipping back into the world of nightmares, losing my grip on reality. I don't talk openly with my nurses and doctors. I don't discuss my fears and pains. Sometimes I babble incoherently and can't interpret the words of those around me, or I'll stand staring at a tree or bush through one of the institute windows all day long, or not get up in the morning, despite the best rousing efforts of my nurses. I'm fighting them. They don't believe my story, so they can't truly understand me, so they can't really help me. So I fight them, out of fear and spite. Somewhere in the middle of the confusion, relatives arrive. The doctors want me to focus on the world outside the Institute. They think the way to do that is to reintroduce me to my family or break down my sense of overwhelming isolation. I think the plan is for the visitors to fuss over me so that I want to be with them. So I'll then play ball with the doctors when they start in with the questions. Aunt Kate's the first. She clutches me tight and weeps. Talks about mum, dad and Gret nonstop recalling all the good times that she can remember, begs me to let the doctors help me, to talk with them so that I can get better and go home and live with her. I say nothing, just stare off into space and think about Dad hanging upside down. Aunt Kate leaves less than an hour later, still sobbing. More relatives drop in during the following days and weeks, rounded up by the doctors. Aunts, uncles, cousins, both sides of the family tree. Some are old acquaintances, some I've never seen before. I don't respond to any of them. I can't tell if they're just like the doctors. I can tell they're just like the doctors. They don't believe me. Lots of questions for my carers. Why don't I talk to my relatives? Do I like them? Are there others I prefer? Am I afraid of people? How would I feel about leaving here and staying with one of the well-wishers for a while? They're trying to ship me out. It's not that they're sick of me, just step three on my path to recovery. Since I won't rally to their calls in here, they hope that a taste of the real world will make me more receptive. I haven't developed any great insights into the human way of thinking. I know all this because Leah and the other nurses tell me. They say it's good for me to know what they're thinking, what their plans are. I do my best to give them what they want. I'd love it if they could cure me, but it's difficult. The relatives remind me of what happened. They can't act naturally around me. They look at me with pitying, sometimes fearful expressions, but I try, I listen, I respond. After much preparation and discussion, I spend a weekend with Uncle Mike and his family. Mike is mum's younger brother. He has a pretty wife, Rosetta, and three children, two girls and a boy. Greta and I stay with them a few times in the past when mum and dad were away on holidays. 
They try hard to make me feel welcome. Connor, Mike's son, is 10 years old. He shows me his toys and plays computer games with me. He's bright and friendly. Talks me through his comic collection and tells me I can pick out any three issues I like and keep them. The girls, Lisa and Laura, are seven and six. Gigglish. Not sure why I'm here or aware of what happened to me, but they're nice. They tell me about school and their friends. They want to know if I have a girlfriend. Saturday goes well. I feel like Mike's optimism. He thinks this will work. That I'll return to my senses and pick up my life as normal. I try to believe salvation can come that simply, but inside, I know I'm deluding myself. Sunday, a stroll in the park, playing with Lisa and Laura on the swings, pushing my high, Rosetta close by, keeping a watchful eye on me, Mike on the roundabout with Connor. Want off! Laura shouts. I stop her, and she hops to the ground. Look what I saw! She yells gleefully and rushes over to a bush at the side of the swings. I follow. She points to a dead bird, small, young, its body ripped apart, probably by a cat. Cool, Lisa gasps, coming up behind. No, it's not, Rosetta says, wandering over. It's sad. Can we take it home and bury it? Lisa asks. I don't know, Rosetta frowns. It looks like it's been... Demons killed my parents and sister, I interrupt calmly. The girls stare at me with round, wide eyes. One of them ripped my dad's head clean off. Blood was pouring out from a tap. Gribbage, I don't think, Rosetta says. One of the demons had the body of a child, I continue, unable to stop. It had green skin and no eyes. Instead of hair, its head was covered with cockroaches. That's enough, Rosetta snaps. You're terrifying the girls. I won't. The cockroaches were alive. They were eating the demon's flesh. If I look closely enough, I'm sure I'd have seen its brains. Rosetta storms off, Lisa and Laura in tow. Laura's crying. I gaze sadly at the dead bird. Nightmares gather around me. Imagine demonic chuckles. The last thing I see in the real world, Mike marching towards me, torn between concern and fury. The Institute. Days, weeks, months later. Lots of questions. Why did you say that to the girls? Do you want to hurt other people? Are you angry, sad, scared? Would you like to visit somebody else? I don't answer, or else I grunt in response. They don't understand. They can't. I didn't want to scare Lisa or Laura, or upset Mike and Rosetta. The words came out by themselves. The doctors can't help. If I had an ordinary illness, I'm sure they could fix me but I've seen demons rip my world to pieces. Nobody believes that. So nobody knows what I'm going through. I'm alone. I always will be. That's my life now. It's just the way it is. The relatives stop coming. The doctors stop trying. They say they're giving me time to recover, but I think they just don't know how to handle me. Long periods by myself, walking, reading, thinking, tired most of the time, headaches, imaginary demons everywhere I look, hard to keep food down, growing thin, sickly. The nurses try to rally my spirits. Days out, a circus, theme park, cinemas, and parties in my cell, no good. Their efforts are wasted on me. I draw into myself more and more, hardly ever speak, avoid eye contact, fingers twitch and head twists with fear at the slightest alien sound, getting worse, going downhill. There's talk of new pills.
the visitor. It's been a long time since the last. I thought they'd given up. It's Uncle Dervish, Dad's younger brother. I don't know much about him. A man of mystery. He visited us a few times when I was smaller. Mum never liked him. I recall her and Dad arguing about him once. We're not taking the kids there, she snapped. I don't trust him. Leah admits Uncle Dervish. Asked if he liked anything to drink or eat. No thanks. Would I like anything? I shake my head. Leah leaves. Dervish Grady is a thin, lanky man. Bald on top, grey hair at the sides, a tight grey beard, pale blue eyes. I remember his eyes from when I was a kid. I thought they looked like my toy soldier's eyes. I asked him if it... I asked him if he was in the army. He laughed. He's dressed completely in denim. Jeans, shirt, jacket. He looks ridiculous. Gret used to say denim looks naff on anyone over the age of 30. She was right. Devish sits in the visitor's chair and studies me with cool, serious eyes. He's immediately different to all who've come before. Whereas other relatives were quick to start a false, cheerful conversation or cry or say how sorry they were, Dervish just sits and stares. That interests me. So I stare back, more alert than I've been in weeks. Hello, I say, after a full minute of silence. Dervish nods in reply. I try to think of a follow-up line but nothing comes to mind. Dervish looks slowly around the room, stands, walks to the window, gazes out of the rear yard of the Institute, then swings back to the door, which Leah left ajar. He pokes his head out, looks left and right, and closes the door, returns to the chair and sits, unbuttons the top of his denim jacket, slides out three sheets of paper, Holds them face down. I sit upright, intrigued, but suspicious. Is this some sort of new ploy of the doctors? Have they fed Dervish a fresh set of lines and actions in an attempt to spark my revival? I hope this isn't a Rorschach test, I grin weakly. I've had enough inblots to last me at... Dervish turns the sheet over, and I stop dead. It's a black and white drawing of a large dog with a crocodile's head and human hands. Vain, Dervish says. He has a soft, lyrical voice. I tremble and say nothing in reply. He turns over the second sheet, colored this time. A child with green skin, mouth in its palms, fire in its eyes, lice for hair. Artery. Dervish says. You got the hair wrong, I mumble. Should be cockroaches. Lice, cockroaches, leeches. It changes, he says, and lays the two sheets down on the floor. He turns over the third. This one's collar too. A thin man, lumpy red skin, large red eyes, mangled hands, no feet, a snake-filled hole where his heart should be. The doctors put you up to this, I moan, averting my eyes. I told them about the demons. They must have got artists to draw them. Why are you... You didn't tell them his name, Dervis cuts me short. He taps the picture. You said the other two were familiars, and that this one was their master. But you never mentioned his name. Do you know it? I think back to those few minutes of insanity in my parents' bedroom. The demon lord didn't say much. He never told me who he was. I opened, my, I opened my mouth to answer negatively. Then slowly let it close. No, he did reveal his identity. I can't remember exactly when, but somewhere in amongst the madness there was mention of it. I cast my thoughts back. Zone in on the moment. It was when he asked if I knew why this was happening, if my parents had ever told me the story of Lord Loss, Dervis says, a split second before I blurted out. I stare at him, 
uncertain, terrified, yet somehow excited. I know the demons were real, Dervish murmurs, picking up the pictures and placing them back inside of his jacket, doing up his buttons. He stands. If you want to come live with me, you can, but you'll have to sort out the mess you're in first. The doctor says she won't respond to their questions. They say they know how to help you, but that you won't let them. They don't believe me, I cry. How can they cure me when they think I'm lying about the demons? The world's a confusing place, Dervis says. I'm sure your parents told you to always tell the truth, and most of the time that's good advice, but sometimes you have to lie. He comes over and bends, so his face is in mine. These people want to help you, Grubich, and I believe they can, but you're going to have to help them. You'll have to lie. Pretend demons don't exist. Tell them what they want to hear. You have to give a little to get a little. Once you remove that barrier, they can go to work on fixing your brain and helping you deal with the grief. Then, when they've done all they can, you can come to me, if that's what you want, and I'll help you with the rest. I can explain about demons and tell you why your parents and sister died. He leaves. Stunned silence. Long days and nights of heavy thinking repeating the name of the thin red demon. Lord Loss, Lord Loss, Lord Loss, Lord. Torn between hope and fear. Could Dervish be in league with the demons? Mum saying, I don't trust him. I'm safe here. Leaving might be an invitation to danger and further sorrow. I won't approve in this place, holding true to my story, def defying the doctors and nurses. But I can't be harmed either. Out in the real world, I might have to face demons again. Simply just stay here and hide. One morning, I wake from a nightmare. In it, I was at a party wearing a mask. When I took the mask off, I realized I'd been wearing Gret's face. Sitting up in bed, shaking, crying. I stare out of the window and the world beyond. I decide. Exercising, eating sensibly, putting on weight, talking directly with my doctors and nurses, answering their questions, letting them into my head, bearing my soul. I allow them to help me. I work with them, lie when I have to, Say I saw humans in the room that night. Police come and take my statement. An artist captures my new, realistic, invented impressions of the murderers. My doctors beam proudly and pat my back. Weeks pass. With the help and with help and lots of hard work, I get better. Dervish was right. Now that I'm working with them, they are able to help me. Even if we're progressing on the basis of a lie, the demons aren't real. I weep a lot and learn a lot, how to face my grief, how to confront my fear and control it, and let them guide me out of the darkness, slowly, painfully, but surely. In one afternoon session with a therapist, when I just the time to be right, I make a request. Lots of discussions afterwards, long debates, staff meetings, phone calls, humming and hawing. Finally, they agree. There's a big build-up. Lots of in-depth therapy sessions and heart-to-hearts. Tests galore to make sure I'm ready, to reassure themselves that they're doing the right thing. They have doubts, and they voice them. We talk them through, and they decide in my favor. The last day. Handshakes and emergency contact numbers from the doctors in case anything goes wrong. Kisses and hugs from my favorite nurses. A card from Leah. Facing the door, a bag on my shoulder with all I have left in the world. Scared sick, but determined to see it through. I leave the Institute on the back of a motorbike. Driving, my rescuer, 
my lifeline, my hope, Uncle Dervish. Hold on tight, he says. Speed limits were made to be broken. Rum. Chapter 4 The Grand Tour Dervish drives like a madman, a hundred miles an hour, howling wind, blurred countryside. No chance to talk or study the scenery. I spend the journey with my face pressed between my uncle's shoulder blades, clinging on for dear life. Finally, coming to a small village, he slows. I peek and catch the name of a sign as we exit. Karkari Vale. Karkari Vale, I murmur. It's pronounced Kar Sherry, Dervish grunts. This is where you live, I note, recalling the address from cards I wrote and sent with Mum and Gret. Mum didn't like Uncle Dervish, but she always sent him a Christmas and birthday card. Actually, I live about two miles beyond, Dervish says carefully overtaking a tractor and waving to the driver. It's pretty lonely out where I am, but there are lots of kids in the village. You can walk in any time you like. <clears throat> Do they know about me? I ask. Only that you're an orphan and that you're coming to live with me. A winding road. Lots of potholes which Dervish swerves to expertly avoid. The sides of the road are lined with trees. They grow close together, blocking out all but the thinnest slivers of sunlight. Dark and cold. I press closer to Dervish, hugging warmth from him. <sighs> the trees don't stretch back very far, he says. You can skirt around them when you're going to the village. I'm not afraid, I mutter. <laughs> of course you are, he chuckles, then looks back, to, then looks back quickly. But you have my word. You've no need to be. Shay Dervish. A huge house. Three stories. Built from rough white blocks. Almost as big as those I've seen in photos of the pyramids. Shaped like an L. The bit sticking out of the end is made from ordinary red bricks and doesn't look like the rest of the house. Lots of timber decorations around the top and down the sides. A slate roof with three enormous chimneys. The roof of the bricks, the roof and the brick section is flat and the chimney is tiny in comparison with the others. The windows on the lower floor run from the ground to the ceiling. The windows on the upper floors are smaller, round and feature stained glass designs. On the brick section, they're very ordinary. It's not much, Dervish says wryly, but it's home. This place must have cost a fortune, I gasp standing close to the motorbike, staring at the house, almost afraid to venture any nearer. <laughs> Not really, Dervish says. It was a wreck when I bought it. No roof or windows. The interior destroyed by exposure to the elements. The lower floor was used by a local farmer to house pigs. I lived in the brick extension for years while I restored the main building. I kept meaning to tear the extension down. I don't use it anymore and takes away from the main engine. And it takes away from the main structure, but I never seem to get around to it. Dervish removes the helmet, keeps me, helps me out of mine. Then walks me around the side of the, then walks me around the outside of the house. He explains about the original architect and how much work he had to do to make the house habitable again. But I don't listen very closely. I'm too busy assessing the mansion and the surrounding terrain. Lots of open fields, sheep and cattle in some of them. A small forest to the west which runs all the way to Karshari Vale. No neighbouring houses that I can see. Do you live here alone? I ask as we return to the front of the house. Pretty much, Dervish says. One farmer owns most of this land and he's, oppo and he's opposed to overdevelopment. He's old. I guess, I guess his children will sell plots off when he when he dies. But for the last 20 years, I've had all the peace and seclusion a man could wish for. 
Doesn't it get lonely? I ask. No, Dervis says. I'm fairly solitary by nature. When I'm in need of company, it's only a short stroll to the village. And I travel a lot. I have many friends around the globe. We stop at the giant front doors. A pair of them, like the entrance to a castle. No doorbell, just two chunky gargoyle-shaped knockers, which I eye up, which I eye apprehensively. Dervish doesn't open the doors. He's studying me quietly. What have you lost the key? I ask. We don't have to enter, he says. I think you'll grow to love this place after a while, but it's a lot to take in at the start. If you prefer, I could stay in the brick extension. It's an art. You could stay in the brick extension. It's an eyesore, but cozy inside. Or we can drive to the Vale, and you can spend a few nights in a and b until you get your bearings. It's tempting. If the house is even half as spooky on the inside as it looks from out here, it's going to be hard to adapt to. But if I don't move in now, I'm sure the house will grow far creepier in my imagination than it can ever be in real life. <laughs> Come on, I grin weakly lifting one of the gargoyle knuckers and rapping loudly. Look like a pair of idiots standing out here. Let's go in. Cold inside, but brightly lit. No carpets, all tiles of stone floors but many rugs and mats. No wallpaper. Some of the walls are painted, others just natural stone. Chandeliers in the main hall and dining room. Wall set lamps in the other rooms. Bookcases everywhere, most of them filled. Chess boards too, in every room. Dervish must be as keen on chess and as mum and dad. Ancient weapons hang from many of the walls. Swords, axes, maces, for when the tax collector calls, Dervish says solemnly, lifting one down of lifting down one of the larger swords. He swings it over his head and laughs. Can I try it? I ask. He un he hands it to me. Bloody hell! It's heavy. I can lift it to thigh level, but no higher. A quick re a quick reappraisal of Uncle Dervish. He looks wiry as a rat, but he must have hidden muscles under all the denim. We meander through the downstairs rooms, Dervish explaining what each was used for in the past, pointing out items of special interest, such as a stuffed bear's head, which is more than 200 years old, a cage where a live vulture was kept, rusty nails which were used by the Romans to crucify people. There's a large, empty fish tank in one of the main living rooms, set against the wall. Dervish pauses at it and taps the frame with his fingernails. Last owner of this place, before it fell to ruin, was a tyrant called Lord Sheftree. He kept live piranhas in this tank. One day, a woman turned up with a baby. She claimed it was his, and she wanted money to pay for its upkeep. Dervish crouches down and stares into the abandoned aquarium, as though it's still full of circling multicolored fish. Lord Sheftree invited her to stay for the night, he says calmly. While he was sleeping, he crept into her room and removed her baby, brought it down here, and fed it to the piranhas. Took the bones away and buried them. The woman raised almighty hell but search parties couldn't find a corpse, and nobody had seen her arrive with a child, so there was no proof she ever had one. She ranted and raved, and was eventually locked away in a mental asylum. She hanged herself there. Years later, when Lord Sheftree was an old man, and his mind was wandering, he boasted about the murder to one of his servants, and told her where her bones were buried. She dug them up and, and informed the police. They came to arrest him, but the local villagers got here first. He was discovered, chopped up into tiny pieces, all of which had been dropped into the piranha tank. Dervish stops, and I, and I gaze at him in silent awe. 
He stands and faces me. <laughs> I'm not saying this to scare you, he smiles, but this house has a long and bloody history. There are dozens of horror stories, none quite as gruesome as that one, but all of them pretty gut churning. I think it's best you hear about it. I think it's best you hear about its past now than from me. Is uh, is the house haunted? A wheeze. <laughs> no, he answers seriously. It's safe. I wouldn't have brought you here if it wasn't. If the nightmares of the past prove too oppressive, you're free to leave. But you have nothing to fear in the present. I nod slowly, thinking about Lord Sheftree and his piranha, wondering if I have the courage to spend the night in a house like this. Be okay, Davish asks. Would you like to step outside for fresh air? I'm fine, I mutter, turning my back on the fish tank, acting like I hear this sort of stuff all the time. What's upstairs? Mostly bedrooms on the first floor. All are fully fitted. All are fully fitted. The beds freshly made. Though Dervish says only four or five of the rooms have been used since he renovated the mansion. Why bother with all the beds then? I ask. If something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. He laughs. Some of the beds are four posters. Imported from foreign countries. With histories as old and macabre as the house. It's only when Dervish is telling me about one particular bed in which a French aristocrat hid for four months during the revolution that I think about how much they must have cost. What do you do? I ask my uncle. It sounds ridiculous, but I don't recall mom or dad ever mentioning Dervish's line of work. I dabble in antiques, he says. Rare books are my specialty, particularly books regarding the occult. Dervish looks at me questioningly. We haven't mentioned Demon since he picked me up at the Institute. He's offering me the chance to quiz him about them now, but I'm not ready to discuss Lord Loss or his minions yet. You must be good at it to afford a place like this, I say, sliding away from the larger questions and issues. It's a hobby, he demurs, leading me down a long corridor full of framed fo portraits and photographs. The money's good, but I don't worry too much about it. Then how do you pay for all this? I ask nervously. Dervish quickens his pace. I think he's avoiding the question, but then he stops at one of the older portraits and points at it. Recognize him? I study the face of an old man, lined, quite a large nose, but otherwise unspectacular. Is he famous? I ask. Only to us, Dervish says. He was your great-great-great-grandfather, Bartholomew Garadex. That's our original family name on our paternal side. It got shortened to Grady around your great-grandfather's time. He points to a nearby portrait. That's him. Waving a hand at the hall in general, he adds, They're all part of our family. Garadex's... Brady's, Bell's, Moore's. If one of our relations have been photographed or painted, you'll most probably find them here. Returning to the portrait of my great-great-great-grandfather, he says, Bartholomew was sublimely clever man. He started with nothing, but had amassed a fortune by the time of his death. We're still living off of it, at least I am. Cal preferred to make his own way in the world and only dipped into the family coffers in emergencies. How much is left? I inquire. Quite a lot, Dervish says vaguely. Your great-great-grandfather, one of old Bart's boys, wasted most of it. Then his son, the one who changed the family name, restored it. 
It's been fairly constant since, much of it tied up in bonds and properties, which yield steady profits. Who does it go to when... I stop and blush. I mean, who's your heir? Dervish doesn't answer immediately. He gazes at the face in the portrait, as though seeing it for the first time. Then he looks away and says quietly, I have no children. I've willed portions of the estates of various friends and causes. I was meant for the majority of my assets to go to Cal and his kids, since you're the only survivor. My stomach tightens. Dervish sounds as if he's accusing me of caring more about money than my family. I'd swap any amount of fortune if I could bring mum and dad and Gret back, I snarl. Of course you would, Dervish frowns, glancing at me oddly, and I realised I was only imagining the accusation. Let's go, Dervish says. There's another floor to explore. And a cellar. A cellar? I ask nervously. Yes, he says. That's where I bury the bodies. I freeze. And he has to stop and wink broadly before I catch the joke. Lots of storage space on the second floor. Rooms packed with crates, statues, and boxes of books. There are a couple of small bedrooms, including dervishes and the centerpiece. His study. Unlike every other room in the mansion, Dervish's study is carpeted and the walls are covered with leather panels. It's a colossal room, the size of seven or eight of the bedrooms, with two desks larger than most of the beds I've seen. There are bookcases on which the small number of books are carefully arranged. He has a PC, a laptop, a typewriter, several writing pads, and a multitude of pens. There are five chess sets in the room, each different, one made entirely of crystal, another with solid gold pieces. A sword and axe hangs from each wall, the handles encrusted with precious jewels, the blades gleaming brightly. This is wild, I grin, circling the study, checking out some of the other book titles, all to do with ghosts, werewolves, magic, and other occult-related items. Some of my rarer finds, Dervish says, picking up a book and smiling as he flicks through it. The great thing about having loads of money is not having to sell to survive. Aren't you afraid of burglars? I ask. Wouldn't this stuff be safer in a museum? The contents of this room are protected, he says. Anyone breaking in is free to plunder the rest of the house as they please, but they won't be taking anything from here. What sort of security system do you use? I ask. Lasers? Heat sensors? Magic. I start to smirk, thinking this is another of his jokes, but his grim expression unnerves me. I've cast some of my strongest spells in this room, he says. Anybody who enters without my permission will run into serious obstacles, and I don't use that phrase lightly. Dervish sits in a large leather chair behind one of the desks and rocks lightly to the left and right as he addresses me. I know there's nothing it's as tempting as forbidden fruit, Rubich, but I've got to ask you not to come into this room when I'm not here. There are spells I can cast to protect you and spells I can teach you when you're ready to learn, but it's safest not to tempt fate. Are you... I have to wet my lips to continue. Are you a magician? <laughs> no, he chuckles. But I know of, but I know many of the ways of magic. Bartholomew Garadex was a magician, among other things. But there hasn't been one in the family since. Real magicians are rare. You can't become one. You have to be born into it. Ordinary people like you and me can study magic and make it work to an extent. But true magicians have the natural power to change the shape of the world with a click of their fingers. It wouldn't do to have too many people with that kind of power walking around. 
nature limits us to one or two per century is i hate to say his name out loud but i must is lord loss a magician dervish's eyes are dark no he's a demon master he's as far advanced of magicians as magicians are of the rest of us when i was escaping i used magic to fit through the dog flap he nods many of us have magic potential it usually lies dormant but the presence of the demons enabled you to tap into yours the magic within you reacted to theirs without it you would have died along with the others <clears throat> i stare wordlessly at uncle dervish he speaks so honestly so matter-of-factly that he could be explaining a maths problem there's so much i want to ask so many questions but this isn't the time i'm not ready i scratch my head and pluck a long ginger hair from behind my left ear i rub it between my fingers until it falls then face dervish and grin shakily i'll agree to stay out of your study if you'll do something for me in return what he asks and i can tell he's expecting an overbearing request will you call me grubs i can't bloody stand grubich The cell is full of wine racks and dusty bottles. <clears throat> My other great love, apart from books, dervish purrs, wiping clean a label of, large, of a large green bottle. He advances, lights flicking on ahead of him as he walks. I wonder if it's magic until I spot motion detection sensors overhead. Do you drink wine? He asks leading me down one of the many wine racks, one of the many rack lined aisles of the cellar. Uh, Mum and dad let us have a glass with dinner sometimes, but I don't really like it, I answer. <sighs> Shocking, he tuts. I'll have, to I'll have to educate your palate. Wine is as varied and unpredictable as people. There are some vintages you just don't get on with, no matter how famous or popular they are. But you'll always find something you like, if you search hard enough. He stops, picks out another bottle, appraises and replaces it. I roam around for hours down here some days, he sighs. Half the pleasure of having such a fine collection is forgetting what's here and rediscovering it by accident years later. The choosing of a bottle can be almost as fun as the drinking of it. He snorts. <laughs> almost. When we return to the steps leading up to the kitchen, he pauses. I have to ask you to not come down here either, he says. But this has nothing to do with spells or magic. The temperature and humidity have to be maintained just so. He pinches his left thumb and index finger together. I'm fairly easygoing when it comes to material possessions, but where my wine's concerned, I'm unbelievably cranky. If you caused an accident, he shook his head glumly. Well, I wouldn't say much, but I'd silently despise you forever. I'll steer clear, I laugh. The off license will do for me if I want to go boozing. Dervish smiles and leads the way up. The lights switch off automatically behind us, plunging the cellar into cool, precision gloom. And that's it. Back where we started, the main hall, beneath the giant chandelier. Dervish checks his watch. I usually have dinner anywhere between five and seven. You can eat with me. I'm a nifty little chef if I do say so myself. Or do your own cooking and feed whenever you like. The freezer's stocked with pizzas and microwave dinners. I'll eat with you, I tell him. And I'll shout when it's ready. In the meantime, feel free to explore. 
either inside or out. And remember, you can't come to any harm here. He heads for the wide set of marble stairs leading to the first and second floors. Wait, I stop him. You never showed me my room. Davish slaps his forehead playfully. <laughs> You'll get used to that, he chuckles. I'm forever overlooking the obvious. Well, there are 14 bedrooms to choose from. Any except mine is yours for the taking. What, you don't have a room set aside for me? I ask, surprised. I thought about it, he replies. But I decided to let you choose for yourself. You can test out as many as you like. If you want to stay on the upper floor close to me, you can. Though the rooms there are quite modest compared to those on the first floor. He tips an imaginary hat to me, then trots up the stairs to his study. Standing alone in the vast hall, the house creaks around me. I shiver, then recall Uncle Dervish's promise. I can't come to any harm here. I shake off the creeps before they have a chance to take hold. Picking up my bag, which I dropped by the front doors when we came in, I climb, by the, or I climb the ornate stairs and go searching among the beautifully, clip, beautifully kept expansive ray of rooms for one that I can dump my gear in and call my own. Chapter five, portraits. I don't expect to get much sleep the first night. New surroundings, new bed, new life. But surprisingly, I drop off within minutes of climbing underneath the covers of the small first floor bed I choose. And I don't wake until close to 10 in the morning. I feel good as I use the ensuite bathroom. Refreshed. The sun's broken through the clouds and is, and is shining directly onto my bed when I come out of the bathroom. I lie on the covers and bask in the rays, smiling softly. For a moment I think of Gret's on sweet, the rat guts, the start of the nightmares. But I'm in too good a mood to dwell on that. Shaking my thoughts free, I head downstairs for a late breakfast. I'm finishing off my cornflakes and munching my third slice of toast when Dervish enters through the back door. He's been jogging, red-faced, sweaty, panting. I looked in on you earlier, he gasps, rolling his neck around, jiggling his arms and legs. Didn't have the heart to wake you. I don't normally sleep this late, I grin guiltily. I should hope not. He stretches, holds his hand over his head while he counts to ten, then relaxes, pulls up a chair, and sits. Any plans for today? I'm not sure, I admit nervously. I'm used to having nurses plan my days for me. I've been thinking about school, Dervish says. Ideally, I'd like you to get started quickly, but they're midway through term. You'll be playing catch up from the second you sat down. I think it'd be easy if we waited until after the summer when you can go in fresh with the rest of the class. Okay, I'm relieved. I was dreading the return to school. If you want, I can give you some lessons or we can enroll you from private tuition. Davis continues. You've missed a lot and I suspect you'll have to repeat a year, but if you work hard over the summer, I'm not worried about repeating. I mutter. If I was at my old school, I'd want to move up with my friends, but since I'm starting fresh, it doesn't really matter which class I go into. <laughs> I like the way you think, Dervish smiles. Okay, we'll lay off the heavy grinds, but fit the odd bit of learning in along the way. You'll get rusty if you don't keep your brain sharp. What about today? I ask. What should I do? Get the lay of the land, Dervish suggests. Explore the house. Have a look around the grounds and neighboring fields. You won't get done for trip. You won't get the. 
You won't get done for trespassing as long as you don't mess with the livestock. Maybe take a stroll to the village and let the gossips have a go. I'm sure they're dying to check out the new boy. You can start on the household chores tomorrow. Chores? Sweeping, cleaning, stuff like that? Oh. I glance around. I thought a place this big, you'd have a maid or something. <laughs> no maid, Darius laughs. I have a woman who comes in on a, once a fortnight to dust the bedrooms, but that's as far as outside help goes. You'll have to earn your keep here, Grubs, my boy. But we'll start with the slave labor tomorrow, like I said. Find your feet first. Take it easy. Enjoy. He rises, and his expression saddens. Ah, you do some enjoyment after all you've been through. I do the village first. Karshari Vale is quaint, quiet, picturesque. Nice white or creamy houses, smiling people, the occasional car puttering down the main street. I walk through the village, familiarizing myself with the layout. I pass the school, larger than I thought. It's lunch, and the students are in the yard, shouting, laughing, playing football. I don't get close. Nervous. I've had months of dealing strictly with adults. I've almost forgotten what people my own age are like and how to get along with them. Not many shops and a very limited selection of goods. I need new clothes, but socks and underpants are all the local stores have to offer. I suppose there's a town within easy driving distance where Dervish can take me. I'll ask when I get back. The people in the shops and on the street eye me, curiously, but without suspicion. I keep expecting them to ask for my name or pass a comment. You must be Mr. Grady's new lodger, or you're not from around here, are you? But they just nod pleasantly and let me go about my business. Early afternoon, wandering around the mansion, checking out the rooms. I knew the instant I arrived that this was a monster of a house, but it's only today that I realized just how enormous it is. It doesn't have a single modest inch or nook to it. Everything is overblown and over the top. I feel out of place. I'm used to ordinary terrace houses, wallpaper from chain stores, furniture bought from glossy catalogues, paperback bestsellers and brand name references guides on the bookshelves. But as awkward as I feel in this massive ornate old house, I'm not scared. Although it reeks of history, and is full of barbaric weapons and grotesque items like the piranha tank, I'm not frightened. I don't get shivers down my spine strolling through the corridors, some longer than the street where I used to live. I don't imagine monsters lurking under the beds or demons cackling in the shadows. This house is safe and protected within these walls. I don't know how I know, I just do. The Hall of Portraits I've been here 15, maybe 20 minutes, studying the faces of my relatives. Most are strangers, faded faces from the long forgotten past. Many of them young, just teenagers, but some are familiar. I spot Grandad Grady, my great aunt Martha, a few cousins I met when I was younger, all of whom have died during the course of my short life. I look for my picture, but I'm not among them. Dad and Gret are, though, in new frames, recent photos. I remember the day they were taking, last summer, when they were on holiday in Italy. No photo of Mum. I go through all of them again, but she isn't here. Two of us are missing. Shopping for clothes, 20 miles from Cartier Vale in a large mall. Lots of people and noise. I feel lost in the crowd. Dervish sticks close by me, sensing my nervousness. Kebabs when we've finished shopping. Hot and juicy. Dervish nibbles slowly at his, delicately. I finish long before him, slurping down the last of my coke, studying him as he eats. Wondering if I should mention mums in my absence from the whole of portraits. 
An unasked question is the most futile thing in the world, Dervish says, startling me. Doesn't look up. Swallows his food. Waits. I was looking at the photos and portraits in the hall today, I begin. And you want to know why there are so many teenagers? A frown. No. I mean, I noticed that, but it was mum and me I was curious about. You have photos of Dad and Gret, but not us. Oh. He grimaces. My faux pas. Most people ask about the teens. The photos and portraits are all of dead family members. I like to frame them as they looked at the end of their lives. So most of the photos were taken shortly before the subject's death. We have a tragic family history. Lots of us have been killed young which is why there are so many pubescents up there. He wipes around his mouth with a napkin, carefully balls it up and lays it aside. As for why Sharon hasn't been included, it's simple. No in-laws. Everybody on those walls is a blood relative. It's a family tradition. But I have lots of photos of her, as well as Callum Gretz, in albums that you're free to browse through. Eh, maybe later. I smile. I just wanted to make sure you didn't have any underhanded reasons for not including us with the others. Everything's about board with me, Grubs, Devish says, then sips from his mug of co then sips from his mug of coffee without taking his eyes off me. Well, almost everything. Late. Close to midnight. In my pajamas. No slippers. Left my old pair at the hospital. I forgot to buy new ones today. The stone floor's cold. I have to keep moving my toes to keep them warm. I'm drawn back to the hall of portraits, studying them in the moonlight, the faces mostly concealed by shadows, focusing on the teenagers, dozens of them, all my age or slightly older, wondering why the faces of the dead teens fascinate me and why I feel uneasy. I'm back in my room, in bed, before the answer strikes and drives all hope of sleep away in a flash. In the restaurant, Dervish didn't simply say that many of our family members had died young. He said they'd been killed. Chapter 6 Spleen. Settling in. Daily chores. Washing up after meals. Sweeping a different couple of floors each day. Polishing the furniture in one of the large halls or rooms. Lots of other less regular jobs. Taking out the garbage, cleaning windows, running errands in the village. I enjoy the work. It keeps me busy. Not much else to do here apart from play chess with Dervish, watch TV... Dervish has a massive five Dervish has a massive 55 inch width widescreen set, which he hardly ever uses. And read. Chess doesn't thrill me. Dervish is like mom and dad, a chess fanatic, and beats me easily each time we play. I'd as soon not play at all, but he gently presses me to work on my game. I don't get my family's obsession with chess but I guess I'll just have to bear it here like I did at home. I read more than I normally do. I'm not big on literature, but Dervish doesn't have a great, but Dervish doesn't have a great collection of modern fiction. I pick up a few new books in the veil and order some more over on the, and order some more over the internet, but I'm not spoiled for choice. I try some of the thousands of occult books littering the shelves Friggin' they've got to be better than watching the moon all night, but they're too complicated or densely written to be of interest. So that leaves me with the TV. An endless stream of soap operas, chat shows, movies, sitcoms, sports programs. And while I never thought I'd admit as much, and while I never thought I'd admit such a thing, TV does get a bit boring after a while, if it's all you have to keep yourself amused. But hey... It's a million times better than the Institute.
A week passes. Eddie is with the house, getting to know Dervish, though he's a hard one to figure. Kind, thoughtful, caring, but aloof, with a warped sense of humour. He came in one day while I was watching the news, caught a report about a serial killer who chopped off and collected his victims' heads. Commented dryly, <laughs> There's a man determined to get ahead in life. Spent the next five minutes doubled over with laughter while I gazed at him, astonished, and the TV broadcast pictures of the bloodbaths and weeping relatives. His thirst for chess is at least equal to that of dad and mum, if not more so. He went easy on me to begin with, gently encouraging me to play, treating the games as fun. Now he's showing his true colours, insists that I play with him every night and get irritated when I play badly. You've got to learn to love the game, he told me last night, tossing a captured rook at me with unexpected force. Chess is life. You have to love it. You have to love it as you love living. If you don't, he said no more, just stormed out of the room, leaving me at a loss for words, rubbing my cheek where he's with a rock with a rope struck. Later, when I'd recovered and was passing him in the hall of my way to bed, I muttered, Get a life, you freak. Perfect comeback. Just an hour too late. He's got no time for music. I find a grand total of three CDs in the house, all old albums by some group called Led Zeppelin. Doesn't read fiction. Watches, watches only the occasional documentary on TV. Spent a lot of time on the web, but from what I've seen when I visited him in his study, he doesn't seem to surf or play games. He mostly exchanges emails with contacts around the globe or visits dull-looking encyclopedic sites. Apart from his books and antiques, chess and jogging are in his email mates. He doesn't seem to have any hobbies or any apparent interest in the world beyond his house. There are stables, long abandoned, behind the mansion. I'm exploring one of them, idly towing through idly towing through the old nails and horseshoes in the ground in search of something interest in search of some interesting nugget when somebody raps on the rotten door and startles me out of my skin. Oh, peace, hombre, the stranger chuckles as I duck and grab a horseshoe for protection. I come to greet you, not to eat you, as the cannibal said to the missionary. A boy, a year, so, a year or so younger than me, enters and sticks out his hand. I stare at it a moment, then shake it. He's a lot shorter than me, chubby, with black hair and a lazy left eye which hangs half closed. Wearing a faded pair of jeans and an old Simpsons t-shirt. Billy Spleen, he says, pumping my hand. And your grubs don't call me Groovage Grady, right? Right. I grin thinly, then repeat his name. Billy Spleen? Bill E, he corrects me and spells it out. Actually, it's really Billy, he confesses, but I changed it. I haven't been able to do it by deed, Paul, yet, but I will when I'm older. There's nothing wrong with Billy. It's a hell of a lot better than Groovich or Grubs, but Bill E sounds cooler, like a rap star. He talks quick and sharp, fingers dancing in the air to accent his words. Are you from the village? I ask politely. Yep, I'm a bailer, he yawns as though it's the dullest thing in the world. I used to live a few miles over, in a cottage smaller than this stable, until Mum died. Then I moved in with my grandparents, the original spleens, as Mum used to call them. They're okay, just a bit old-fashioned and straight-laced. Billy studies the disturbed nails and horseshoes on the ground and grins. <laughs> you won't find any gold here, he chortles. I've been through these sheds more times than I can count looking for Lord, looking for old Lord Sheftree's treasure. Treasure? Billy is a little too chummy for my liking. I've never been fond of people who come along and immediately start acting as though you're old friends. But I don't want to say anything to insult him, at least not until I know a bit more about him. You don't know about the treasure? 
he hoots as though I've commit as though I've admitted I didn't know the world was round. Lord Sheftree, he owned this place years ago, is supposed to have hidden cases full of treasure somewhere on these grounds. His getaway stash, in case he ever had in case he ever had to make a quick exit and needed some ready cash. He was a real swindler. He used to keep a fish tank full of piranha, I interrupt. And he put a baby to them, I know. Dervish told you. Billy looks disappointed. Oh, I love telling that story. Just about everyone in Carsery Vale knows it, so it's not often that I have the chance to break it to someone new. Oh, kick Dervish's ass for spoiling it for me. Excuse me, I mutter, exasperated. But who the hell are you? And what are you doing here? Billy blinks. You don't need to speak to me like that, he sniffs. I'm only trying to be friendly. I just want to know who you are, I respond coolly. You come in here telling me your name and that you know all about me, but I've never heard about you before. Are you a relative of Dervish's? A paperboy? What? Paperboy? He snorts. <laughs> I don't think Dervish has ever bought a paper in his life. If it doesn't come bound in leather or bat's wings, packed full of spells and dark incantations, he isn't interested. Billy steps to the left, into the light shining through the hole in the roof. I'm no relative, he says. Just a friend. I hang out with Dervish, play chess with him, do some odd jobs. He takes me for rides on his bike in return and teaches me some spells. Has he taught you any spells yet? I shake my head. Oh, they're cool, he grins. I don't know if I don't know if most of them really work, but the words you use are wicked. I feel like a real magician when I'm casting them. Could you teach me some? I ask. No, Billy answers promptly. That's the first thing Dervish taught me. Only a teacher is allowed to teach. He says if he ever catches me passing on my spells to anybody, he'll can the lessons and ban me from coming here. And he means it. Dervish isn't the sort to yank your chain about stuff like that. I'm warming to Billy Spleen. I like the way he talks about Dervish, but it's been a while since I made a new friend, so instead of saying something simple, I find myself asking cynically, did Dervish tell you to come chat to me? Are you supposed to be my new best friend? Billy sneers. <laughs> my friendship can't be bought or bartered. I usually come over a few week I usually come over a few evenings every week and weekends. Devish asked me to stay away this week to give you a chance to settle in. I was looking forward to checking you out and showing you around the Vale as a fellow wolf, and I thought we might have stuff in common. But now I don't think I'll bother. You're a bit too up your own ass for my liking. I'll just go see Dervish and leave you to scurry around out here on your own. Billy turns to leave in a huff. Hey, when did your mum die? I ask quietly. He stops and squints at me. Nearly seven years ago. I was just a kid. And your dad? He smiles crookedly. I never knew him. Don't even know who he was. He's still alive, I think, so I'm not an official orphan, but I felt like one since mum died. My folks only died a few months ago, I say. It still hurts. A lot. So if I act like a spaz, sorry, but that's just the way I feel right now. Billy's features soften. When my mum died, I didn't speak to anyone except gran or granddad for almost a year. If other kids came near, I'd scream and attack them. The parents stopped them hitting back. One day, in a shop, I tried on a kid when there was nobody around. He knocked the crap out of me. I was fine after that. I offered my chin. Take a pop if you want. Billy pads over, makes a fist, then taps my chin lightly. <laughs> Come on, he laughs. Let's go see what Whirling Dervish is up to. The study. Dervish and Billy catching up. Lots of names I don't recognize. Billy talking about school, looking forward to the summer break. Dervish telling him about a new book on Bavarian sorcerers, which, bought off, which he bought off the web. 
What about the ice spell? Billy asks. He looks he looks at me and points to his lazy left eye. I'm supposed to have this operated on in a few years, but I'm sure Dervish can conjure up a spell to spare me the hassle. <laughs> I've asked around, Dervish laughs. But the great magicians of yore didn't bother much with drooping eyelids. Besides, magic shouldn't be used for personal gain, Billy. Dervish always refers to Billy as Billy. I guess he's known him for so long he finds it hard to change. Tell that to great, great what's it's Gravex. Billy snorts. He used his magic to make millions, didn't he? Bartholomew Garadex was an exception, Dervish says. Billy shoots the study as though it's his own, pulls books out and only half pushes them back, shoves Dervish out of the way to go surfing on the web, opens a drawer in the desk to show me the skull of a genuine witch, burned at the stake for casting levitious spells in the very old young men of the community, he informs me, waving it around in front of his face, poking his fingers into its empty sockets. Dervish lets Billy do as he pleases, sits back and smiles patiently. He's not normally this wound up, Dervish remarks when Billy goes to the toilet. Your arrival upsets him. He used to have the, he's used to having the run of the house. I think he's worried that things are going to change now that you've moved in. Why does he come here? I ask. His mother and I were friends, Dervish says. She died in a boating accident leaving Billy in care of his grandparents. He pulls a face. All I'll say about that pair is that they're aptly named. Spleen. More cantankerous old couple you couldn't imagine. I felt sorry for Billy, so I started visiting and taking him, and taking him out on my bike. Ma and Pa Spleen weren't too keen. They still do everything they can to stop him coming over here, but persistence is something I'm good at. I tend to get my own way when I really want to. The odd persuasion spell helps. He winks. I can't tell if he's serious or joking. Billy returns. <sighs> Shaking water from his hands. No towels, Dev, he grumbles. Dervish raises an eyebrow at me. Fresh towels are your department, aren't they, Master Grubs? Sorry, I grimace. I forgot. If I was you, Mr. Grady, sir, I'd sack him, Billy says with relish, then laughs and asks Dervis to teach him a new spell. Will it make the two of you disappear? Dervis asks innocently. Yeah, Billy gasps, face lighting up, then curses as Dervis shoots us out of the room and slams the door shut behind us. The Hall of Portraits. Billy knows the faces and names off by heart, giving me a lecture, filling me in on my family background. I listen with pretend politeness, only paying attention to the occasional juicy snippet. Ursula Garadex, pirate, Billy intones, tapping the frame of a large canvas portrait. The woman in the picture only has one eye and three of her fingers are missing. Two on her left hand, one on her right. A cutthroat, utterly merciless. Augustine Grady, servant to some prince or other. Course of death, he got kicked in the head by a horse. Justin Plumpton, a banker, nothing interesting about him, and so on. After a while, I asked Billy about the teenagers and if he knows how they died. Uh, Dervish doesn't say much about them, he replies. I think it's some ancient family curse. You'll probably go toes up any day now. I'll try hard to take you with me, I retort. We come to Dad and Gret. Billy pauses curiously. These are new. I don't know who... My dad and sister, I inform him quietly. He winces. Oh, I should have guessed. Sorry. He looks at me questioningly, licks his lips, stares back at the photos. An unasked question is the most futile thing in the world, I prod him. 
And that's one of Dervish's sayings. You know, it's licks his lips again. Do you want to tell me how they died, or is it a secret? I asked Dervish, but he won't say, and Gran and Grandad don't know. Nobody in the village does. My stomach tightens. Flashes of a crocodile-headed dog, a hell child, the eerie master. They were murdered. Billy's eyes widen. His lace left eyelid snaps up as though on an elastic band. No bull, he gasps. My expression's dark. No bull. Do you know who did it? It was there. Billy gulps deeply. When they were being killed? Yes. How'd you get away? I consider how much I should tell him. Decide to try the truth. They were murdered by demons. I escaped using magic. He frowns. If this is a joke... Stops when he sees my face. Does Dervish know? Yes. And he believes you? Yes. But he's the only one. Everybody else thinks I'm making it up. Billy grunts dismissively. Well, if Dervish believes you, so do I. He turns from the photos and does an odd little shuffling dance, mumbling weird words. What was that for? I ask, bemused. <laughs> One of Dervish's spells, he says. It makes the dead smile. Dervish says it's important to keep the dead happy. The reason this house isn't haunted is that Dervish keeps its ghost laughing. <laughs> Rot, I bellow. Maybe, Billy grins. But I've been dancing for years and I've never been bothered by ghosts. Why stop now and run the risk? We watch MTV on the 55-inch widescreen TV, munching popcorn, drinking coke from, from tall paper cups, just like in the cinema. <laughs> the TV was my idea, Billy brags, the remote control balanced on his left knee. Dervish resisted to begin with, but I kept on at him and eventually he bought one. Does he always cave in to your demands? I ask. No, Billy sighs. I can wrap Gran and Grandad around my little finger, but Dervish doesn't crumple. He got the TV because I convinced him it was a good idea. His guests would get your use out of it, even if he didn't. You and Dervish are close, aren't you? I know. Step aside, Sherlock Holmes. There's a new kid in town. Billy chuckles, rolling his eyes. I don't want to, like, get between you or anything. I mumble awkwardly. <laughs> you kidding if you tried, he responds smugly. I could, I bristle. He's my uncle. So, Billy laughs, <laughs> he's my father. I stare at him, stunned. Billy looks sheepish. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, he mutters. You won't tell him, will you? No, but, I mean, I catch my breath. You said you didn't know your father. Well, I don't, he says. Not officially, but it hardly takes a genius to work it out. He wouldn't invite me over and make such a fuss of me if we weren't related. And Gran and Grandad Spleen wouldn't tolerate his involvement unless they had to, no matter how close a friend of Mum's he was. Dervish has to be my dad. It's logic. Have you ever asked him? Billy shakes his head instantly. Why spoil it? We get along great the way we are. If the truth ever came out in the open, he might decide to sue for custody. Wouldn't you like that? I ask. He shrugs. I wouldn't. I wouldn't miss Gran and Grandad that much if I moved in with Dervish, he admits. I could still go on. I could still go and see them all the time. But if he lost, they might take out a court order to stop him seeing me. I reckon they struck a deal with him when Mum died. He could carry on visiting or have me over to visit as long as he never told me who he really was. If I go missing about, it might screw up everything. 
I scratch my head, thinking that over. It all seems a bit complicated to me. Dervish doesn't strike me as the sort to go in for such subterfuge. But I'm new on the I'm but I'm new on the scene. Billy has spent his Billy has spent most of his life around my uncle. I guess he knows what he's talking about. That makes us cousins. If it's true, I note. <laughs> yeah, Billy giggles, then pokes me in the chest. He also makes me his son and rightful heir, so don't get too attached to this place, Grady, because as soon as the old man kicks it, you're out of here. <laughs> Charming, I laugh and dump the last of my popcorn over Billy's head. Hey! Billy shouts, shaking kernels from his head all over the couch and floor. Clean that up! You clean it, I grin wickedly. It's your house. Both of us laughing. He chases me up the stairs to my room, loving fistfuls of popcorn on my head all the way. Chapter 7. Carnage in the Forest. Routines. Daily chores. Lots of chess competitions with Dervish and Billy. Dervish taught Billy how to play. He's much better than I am, though his concentration wanders occasionally, so I beat him more than I should. Watching TV. Hanging out with Billy. We play football and explore the countryside when we're not stuck in front of the massive screen or locking horns in chess tournaments. I'm recognized in Carterie Vale now. Billy introduced me to the shopkeepers and gossips. They accept me the same as any other kid. Pass the time of day with me when I come to pick up when I come in to pick up shopping. Ask about Dervish and what I think of the mansion. Tell me tales from its gory past trying to spook me. Billy also takes me to visit Gran and Grandad's spleen. A couple of battle axes, narrow-eyed, sharp-tongued, drably dressed, the house in a state of perpetual gloominess. Grandad spleen rambles on about the old days and how Castery of Ale has gone to the dogs. Grandma spleen hovers in the background, serving tea and biscuits, eyes darting to me to, sp eyes daring me to spill the crumbs on her carpet. Both have lots to say about Dervish. None of it good. Not right living out there on his own. A house like that's too big for one man. He should be married, but no one will have him. If he does anything out of order, you let us know. Billy smiles apologetically when we leave. I love my grandparents, but I know what they're like. I won't take you there too often. A shrug as if it's no big deal but offer up silent thanks. I don't know how he sticks them. I'd have run away from home years ago if I was caged in with a crappy old pair like that. Although, thinking twice about it, I suppose it's better to have grumpy grandparents than parents. I suppose it's better to have grumpy grandparents as parents than no parents at all. I complained a lot about mum and dad when they were still with me. They had their faults. I think everybody does, but I wouldn't complain if they were with me, alive, now. The murders are never far from my thoughts. The memories of Vane, Artery, and Lord Loss haunt me. Many nights I wake screaming, arms thrashing, eyes wild, imagining demons in the room with me, under the bed, in the wardrobe, scratching at the door. Dervish is always there when I wake from my nightmares sitting by the bottom of the bed, passing me a mug of hot chocolate or a towel to wipe the sweat from my face. He never says much or asks for what I was dreaming about. Leaves as soon as I've settled down. We haven't discussed the demons. I think Dervish wants to, but I'm reluctant to step back into that world of darkness. He leaves books in my room or open on the tables downstairs about monsters, demons, magic, I avoid them at first. Later, I read certain passages and study pictures, attracted to the mystery of this other realm despite my fear of it. No pictures of my demons in the books. 
I glanced through some of the many encyclopedias in the mansion, but there's no mention of a Lord Loss or his familiars in any of them. Friday, listening to CDs I bought in the Vale, a roaring outside of a motorbike approaching. But it isn't Dervish, he's up in his study. I creep to the window and secretly watch the cyclist dismounting. A woman dressed in black leather, long blonde hair tumbles down over her shoulders when she removes, my, when she removes her helmet. She stretches, hands going high above her head. Ay, caramba! I'm down the stairs in a flash, but not as fast as Dervish. He's already opening the front doors. I catch a glimpse of a big smile. Then he's shouting, Mira, I wasn't expecting you for another few days. Why didn't you phone? You never answer, the woman says, meeting Dervish in the doorway, hugging him hard. She pushes him away and studies his face. How's it going, hun? Not bad, Dervish chuckles. How's the lodger? She spots me over Dervish's shoulder. Oh, never mind. I'll ask him myself. She strides over and offers her hand. I shake it politely. Mira Flame, she introduces herself. She smiles, dazzling. And if I know Dervish, he hasn't told you a thing about me, right? I nod dumbly. I think I'm in love. Grubs Grady, Mira Flame, Dervish says. Mira is a close friend of mine. She comes to stay quite regularly. I meant to tell you she was on her way, but I forgot. He's useless, isn't he? Mira laughs. At some things, I mutter, finding my voice at last. Mira unsips the front of her leather jacket, revealing a t-shirt with an anti-war slogan. She slides out of the coat then sits on the stairs and peels off her boots and trousers. She's wearing shorts underneath. Make yourself at home, Dervish says wryly. Don't I always? Mira replies. She catches me ogling her and winks. Got a girlfriend, Grubs. If not, watch out. I like younger men. I blush like a fire engine. Mira slips through to the kitchen for a drink. Dervish laughs. <laughs> you look like a kettle. I frown. What do you mean? There's steam coming out of your ears. Before I can think of a comeback, Mira calls from the kitchen. Whoops! I spilled milk all over my t-shirt. Can you come help me out of it, Grubsy? I think life's about to get very interesting. Ah, says Billy with a cheater's smile. The mysterious Mira Flame. She's hot, isn't she? And doesn't she know it? I huff. She hasn't stopped flirting with me since she arrived. My cheeks feel like they've been slapped a dozen times today. We're in the kitchen, guzzling milkshakes. Dervish and Mira have gone out for dinner. Ah, don't worry about that, Billy says. She does it with me too. She likes making men and boys blush. And she's doing a good job of it, I mutter, then cough. <clears throat> Her and Dervish, are uh, they? Nah, Billy says, just friends. She travels around a lot, always off somewhere exotic. Comes to stay every now and then. They go on biking holidays together sometimes, but Dervish says they aren't an item. And I don't think he'd lie. I mean, who could keep quiet if they had a girlfriend like that? Saturday. Mira woke me up this morning for breakfast in bed. Walked right in wearing a dressing gown. And as far as my imagination is concerned, nothing underneath. Sat chatting with me while I ate. Asking about life with Dervish and what I thought of Karshari Vale. Boring as hell, isn't it? And just being all around beautiful. 
had a hard time keeping my eyes on my toast and fried eggs. Billy came early to see Mira. She fussed over him like a mother hen. <laughs> You've grown. You're filling out, becoming a man. When are you going to sweep me off my feet and take me away from all this? Dervish and Mira made for a study after a while, so Billy and I headed out to explore the nearby forest, searching for Lord Sheftree's buried treasure. If we find it, we don't tell anyone, Billy says, poking through the roots of an old dead oak. We wait until we're older and know more about these things. Then we sell it on the quiet and split the profits 50-50, agreed? <laughs> Maybe I'll bump you off and take it all for myself, I smirk. Won't work, he says seriously. I keep a diary. If I die, Gran and Grandad Spleen will find it, read about us digging for the treasure and put two and two together. <laughs> you think of everything, don't you? I laugh. I try to, he says immodestly. I get it from Dervish in our chess games. He's always nagging at me to maximize my potential and use my brain more. What is it with him and chess? I ask. My mind and dad were the same, like it was the most important thing in the world. I don't know about your mum, Billy says, but it's a family tradition on your dad's side. Seven or eight of the clan have been grandmasters. When Dervish talks about his ancestors, he often makes mention of the great chess players. He even judges people by their ability on the board. I asked him about one of their relatives once, a girl who died about 30 years ago. She looked interesting in her photo and I wanted to know what she was like. He just grunted and said that she wasn't a very good chess player. That's all he had to say about her. Billy decides the treasure isn't buried under the tree. Picking up her tools, an axe and a spade, we go in search of other likely spots. How often do you come searching for this treasure? I ask. It depends on the weather, he answers. In summer, when it's hot and the evenings are long, I maybe come out three or four times a month, perhaps only once a month in the winter. Don't you have any friends? I inquire bluntly. I notice he doesn't talk much about other kids, unless he's chatting about school. And he always has plenty of time for visiting Dervish and me. He never says he can't come. He never says he can't come or has to dash off early to see another friend. Eh, not many, he says honestly. I have mates in class, but I don't see much of them outside school. Gran and Grandad Spleen likes to keep me tucked up safe and stuck indoors, which is part of the problem. I like hanging out with Dervish, which is another part. I guess mostly I'm just odd. Not very good at making friends. <laughs> you make friends with me pretty easily, I remind him. Yeah, but you're like me, he says. An outsider. Different. A freak. We're both weird, which is why we get along. Not sure I like the sound of that. I never thought of myself as a freak. But it'd be childish to stamp my foot and shout something like, I'm not weird. So I let it ride and follow Billy deeper into the woods. In the middle of a thicket, picking a spot to clear where we can excavate, I find a patch of soft earth beneath two stones. I start to dig and earth crumbles away. It looks like there's been a hole here, probably an animal's den, but maybe, just maybe. I think this might, I begin. Shh, I'm caught short. Billy presses his fingers to his lips. Silence, he crouches low. I follow suit. I can tell by his intent expression that this isn't a game. My heart beats faster. I grip my axe tightly. Flashback to that room. That night. Terror starts to dig its claws in deep. I smell him, Billy whispers. If he spots us, laugh and act as if we're trying to surprise him. If he doesn't, keep down until I tell you. Who is it? I hiss. Billy waves the question away and concentrate on the trees beyond the thicket. Ten seconds pass. Twenty. Thirty. I'm counting inside my head the way I do when I'm swimming and trying to hold my breath on the water, thinking, if it's them, 
Should I run or try to fight? 69, 70, 71, a pair of feet, trainers, lime green sports socks. I stifle a laugh. It's only dervish. The terror passes and my heartbeat slows. I make a note of myself to guilt Billy a thumping later for scaring me like that. Billy stays low as dervish pats past the thicket and moves on through the trees beyond. Then he wriggles out as quietly as possible and gets to his feet, gazing after the departed dervish. What was that about? I ask, standing, wiping myself down. Let's follow him, Billy says. Why? I get a thought. You don't think he's going to meet Mira out here, do you? I grin slyly and notch his ribs with an elbow. Billy glares. Don't be stupid, he snaps. Just trust me, okay? Before I can respond, he slips, in, he slips away in pursuit of Dervish, like an Indian tracker. I lag along a few paces, behind, bemused, wondering what this silly little game is in aid of, and where it's leading. Several minutes later, hot on Dervish's trail, Billy keeps his prey in sight, but is careful not to give himself away. He moves with surprising stealth. I feel like a clumsy bull behind him. Dervish stops and stoops. Billy catches his breath, reaches back and drags me up behind, beside him. Can you see? He whispers. I can see his head and shoulders, I grant in return, squinting. No sign of Mira. Worse luck. Watch his hands when he rises. I do as Billy commands. Moments later, my uncle stands, holding something stiff and red. I get a clearer view of it as he turns to the left. A dead fox, its body ripped apart. Dervish produces a plastic bag, drops the fox into it, studies the ground around him, moves on. Billy waits a couple of minutes before advancing to the spot where Dervish found the fox. The ground is stained with blood and a few scraps of fur and guts. The blood hasn't thickened, Billy notes, poking a red pull with a twig, holding it up as though judging the quality of the blood. The fox must have been killed last night or early this morning. So what? I asked, bewildered. A dead fox, big deal. I've seen Dervish collect others like that, Billy says quietly. There's an incinerator on the far side of the veil. Dervish has a key to it. He takes the corpses there and burns them when nobody's about. The most hygienic is total method, I note. Dervish doesn't believe in interfering with nature, Billy disagrees. He says corpses are an important part of the food chain, that we should leave dead creatures where we find them, unless they're likely to cause a public nuisance. What's all this about? I ask edgily. Billy doesn't answer. He stares at the forest floor, thinking, then turns sharply and beckons. Follow me, he snaps, breaking into a jog, and I have no other option than to run after him. A clearing by a stream. Beautiful afternoon sun. I lie down and soak it up with Billy and soak it up while Billy drags a large black plastic bag out from under a bush. I've collected these over the last three months, he says, untying a knot in the, in the bag's top. I saw Dervish removing a couple of bodies during the months before and thought I'd keep an eye out for corpses and grab a hold of them before he did. He finishes with the knot, clutches the bottom of the bag and spills the contents out. A swarm of flies rises in the air. The stench is disgusting. <coughs> what the? I cough, covering my mouth and nose with my hands, eyes watering. Lots of bones and scraps of flesh at Billy's feet. He separates them carefully with a large stick. A badger, he says, pointing to one of the rotting carcasses. A hedgehog, a swan, a... What the hell is this crap? I interrupt angrily. That stench is enough to knock. 
I didn't know why I felt I had to hold on to them, Billy says softly, eyes on the putrid corpses. He looks up at me. Now I know. To show them to you. I stare back uncertainly. This feels very wrong. If Billy was trying to gross me out, I can understand, even appreciate the joke. But there's no laughter in his eyes, no grisly delight in his expression. Well, not you personally, he continues, looking back to the animals. But part of me must have wanted to show them to somebody. It was just a matter of time until the right person came along. Billy, I mutter, you're freaking me out big time. Come closer, he says. I study his expression, then the spade lying close to him on the ground. I take a firm grip on my axe, walk a few steps towards him, stop short of easy reach. Look at them, he says, pointing to the animals. Like the fox dervish found, their bodies have been ripped open. Heads and limbs are missing or chewed to pieces. I flash back to images of Dad hanging from the ceiling. I'm going to be sick, I moan, turning aside. These haven't been killed by animals, Billy says. I pause. Look at the way their stomachs have been ripped apart, jaggedly but up the middle. And bite marks don't correspond to any predators I know of. If this was the work of a wolf or a bear... The marks should be wider spaced and larger because of the size of their jaws. There aren't any wolves or bears around here, I frown. I know, but I had to assume that it could have been a bear or a wolf or a wild dog until I was able to examine the corpses in closer detail. I didn't leap to any conclusions. But you've come to some sense, I note wryly. So hit me with it. What do you think did this? I'm not sure, Billy says evenly. But I checked out the teeth marks in the best biology books and websites that I could find. As near as I could match them, they seemed to belong to an ape. You're not telling me it's King Kong, I whoop. Or a human, Billy finishes. Cold, eerie silence. Dervish's study. Billy leads me in. I'm not sure where Dervish is, but his bike isn't outside, so he's not home. Mira's bike is gone too. We shouldn't be here, I whisper anxiously. Dervish says this room is magically protected. I know, Billy replies. He steps in front of me, spread his, spreads his arms, and chants... I don't know what language he's using, but the words are long and lyrical. He turns as he chants, eyes closed, concentrating. Billy stops and opens his eyes. Safe, he grunts. You sure? Davis taught me that spell years ago. He updates it every so often when he alters the protective spells of the house. It'll probably be one of the first spells he teaches you when he decides you're ready to learn. I feel uncomfortable, especially since I promised Dervish that I wouldn't come in here without him. But there's no stopping Billy, and I'm too curious to back out now. What are we looking for? I ask, following him to one of the bookshelves. He came here directly from the clearing, without saying anything or more about the dead animals he collected. This, Billy says lifting a large, untitled book down from one of the shelves over Dervish's PC. He lays it on the desk, but doesn't open it. Demons killed your parents and sister, he murmurs. My insides freeze. He looks up. We inhabit a world of magic. My proposal would make an ordinary person laugh scornfully, but we're not ordinary. We're Grady's, descendants of the magic... Descendants of the magician Bartholomew Garadex. Remember that. He opens the book. Creamy, crinkled pages. Handwriting. I try reading a few paragraphs, but the letters are indecipherable. Squiggles and swirls. What is that Latin? Greek? One of these old languages? I ask. It's English, Billy says. Coded? 
He half smiles. <laughs> kind of. Dervish cast a reading spell on it. The words are written clearly, but we can't interpret them without unraveling the spell. Billy turns to the first page and runs a finger over the title at the top. Lycanthropy through the ages, he intones. How do you know that if you can't break the spell? I challenge him. Dervish read it out to me once. He looks at me archly. Do you know what lycanthropy means? Of course, I huff. I've seen werewolf movies. Billy nods. Dervish read bits of it to me. They were all to do with werewolves and leg they were all to do with werewolf legends and rules. He's fascinated by werewolves. Lots of book lots of his books focus on shape changes. Billy flicks to near the end of the book, scans the pages, flicks over a few more, finds what he's searching for, and lays a finger on a photograph. I discovered this a year or so ago, he says softly. Didn't think anything of it then, but when I saw Dervish removing some of the bodies of the animals a few months ago, and found others ripped to pieces, always close to a full moon. I don't believe where you're going with this, I grumble. Remember the demons, he says, and turns the book around so I can see the face in the photo. A young man, nearly 16 or 17, troubled looking, thin, his face distorted, lots of hair, a blunt, sh a blunt jaw, sharp teeth and yellow eyes. There's something familiar about the face, but it takes me a few seconds to place it. Then it clicks. It reminds me of one of the faces from the Hall of Portraits. One that hangs close to Dad and Gret's photos. Stephen Grok, Billy says. A cousin. Died seven or eight years ago. I met him once, I whisper. But I was very young. I don't remember much about him. Except he didn't have hair or teeth like that. Billy flicks the pages backwards. Comes to rest on a page with another photo from the Hall of Portraits. This time a young girl. Kim Reynolds, 10 years old when she died, supposedly in a fire. He flicks back further, almost to the start of the book, stops at a rough hand drawing of a naked, excessively hairy man hunched over on all fours like a dog or a wolf. Razor sharp teeth, claws, an elongated head, yellow, savage eyes. That's not a human, I mumble, my mouth dry. I think it is. Or was, Billy contradicts me. I can't be sure, but I've compared it to a drawing of Abraham Garadax, one of Gold Bartholomew's sons, and I swear they're one in the same. I reach out with trembling fingers and gently close the book. Say it, I croak. Say what you brought me here to tell me. I'm not saying this to shock you, Billy begins. I wouldn't say it to anyone else, but you were honest enough just... But you were honest enough to tell me about the demon, so I think... Just say it! I snap. Okay. Billy takes a deep, relaxing breath. I think those people in the book were shape changes. I think like Cantopia runs in our family, and has done for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. I think your uncle, my father, has it. I think Dervish is a werewolf. Chapter 8. A Theory You're crazy! Storming down the stairs to the main hall, Billy hurrying to catch up. It makes sense, he insists, darting ahead of me, blocking my path. The bite marks, the way the animals were ripped up the middle, why he collects the carcasses and incinerates them, getting rid of the evidence. Crazy! I snort again and shove past him. A while ago, you told me Dervish was your father. Now you reckon he's a werewolf? What's one got to do with the other? Billy says. Werewolves are normal people, except around the time of a full moon. You're barking mad! I shout, throwing open the front doors 
stepping out into welcome sunlight. This is the 21st century. The police have cameras everywhere, DNA testing, all the rest. A werewolf wouldn't last a week in today's world. It would if it had human cunning, Billy disagrees. Hear me out, will you? I've been working through I've been working this through in my head for the last few months. I've got most of it figured. I stop reluctantly. A large part of me wants to keep on walking and not listen to another word of Billy's madness. But a small part of me is fascinated and wants to hear more. <sighs> Go on, I grunt. But if you start on about silver bullets or... You think I want to kill him? Billy snaps. He's my father. Billy strolls as he outlines his theory. I wander along beside him. In movies, you become a werewolf if another werewolf bites you. But I don't think dozens of people from one family could get bitten one after another over so many centuries. It must be passed on by genes from parents to children. The unlucky ones are born to become werewolves. So I imagine they start to change pretty early when the kids or teenagers Dervish is in his 40s. If he's a werewolf, I think he's been living with us for decades. Werewolves can't be wild killers, he continues. If they were, Dervish would have killed loads of people here. I've checked old newspapers in the library. Nobody nearby has been killed by a savage beast any time recently. Maybe he roams further afield to do his killing? I insert Riley. I thought that, Billy says earnestly, but I've kept a close eye on him these past few months, and I haven't seen him spending nights away from around a full moon time. Besides, we've seen some of his local kills, the butchered animals. If he hunts and kills animals this close to home, there's no reason he shouldn't hunt and kill humans here too, but Dervish isn't a killer. If I thought there was even a slim chance that he was, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be telling the police. You'd turn in your own father, I sneer. I'd have to if he was killing, Billy says softly. Murderers can't be allowed to roam freely. We're getting near to the sheds. A large sheet of corrugated iron lies on the ground between the sheds and the mansion. We head for it simply because there's nowhere better to go. This used to be a small orchard. There are several smooth tree stumps close by. Billy sits in one and I sit on another. I tap the corrugated iron with my foot, considering the evidence. So you think Dervish is a werewolf with a conscience. He kills animals, but not people. Is that so hard to believe? Billy asks. You accept demons are real, why not werewolves? I accept demons because I've seen them, I answer stiffly. And I'm sure they're demons 24 hours a day, corrupt and evil all the time. If you ask me to believe that people can turn into savage beasts, physically transform into wolf-like creatures, maybe I could. But I don't believe an ordinary human can change into a hairy, yellow-eyed, fanged werewolf overnight, then assume his ordinary shape the next day. I never said he transformed, Billy notes swiftly. I think it's more a mental condition than a physical one. What about those creatures in the book? Maybe it works different ways in different people, he suggests. Some get it bad and change completely. Others, like Dervish, are able to control it. Decrees of werewolfism, I chortle. <laughs> this gets crazy every time you open your mouth. Okay, Billy huffs, getting up, shoulders slumping. Have it your own way. I thought I was doing you a favor, but if you're going to mock me, I'll just... How do you reckon you were doing me a favor? I interrupt. I don't live here, Billy says, turning to depart. Come the next full moon, I'll be tucked up in bed in the veil, safe with Gran and Grandad. You'll be out here by yourself, alone in the house, with Dervish. Hours later, trying to laugh it off. Craziness. Utter lunacy. I shouldn't even be considering it. 
and yet. In a world beset by demons, why shouldn't werewolves exist too? And I can't think why Dervish should be searching the forest for dead animals and burning them secretly. And some of the faces in the book definitely match those in the Hall of Portraits. Then again, I've only Billy's word that the book is about werewolves. Dervish has a weird sense of humor. He might have been kidding Billy about the book. Maybe even stuck in the photos and drawings himself. That makes more sense than Billy's werewolf theories. Much more logical. And yet... Dervish arrives back just before sunset. Agreed to Messi enters. Going to a special? Just for a drive, he replies, slicking down his gray hair at the side of his head. Where's Mira? I ask. Off touring the countryside. She's basing herself here for the next week or so, but she'll be popping in and out a lot. Where's Billy? Uh, he went home. Oh? Dervish pauses on his way to the bathroom. I thought he was going to watch TV. Uh, he had other things to do. I lie. Dervis continues onto the bathroom. My eyes follow him automatically, studying his face, the set of his jaw, the crown of his head, searching for abnormalities. Night, heavy clouds, only brief glimpses of the three quarters full moon. Watching TV with Dervish, a documentary about some Indian woman that he knows all about using people's natural body energies to cure diseases. Yawn! A game of chess afterwards. Dervish appears distracted. Or am I mentioning it? Plays loosely, less aggressive than usual. He beats me, but I take a couple of his major pieces and make him work hard for his victory. Dervish stretches, groans, checks his watch. I'm exhausted. I'm gonna tuck in early. You staying up late? You staying up late tonight? I keep my head down. No, I'm pretty tired too. I'll follow you up soon. Slightly watching him trot up the stairs. Not the pace of a sleepy man heading for bed. Lining up the chess pieces on the board. Idly playing against myself. Quiet. The house creaking around me, the wind blowing lightly outside. I abandoned the game halfway through, go up to my room, pause at the door. This is stupid. If I leave it like this, I'll be imagining danger everywhere I look. I've got to share this house, my life, with Dervish. I can't let something this ridiculous come between us. Retreating. Carry up up, I carry on up the staircase to the top floor, Dervish's room. I stand outside a moment, getting my story straight, deciding to tell him everything Billy said. I grin as I picture his incredulous response. Then I rap twice with my knuckles and enter. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I've got to... I grind to a halt. The room is empty. I've explored the entire house, his study, the bathrooms and toilets, the other bedrooms, downstairs, even the cellar in case he's scouring the racks admiring his wine collection. He isn't here. Sitting up in bed, listening to the wind, thinking about dead animals and old werewolf films, afraid to sleep. My eyes snap open, early morning. Must have dozed off despite my fear. I roll out of bed. Grey day, sky obscured by clouds. I pad downstairs to the kitchen. Sent a fried bacon and sausages. I push the door open slowly. Dervish inside, at the frying pan, humming. It takes him a moment to spot me. He smiles. <laughs> You're up early. I didn't sleep very well. Hungry? Dervish asks. Want some bacon? Eggs? Uh, I'll just do toast for myself. 
I stick two slices of bread in, pause over the toaster, my back to him. I called up to see you last night, I say innocently. Couldn't find you. Where were we? The shortest of pauses. Then uh, I went to a pub in the Vale. Met Mira there. She went on somewhere else afterwards. Sorry I didn't tell you. That's okay. I reach for the butter. Did you take the bike? If it says, if he says he did, I know he'll. I'll know he's lying. I would have heard it. No, he says. I walked. I don't hold with drinking when driving. I turn from the toaster, smiling. Dervish is concentrating on his bacon. I can't believe I spent so much time worrying last night. I open my mouth to tell him about yesterday's scene with Billy, then close it. Dervish is reaching for an egg with his right hand. My eyes are attracted to his nails. Not long, but jacket, dirty, red stains under the tips. It could be paint or rust or something he ate in the pub the night before. Or it could be blood, staring, staring, staring. The toaster pops behind me. I almost scream. Dragging clothes out of the washing machine. If Dervish walks in on me, I'll say I left money in one of my pockets. Underpants, socks, shirts, trousers. Finally, a blue denim shirt with small eagle insignia on the left breast pocket. The shirt Dervish was wearing last night. I run my nose over it. Unpleasant and sweaty, but not smoky, not beery. Not like it would smell if he'd spent a few hours in a pub. Sitting by the phone, I want to call Billy, tell him about Dervish disappearing, the blood, the scentless shirt. Except, he might have gone to the pub like he said. Maybe he changed shirts before he went out after I last saw him. The stains under his nail could have been anything. If Billy hadn't filled my head with rubbish, I'd have thought of nothing of Dervish slipping out without telling me. It's not the first time he's done it. He gives me plenty of space and freedom and expects the same in return. Nothing suspicious about that. But what does he do when he's out by himself? Where does he go? Did he really meet me around the Vale? If so, why didn't she come back here with him? And if he changed shirts before he went out, why isn't the one he wore to the pub in the machine with the rest of this dirty laundry? Kashri Vale, outside the Lion and Lamb. There are several pubs in the Vale. I want to go into all of them to check if Dervish was in town last night. My story? Dervish lost his watch and sent me to ask if it had been found. He can't remember which pub he'd been in, so I'm doing the rounds of them all. Holding me back, somebody might mention my queries to Dervish. In the end, I turn away from the Lion and Lamb and make for home. Not reckless or scared enough to check on Dervish's alibi. Not yet. Night. Alone in the house. Mira called in this afternoon. I wanted to ask if she'd enjoyed the pub last night, but Dervish was there and I didn't want to be so obvious. They left a few hours ago. Dervish told me they were going into the Vale and not to wait up for them. Asked if I'd like to bring them back anything. I said some crisps would be nice. A truly crazy thought. What if Dervish and Mira are both werewolves? I cast that thought. I cast that from my thoughts even before it's fully formed. In one of the spare bedrooms, close to the lower end of the house where the brick extension is, a clear view of the road from here. The room across the hall has an equally good view of the rear yard and sheds. I've left the window open, so if there are any noises, I should hear them. Blew to the front window, hoping to see Dervish and Mira staggering back from the village, singing drunkenly. Planning cutting comments for Billy. 
Wondering if this is all a big gag designed to scare me. I'll be mad as hell if it is, but relieved at the same time. After midnight, eyelids drooping. A clanging noise out back jolts me out of my half days. I bolt through to the I bolt through to the back of the room. I bolt through to the back room, edge up to the open window, peer out. The clouds aren't as thick as they were earlier. An almost full moon lights most of the yard, though drifting clouds create random stretched shadows. Devish and Mira are by the sheet of the corrugated iron where the tree stumps are. They're sliding it over to one side. Behind them, on the ground, half hidden by shadows, something large wriggles. I strain my sights on it. Moments later, the clouds drift on and moonlight falls directly on the creature. A deer. Its four hooves bound together with rope. Its snout muzzled. Dervish and Mira finish with the sheet of corrugated iron. I spot two large wooden doors set in concrete in the middle of the ring of tree stumps. A thick chain and lock. Dervish bends to it, takes a key from his pocket, fiddles with the lock, throws the chain to one side and holds the door open. Steps leading down beneath the ground. Dervish picks up the deer and drapes it over his shoulders. It struggles. He ignores it and starts down the steps. Mira follows, pausing to swing the door shut behind her. Clouds scud across the face of the moon. I stare at the doors in the ground. Silent. White-faced. Petrified. Waiting for Dervish and Mira to come out, chewing my fingernails, going back to my earlier crazy thought. What if they're both werewolves? I tried to cheer myself up by remembering his oath when I moved in. You'll be safe here. Wondering if that still holds true. Minutes pass. Ten. Fifteen. Half an hour. Thinking. They didn't look different when they took the deer down. No extra hair. No sharp canines. Wearing their normal clothes. They weren't howling at the moon. Dervish was able to insert the key into the lock so his hands couldn't be twisted into animal-like claws. Not the appearance of action. Not the appearance or actions of werewolves. 45 minutes. 50 coming up to an hour when they reappear. But not through the doors in the ground. Instead, from the kitchen. They walk out of the house, over to the wooden doors. Dervish takes the length of the chain, runs it through the two large handles, then locks it. Both of them carefully slide the sheet of corrugated iron over the back, back over the doors, hiding them. They drag their feet over the marks in the dirt. They drag, the, they drag their feet over the marks in the dirt left by the corrugated iron, masking the tracks. Wipe their hands clean. Dervish spares the surrounding area one final glance. Then they return to the house. As soon as they enter, I close the window and race for my room. I don't want them to find me here. Under the covers, Fully dressed, shaking, footsteps on the stairs. I shut my eyes and feign sleep, expecting Dervish to look in on me. But the footsteps continue up to the top floor, his study. I wait several minutes. When there are no further sounds, I slip out of bed, undress and put on my pajamas, then sneak back to the rear bedroom. I can pretend I'm sleepwalking if they discover me now. Studying the sheet of corrugated iron, picking at the puzzle. Dervish and Mira went down the steps in the rear yard, but came up through the house. There must be a secret passage somewhere inside the mansion. Quick calculating. Flash upon the obvious answer. The cellar. 
the wine just a ruse. Dervish doesn't want to keep me away from the cellar to protect his prized vintages, but to safeguard whatever lies beneath. Bed, impossible to sleep. Knees drawn up to my chest, trembling, clutching a silver axe which I took from one of the walls, praying I don't have to use it. Shortly after dawn, eyes drooping, fingers loose on the axe handle. The door bursts open. Mira barges in. I try to scream, but my throat constricts and all I manage is a thin squeak. Mira's holding a bag. She japs her hand into it. My imagine fills the bag with all sorts of horrors. I struggle to bring the axe up, but it catches in the sheets. Mira pulls a cluster of objects out of the bag and lobs them at me. I cringe away from her, wishing I could sink through the wall behind me. Some of the objects strike me dead in the face. I gasp, desperately swap them away. When I blink with surprise at was as I realized what she's throwing. Crisps! <laughs> Chapter 9. The Cellar. Dervish and Mira are still laughing in the morning. <laughs> Your face... <laughs> Dervis chortles at breakfast. Like every morning in hell was, like every demon in hell was coming for you. As I've noted before, my uncle has a twisted sense of humor. I say nothing while Dervish and Mira enjoy their little joke, only keep my head down and focus on my food. Dervish doesn't understand why I was so scared. He doesn't know that I saw him with the deer, that I suspect is a werewolf, that I'm wondering if I can buy silver bullets on eBay. I doubt he'd be laughing if he did. The house to myself. Dervish's early morning runs usually last 45 minutes to an hour, enough time for a quick scouting mission. I hurry down to the stairs to the wine cellar, pause with my hand on the door. In horror movies, monsters always lurk in the basement, but this isn't a movie. I mustn't succumb to fictional fears. Not when I have very real fears to contend with. Creeping down the steps, leave the door open, checking my watch. Seven minutes since Dervish left. I'll allow myself half an hour, not a second more. Pause at the bottom of the steps, dark and cool. I shovel forward and an overhead light winks on. Studying the rows of wine racks, I turn full circle. My heart beats erratically. My legs feel like they belong to an elephant. Heavy. The axe in my left hand looks tiny and ineffective in the glaring light of the cellar. I stalk the nearest aisle, studying the floor. Stone slabs, different shapes, tightly cemented together. I pause occasionally, crouch and rap a slab with the base of my axe, listening for echoes. None. Solid. Left at the end, exploring a second aisle, then a third, a fourth. No strange looking slabs, no echoes anywhere I rap. The joining cement between the slabs unbroken, no trace of a hidden door. Back where I started, 20 of the 30 minutes have elapsed, sweating like a pig who can smell burning charcoal. I'm beginning to think I could be wrong about the cellar. Perhaps the hidden entrance is in one of the ground floor rooms, but I won't give up yet. I scout the rim of the room, concentrating on the walls, running my fingers over the rough, dry stone, searching for cracks. A wine rack, ceiling high, maybe three meters long, covers one, covers one section of the wall. My hope rise. This could be blocking a secret passage. But when I lift out a couple of bottles, all I see behind is more stone wall. I remove a few more bottles from various places, but nothing out of the ordinary is revealed. Two minutes left. This is a waste. I'll focus on the rooms above. Perhaps the passageway is hidden behind one of Dervish's many bookcases. I'll start in the main hall and work my way. 
the thought dies unfinished. As I'm rising to leave, I spot a dark smudge on the floor. Stooping closer, I move my head out of the way of the light and squint for a better view. It's a semi-circular stain, pale, easily missed, unmistakably a footprint. Although there aren't many footprints in the cellar, Dervish keeps it really clean. This isn't the first I've discovered. What sets this one apart from the others is that it faces away from the wine rack and the mark of the heel is hidden beneath the bottles. Gotcha. Watching TV, nervous, waiting for Dervish to leave. There was no time to examine the wine rack. Once I'd noted the print, I came straight up and carefully closed the door behind me. Dervish returned a few minutes later, but I was safe in my room by then and had splashed and had splashed my face with cold water to take away the bright red flush I'd worked up in the cellar. Dervish has spent most of the day since then in his study, as he often does, reading, making phone calls, surfing the net. Time's dragged for me. I have only one burning desire, to get back down to the cellar. Not being able to is driving me crazy. I've been keeping a close watch on the front door. Don't want Dervis slipping out unnoticed. I even leave the toilet door open when I'm in there, so I'll hear him if he comes down the stairs. So far, no joy. But I'm patient. He has to leave eventually. He can't stay cooped up here forever. Night falls. Dervish still hasn't ventured outside. Over a late dinner, I ask casually if he has any plans for the night. Thought we might hit the pub again, he says, grinning sheepishly. Are you meeting Mira? Maybe, maybe not. With the unfathomable Mira flame, who knows? What's this sudden great attraction about drinking in the Vale? I asked. A new Bridzy barmaid, he laughs. What's her name? A pause. Then quickly. Lucy. Getting anywhere with her? Uh, she's slowly warming to my chance, he chuckles. I'll give it another few nights. If she hasn't bitten by then, I'll cut my losses. Maybe take you and Billy out to see a film. He makes it sound very casual, but I know what he's really doing. Giving himself an excuse to stay out after dark most for the next few nights until the full moon has come and passed. Dervish leaves at 21.48 precisely. He sticks his head in my room as, he, as he's going and laughingly tells me not to wait up. I smile weakly in reply and say nothing about the fact that he hasn't changed his clothes slipped on a pair of nice shoes, combed his hair or sprayed under his arms with deodorant, all the things he would have been done, all the things he would have done if he'd truly been going out on the pole. My uncle has a lot to learn about the art of espionage. At the cellar door, hesitant. I'd rather do this by daylight, going down this late at night, not knowing how long Dervish will be away or when to expect him back is far from ideal. I consider waiting until morning when he goes for his daily jog, and I have a guaranteed three quarters of an hour to play with. But I've had almost no sleep these past two nights. I'm exhausted. I might snore through my alarm in the morning and wake late, the opportunity missed. I don't dare wait. Deep breath. Tight grip on my axe. Descent. The wall on either side of the rack is solid. But when I remove one of the bottles, reach in and rap on the bricks behind, there's a dull echo. Grunting, I grab hold of the edge of the rack and pull. It doesn't budge. I exert more pressure. Same result. Try the other side. No go. Stepping back, analyzing the problem. Look closer at the wooden rack. There's a thin divide down the middle. I grab sections of the rack on either side of the divide and try prying them apart. They give slightly, a few millimeters, then hold firm. 
Brute force isn't the answer. I'm convinced the divide is the key. I just have to figure out how to use it. Studying the rack, my fingers creep to the top of one of the bottles. I idly twirl it left and right while my brain's ticking it over. I'm taking a step to the left to, the, to check the size of the rack again when I stop and gaze down at my fingers. I half pull the bottle out, then push it back in. Smiling, I grab, twist, and pull the bottle above, then the one beside it. All are loose, but I'm sure if I go through every bottle on the rack, I'll find one that isn't. Methodical, start from the bottom left, even though I suspect the device will be situated higher towards the middle. Checking each bottle in turn, twisting it, tucking it out, placing it back in its original position. I'm leaving fingerprints all over the place. Should have worn gloves, but I'll worry about that later. All the way across to the right, up a row. Then all the way across to the left, up and across, up and across, up and getting higher, minutes ticking away. I quicken my pace, anxious to make progress. Pull too hard on one bottle, comes flying out and drops to the floor. I collapse after it and catch it just before it hits and smash it into a hundred pieces. Place it back on the rack with shaking fingers. Work at a steady, cautious pace after that. Past the midway mark, four rows from the top, on the right, my hopes fading, trying to think of some other way to part the racks, half tempted to take my axe to the wood and chop through. I know that's crazy, but I'm so wound up that I just might. Seventh bottle from the right. It twists, I twist, but it doesn't move. Everything stops, my breath catches. Step up close to the bottle and examine it. No different to any of the others, except it's jammed tight into place. I give it a harder shake to make sure it isn't simply stuck. No movement at all. I try pulling the bottle out. It doesn't give. Studying it again, frowning. My eyes focus on the cork. I grin. I put the tip of my finger I put the tip of my right index finger to the face of the cork, push gently. The cork sinks into the bottle, a loud click. The two halves of the wine rack slide apart, revealing a dark corridor angling gently downwards. I do a quick mental geographical check. It leads in the direction of the sheds. I act before fear has a chance to deter me. Step forward. Cross the threshold, advance. I've taken no more than eight or nine steps when the wine rack closes behind me with a soft slishing sound. I'm plunged into total darkness. My heart leaps. My hands strike out to touch the walls on either side, just so I have the feel of something real split seconds away from complete panic when lights flicker on overhead weak dull lights but enough to illuminate the tight cramped corridor my heart settles my eyes devour the light i smile feebly to myself turn and retrace my steps examining the back of the wine rack thinking about how i'm going to get out later a button in the wall to my left I press it. The lights flick off and the rack slides open. I step through to the wine cellar, wait for the rack to close, then open it again and return to the corridor. This time, I keep on walking when the rack closes. I'm pl and I'm plunged into temporary darkness. Moments later, when the lights flicker on, I glance up at them wryly and spare them the carefree half-wave. Grubs Grady. Mr. Cool. The corridor runs straight, 
and evens out after 20 meters or so. Narrow, but high. Moss grows along the walls and ceiling. The floor is lined with a thin layer of gravel. By the moss, I reckon this tunnel must be decades old, if not centuries. The tunnel ends at a thick, dark wooden door with a large gold ring for a handle. I press my ears at the door, but I can hear nothing through it. If Dervish is in the room beyond, it'll be impossible to surprise him. I'll just have to cross my fingers and hope for the best. I take hold of the huge gold ring, tug firmly. The door creaks open. I enter. A large room, at least the size of the wine cellar. Sturdy wooden beams support the ceiling. Burning torches set in the walls. No electrical lights. A foul stench. I leave the door open as I step into the room and study my surroundings. A steel cage dominates the room, set close to the wall on my right. Almost the height of the ceiling. Thin bars set close together, bolted to the floor on all four corners. Inside the cage, the deer, still bound and struggling weakly, lying in a pool of its own waste, which explains the smell. Advancing, giving the cage a wide berth. There are three small tables in, the sub in this subterranean room, legs carved to resemble human forms, surfaces overflowing with books. A chest set half hangs off one of them, pens, writing pads, candles waiting to be lit, ropes and chains in the one corner, no weapons. I thought there'd be axes and swords like inside the house, but there isn't even a stick, a chest. Treasure! I snap it open in a rush, treasure lost momentarily getting the better of my other senses. Is this Lord Sheftree's legendary hoard? Bitter disappointment. The chest's filled with old books and rolled up parchment. I scrape the paper aside and explore the bottom of the chest in search of even a single gold nugget or coin, but come up empty handed. Circling the room. Get close to the cage this time. Note a bowl set in the floor. For water, I assume. A door with two locks. Neither, neither currently bolted. No hatch for pushing food through. I consider dragging out the deer and setting it free, but that will reveal my having been here. I don't want Dervish to... I, want, I don't want Dervish knowing I'm wise, I'm wise to this setup. Not sure what he'd do to me if he found out. Examining the tables. On two of them, the books are layered with dust. The candles have never been used, and the chairs are shoved in tight. On the other, there are less books. A few are open. The two large candles on the table are both half burnt down, and the chair's been pulled out. I focus on the third table. Walk around it twice, without touching it. Wary of magic spells and what might happen if I disturb anything. I wish Billy was here. I should have phoned him and cooked up some story to get him to stay the night, but I didn't want to drag him into this until I was sure, which I'm still not. So far, I've seen nothing to suggest that Dervish is a werewolf or that he uses his cell for anything more sinister than holding captured deer. I have to take a chance with the spells. I pull the chair back a bit more, then sit and cautiously lay my hands on top of the table. Nothing happens. The light's poor here. There are matches on the table, but I daren't light a candle. Dervish might smell it when he returns, or notice that it's burnt down more than when he left. I study one of the open books, but I can't make sense of the words. If it's in English, it's protected by reading spells like the books in Dervish's study. I flick forward a few pages, keeping a finger on the page it was originally open to. No pictures, though there are a few mathematical or magical diagrams. I turn the pages back and pick up one of the other books. A wolf's bared jaws flash at me. I gasp, raise my hands to protect myself, almost topple out of my chair. Then laugh hysterically as I realize it's just the cover of a book under the one I picked up. I need to get a grip. Freaking out over a picture, seriously uncool.
Laying the upper book aside, I open the one with the picture of a wolf on it. The words in this are also indecipherable, but there are many pictures and drawings. Most of creatures, are, most of creatures which are half human, half wolf. I study the photos and illustrations in troubled silence. The paintings are wilder, men with perfectly normal upper halves, but the lower body of a wolf. Women with ordinary bodies and twisted woven heads. Babies covered in hair with ripped, lip, with ripped lips and jagged fangs. But the photos are more disturbing, even though they're less grisly than the paintings. Most simply depict malformed humans with lots of hair, distorted faces and sharp teeth and slit eyes. The reason they're so unsettling, they're real. The paintings can be the work of an artist's vivid imagination, but the photos are genuine. Of course, I'm aware that it's a simple matter in this day and age to forge photographs and warp reality, but I don't think these are the result of some lab developer's sixth sense of humor. This book has the look and feel of an ancient tome, though some of the snaps are in color. The colors are dull and splotchy, like in very old photos. I don't think the people who put this together had the technical know-how to produce digitally enhanced images. The creatures in the books don't look familiar, though I study their faces at length. If there are Grady's or Garadex's in there, I don't recognize them. Close in the book, I pick up another lying to the right. This one's modern. Glossy photos, mostly of dead human wolf-like beasts, showing them cut open, their insides scooped out. I can't read it, but I know what it is. It's an autopsy manual. Somebody's undertaken a study of these wolven humans and published their findings. I grin shakily as I imagine what would happen if I went into a library and asked if they had any books on werewolf autopsies. As I lay the autopsy book aside, my eyes fall on a thin volume. Loose sheets held together by a wrinkled brown leather folder. Opening it, I find myself staring into the red eyes of the demon master, Lord Loss. My fingers freeze. My throat pinches shut. It's not the picture Dervis showed me when he came to visit in the Institute. This one's more detailed. It shows only the demon's head. With terrified fascination, I study the folds of lumpy red skin, its bald crown, small mouth, sharp gray teeth. Its eyes are especially strange. As I noted before, it seems to have only a dark red iris and pupil. Trembling, I start to turn the drawing over to check on the other papers in the folder. Then stop dead at a terrible whisper. Hello, Groobage. The demon's voice. I release the paper and stare at the painted face, which impossibly, nightmarishly, stares back. Release me, the demon on the page whispers, its thin lips moving ever so slightly its eyes narrowing fractionally. I hunger for your pain. The painting grins. I scream, slam the folder shut, and raise, sopping for safety, imagining the demon master breathing down my neck every frantic step of the way. Excuse me for a while, I gotta go get some more water.
<clears throat> Chapter 10, The Longest Day. My bed curled into a ball on top of it, weeping, shaking, fingers over my eyes, peeping through them at fitful intervals, waiting for the demon master and his cohorts to come. Hours later, footsteps on the stairs, my heart almost stops, panting, eyes wide, remembering the carnage, mum, dad, Gret, praying it's quick. I don't want to suffer. Maybe I should take the blade of the axe to my throat before the demons. Whistling. Dervish. I moan with relief. The footsteps stop, then start towards my room. I scurry underneath the covers and draw them up around my chin. Dervish opens the door and sticks his head in. You okay, Grubs? He asks. Yes. I answer weakly. Just had a bad dream. I can sit with you if you want. No, I'm, I'm fine, really. See you in the morning, then. Night. He only half closes the door when he leaves. I want to rush to it and slam it all the way shut, but I don't dare step off the bed, afraid vein or artery might be lying beneath, waiting to snap at my ankles and drag me off into their world. Dawn takes an age to come, but eventually the sun rises and burns my fears away with its cleansing rays. As the sun clears the horizon and chases the shadows of the night westward, I crawl out of bed, over to the window, and throw it open. The morning air is chilly, but welcome. I gulp it down like water, my head clearing, my shakes subsiding. Did the painting really talk to me? Or did I just imagine it? I honestly don't know. I think it was real, but I was extra tense, overreacting to everything. It could have been a hallucination. What was definitely real, the werewolf photos. I didn't imagine them. They're what I must focus on. The Lord Lost Mystery can wait. I went down to the cellar to find evidence of a werewolf and I believe I found it. Time to call in the experts. Paging Billy Spleen. I phone while Dervish sleeps. Ma Spleen answers, even grumpier than usual. It's 7.23, she snaps. He's still asleep and so was I. Please. I say calmly. This is important. I want to catch him before he goes to school. If you tell me, I can give him a message, she snips. No, I insist. I have to speak to him in person. She grumbles some more, but eventually goes to wake the snoozing master spleen. This it better be life or death, Billy yawns down the line a minute later. You've got to come over, I tell him directly. Pretend you're going to school, then come here. What? He grunts. Have you lost your mind? I can't fart in these parts without Gran knowing. Skipping school is out. There's a full moon tonight, I hiss. I don't want to be trapped here alone with Dervish. A cautious pause. What's happened? Billy asks. Come over. Find out. I put the phone down before he can ask any further questions, confident that his curiosity will entice him. Stop thinking about what I'm going to tell Dervish to explain Billy's being here. He arrives at 9.17, school bag slung across his back, left eye squinting suspiciously, black hair slick with sweat. He must have run. Couldn't have come any earlier or Gran would have been suspicious, he says, entering by the huge front doors which I hold open for him like a butler. He looks around like a detective. Where's Dervish? In his study. I told him you were coming to work on a school project with me. And he believed that, Billy snorts. He'd no reason not to. 
He doesn't know we know about him. Billy looks at me smugly. So you think I'm telling the truth now? I lead him through to the kitchen before answering. Yes. Coolio, what changed your mind? I sit down. So does Billy. I've seen his lair, I mutter, and proceed to tell him everything about the deer, my exploration of the wine cellar, and the sub-cellar beyond, only leaving out the section relating to Lord Laws. That's personal. 10.15. Billy arguing that Dervish doesn't pose a threat. Don't you see? He groans with exasperation. The cage is for him. He knows changes upon him. That's why he caught the deer and stuck it in there. Tonight he'll lock himself in, and when he changes, he'll feed upon the deer and stay caged there until the morning. And how will he get out? I ask. Mira. That must be why she's here. She knows about his sickness and probably comes every month to, ch to help him. Think back, I urge him. You say you've been watching Dervish every time there's been a full moon. Has Mira been here? Or anybody else? Billy shifts uncomfortably. Well, no, not every time. But so how does he get out? I interrupt. Billy thinks a moment. He must hang the keys nearby, he says. He lets himself out when the change is passed. Then what's to stop him using it when he transforms? Billy rolls his eyes. Have you ever heard of a wolf that can use a key? He used it the other night when he brought the deer back. But he hadn't transformed then, Billy notes. He said he looked the same as always. He stands and paces around the kitchen as he outlines his thoughts. This is the way it must work. During the lead up to the full moon, and for a few nights after, dervish hormones are all over the place. I don't think he physically changes, but he's in full control of himself, which is why he wanders about the forest, hunting animals. At the same time, he's human enough not to attack people. He doesn't kill. On the night of the full moon, it's different. The beast comes to the fore. He takes over. He can't risk it losing it on the world. It would kill at random, animals, humans, whatever it found. So he chains himself up. Billy clicks his fingers with excitement. He locks himself in the cage, ensuring there's a live animal for the beast to rip to pieces and feed on. He stays there all night, howling, transformed wild. In the morning, when the, par when the, phase, pa when the phase passes, he lets himself out and carries on as normal. Billy stops and smiles warmly. <laughs> I've always admired Dervish, but never as much as I do right now. He's dealing with his curse, living as normal life as he can, yet protecting the world from the monster within him, locking himself away when he must, enduring the loneliness and hardship. Stop, I remark sarcastically. You'll make me cry. Billy whirls on me angrily. What did you call me for? He barks. If it was just a sneer, I can leave as quickly as I came. It wasn't a sneer, I mumble. I asked you here to help. I stare miserably at him. I'm scared. If he changes tonight and comes after me. He won't, Billy says confidently. The cage is there to prevent that. Maybe, I nod. But I'm not sure I want to run the risk. I was thinking... Maybe I could come stay with you for a night or two? Billy blinks. I've never had a friend over to stay, he says. I don't think Gran and Grandad would like it, especially not after you woke them up this morning. His face brightens. Tell you what, I have a better idea. I'll come and stay here. What will that achieve? I frown. <laughs> I'm fatter than you, he laughs, patting his stomach. If the werewolf gets free, it'll go for me first since I'm so tasty looking. That'll give you a chance to run for freedom. <laughs> You're crazy, I huff. Course I am, he smiles. After all, I am a Grady. A long, tense day. Billy's, despite his good humoured assertions that, have, that we have nothing to be afraid of, is just as nervous as me. In some ways, he's worse. He looks very pale and has been sick a couple of times. He says it's some bug he's had for the last few days, 
but I'm sure it's nerves. Maybe you should go home, I suggest, as he returns from his last vomit trip to the toilet. You won't be much use throwing up all the time. <laughs> Don't be too sure, he smiles thinly. Perhaps I can repel the werewolf with puke. <laughs> That's one I've never seen in the movies, I laugh. Billy has to leave in the afternoon to check in with Ma and Pa Spleen and pretend he's been to school. I'll have a quick meal, do some homework, then tell Gran I'm coming here for the night. I'll say it's part of a nature project, and I'm doing an essay on the habits of nocturnal creatures. <laughs> Not so far from the truth, a grimace. In my room, alone, a knock on the door. It's Dervish. Where's Billy? Uh, he had to go home. Uh, that's a shame. I was going to cook pancakes. I have a sudden craving for them. I start to tell Dervish that Billy is returning later to stay the night. Before I can, he says, I have to head out later. Oh? I'm meeting Mira. We're going to see some old friends. I could be gone all night. You'll be okay by yourself? I nod wordlessly. I'll give you a shout before I go, he promises. On the phone to Mars Blaine, asking for Billy. He just got home from school, she says frostily. He's eating. It's important. Everything seems to be important today, she grumbles, but calls him to the phone. When you return, enter by the back door and try not to let Dervish see you, I tell him. Why? he asks. He just told me he's going out for the night. He thinks I'm going to be here by myself. So? Let's quit with the scene it all done it all act, I snap. If Dervish is what we think, there could be trouble tonight. Real trouble. If he doesn't know you're in the house, he won't expect to find you if he gets free later. That might work in our favor in case of an attack. There won't be an attack, Billy insists. Maybe. But come in by the back anyway, okay? A moment's pause. Then, in a subdued tone, Billy mutters, Okay. Billy sneaks in without Dervish spotting him. Hides in my room. We kept the door shut and our voice is low when we speak, which isn't often. I keep a firm hold on the axe I've been lugging about for the past few nights. Billy still doesn't believe we're in any danger, but he has a short sword lying on the bed close by, which I fetch for him downstairs. He's in a terrible state, white and shivering. He's been sick three times in the space of the last couple of hours. I see now that it isn't nerves. He really is ill. You should be home in bed, I whisper, as he wraps blankets around him and gulps down a glass of warm milk. I feel like death, he groans, eyes watering. Do you want to leave? He shakes his head firmly. Not until morning. I'm going to see this through with you, to prove that Dervish isn't a killer. But what if... He stops me with a quick cutting motion. He's coming, he hisses, and tumbles off the bed, dragging his blankets and empty glass with him, lying flat on the floor, holding his breath. I sit up in bed and open a comic which I pretend to read. Moments later, Dervish knocks and enters. Going for dinner? No thanks, not very hungry tonight. He sniffs the air, nose cringling. <laughs> Smells of sick in here. <laughs> yeah, I laugh sleeplessly. I uh, threw up earlier, I think it was something I ate. <sighs> you should have told me. He walks over and lays the back of his hand against my forehead. If he bends forward just a few centimeters more, he'll spot the prone Billy spleen. Mm. No fever, Devish says, stepping back. Of course not. Like I said, something I ate. And I hope that's all it is. He looks troubled, checks his watch, then glances out the window. If you get sick again later, I won't be here to drive you to the doctor. Maybe I should take you into the veil for the night. That's okay, 
I said quickly. I'm fine. You sure? Crossed my heart and smiled blithely. Never felt better. Hmm. He doesn't look happy, but takes me at my word. Want me to drop you up anything from the... I'm going to drop you up anything from the kitchen. No, thanks. I'll answer down later and grab something light. See you tomorrow, then. Tomorrow, I smile and hold smile in place until he exits. <sighs> I gasp when the coast is clear. You can get up now. Billy rises from behind the bed like a ghost, grinning sickly. Then his face blanches, clutches his stomach, and rushes for the toilet. I raise my ass to the heavens and sigh. Of all the nights he could have picked to be sick, why this one? Night, the moon rising, a roar from the corridor. I'm off, bye, I shout in reply. A quick shared glance with Billy. Then we both rushed to the room behind this one with a view of the rear yard and press up against the circle of stained glass, watching to see what Dervish does. Then he heads straight down the cellar, Billy says confidently. I hope so, I sigh. Moments later, Dervish emerges and walks to the sheet of corrugated iron close to the sheds. He carefully removes it, unlocks the chains, and casts them aside. Billy's smiling knowingly, but the smile fades when Dervish drags the sheet of corrugated iron back over the doors, turns, and heads off in the direction of the forest. What do we do now? I ask quietly. He might just be going to... Billy starts, but hasn't the heart to finish. Two choices, I growl. We let him go or we follow. You want to go into the forest after him? Billy asks uncertainly. If he transforms out there and the beast spots us, at least we know what to expect and we're prepared, I grunt, hefting my axe. Nobody else knows what he is. If we let him go and he kills. Billy rolls his eyes, but says sullenly, We'll follow. Hurrying from the room. In the hall downstairs, Billy stops to grab a sword, longer and sharper than the one I gave him earlier. While he's at it, he plucks a couple of knives, sticks one in his belt, hands the other to me. Double security, he says. I like your thinking, I grin shakily. Then we're gone. Frightened. Courageous. Crazy. Tracking a werewolf. Chapter 11. Arrrr! Slipping away from the house, creeping around the sheds, entering the forest. Moving cautiously, Billy leading the way. A bright night. Very few clouds to block out the worryingly full moon, but dark under cover of the trees. Countless spots where a creature could lie in ambush. Which way did he go? I whisper as Billy pauses and stops. That way, Billy replies a few seconds later, pointing left. How do you know? Footprints, he says, tapping the ground. Who made you a higher bloody watha? I scrunch up my eyes, but can't see any prints. Are you sure? I ask wondering if he's deliberately leading me astray. Positive, Billy says, then stands and stares at me, troubled. If he sticks to this course, he's heading for the veil. I stare back silently. Then we both turn without a word and resume the chase, faster, with more urgency. Running, ducking low hanging branches, leaping bushes, Billy comes to a sudden halt. I run to him, stifle a cry. I see him, Billy says softly. He's stopped. 
I peer ahead into the darkness. Can't see anything. Where? Over there, Billy points and crouches. I squat beside him. We're on the edge of the forest. Kashri Vale's only a minute's jog from here. You think he's going to attack someone in the village? I ask. Billy tilts his head uncertainly. I can't believe it, but I don't see any other reason why he would come here. Maybe... He spins away abruptly, covering his mouth with his hands, lurches through the bushes. Twigs snap, leaves rustle. He collapses to the floor and throws up over a pile of twigs. My gaze snaps from Billy to the trees ahead, clutching the handle of my axe so tightly it hurts. Waiting for Dervish to hear the commotion and investigate. Half a minute passes. A minute. No movement ahead. Billy shuffles up beside me. Rests in the shadow of a thick bush. Breathing heavily. Chin specked with vomit. Uh, I can't go on. He groans. His voice cracks as he speaks. His whole body is trembling. How bad are you, really? I ask, searching him in the sh searching for him in the shadows, only able to make out the dark outline of his face. Lousy, he chuckles dryly. Should have listened to you earlier. Gone home to bed. I need a doctor. Your house isn't far from here, I know. I could take you there. What about Dervish? Is he still where you said he was? I ask. Billy parts the bush above him. Half kneels and stares ahead. Silence for a few seconds. Then, still there. I'll take you home, I decide. Then circle back. But you can't track him like I can, Billy demurs. You need me. I'll get by, I override him. The way you are now, you're a liability. It's only pure luck that he didn't hear you a few minutes ago. You're useless like this. Grubs Grady, Billy giggles hoarsely, tells it like it is. Come on, I mutter, offering him a hand up. The quicker we go, the sooner I can pick him up again. Billy hesitates, then grabs my sleeve and staggers to his feet. Sorry about this, he mumbles, bends over, hiding his face, ashamed. Don't be stupid, I smile, wrapping an arm around him. Couldn't have tracked him this far without you. Now let's go. Billy's house lies almost straight ahead, but Dervish is blocking the direct route, so we skirt around him and stumble further through the forest until we find a spot downhill where hopefully he won't be able to see us. Walk or run? I ask. Billy doesn't answer immediately. His breath is ragged and he's trembling. Then he sighs and says, Walk. More noise if we run. Holding Billy tight. I think he'd collapse if I let go. I start ahead into the moonlight clearing. Stomach like a coiled spring as we leave the cover of the forest. I face forward, not wanting to trip over anything but my eyes keep sneaking left, scouring the trees for signs of my uncle. Can you see him? I hiss out of the side of my mouth. Billy only groans in reply and doesn't look around. Getting close to the houses on the outskirts of Carshery Vale. Dark backyards. Lights in kitchen and bedroom windows. A woman cycles towards us, parallel to the forest. She waves. I start to wave back. Then she turns right, and I realize she was only signaling. Coming up to the houses, there's a road behind them, where, all, where most of the residents park. We make the road and close in on the Spleen residence. I start to think about what Ma Spleen is going to say, and what will happen when she phones Dervish to complain about the condition he let her grandson walk home in. Perhaps I should take Billy directly to a doctor. It's late, but I'm sure. Billy gasps painfully and collapses. He dry wretches and pours at the pavement whining like a wounded animal. What's wrong? I cry, dropping beside him. I reach to examine his face, 
but he brushes my hands away and snarls. Billy, what is it? Do you want me to... Grubs, step away. A harsh voice straight ahead of me. Slowly, trembling, I stand and stare. Dervish. My uncle's standing between us and the rear garden of in the rear garden gate of Billy's home. No way past. He's illuminated by the moonlight. A long hypodermic syringe in his hand. Eyes ablaze with anger. Mira, he says, gaze flickering to a spot behind me. I glance back. A moment's pause. Then Mira steps out from behind a van. My head spins. I remember an earlier mad thought. What if they're both werewolves? Dervish starts walking towards me. Stop! I moan, warning him off with my axe. Step away, Grobs, he says again, not slowing. You don't know what's happening. Then, Tamira. Be careful. Block his escape, but don't get too close. I know where you are, I sob. Tears of fear spring into my eyes. If you come any closer... Don't interfere, Dervish snaps. I don't want to hurt you, but if you don't step aside, I'll... He comes within range. I swing at him with my axe. Tears impair my arm. I swing high. Dervish curses and ducks. I take another blind swing. He shimmies closer as I'm swinging, dodges the blade, chops at my axe arm with his free hand. My arm goes numb from the elbow down. The axe drops to the ground. I dart after it. Dervish grabs the back of my collar and yanks me aside. I crash into a car. He's upon me before I have time to recover. Wraps his left arm around my throat. Exerts pressure. Dervish! Mira gasps. It's okay, he pants. Then, to me, as I struggle for my life. Easy. We're on the same side. Let go! I wheeze. I know what you are. Let go! Low growling, animalistic, wolfen, but not from Dervish, from ahead of us. Dervish releases me. I stand rooted to the spot, eyes wide, staring at the beast as it rises from its feet and snarls. A contorted face, yellow eyes, sharp cheekbones, dark shadows, open mouth full of bare teeth. It raises a hand, dark skin, long nails, fingers curled into claws. And I realize, about a million years too late, that a monster has breached the barriers of Kashri Vale tonight. But it's not Dervish. The werewolf is Bill E. Spleen. Chapter 12, Family Ties. Billy? I moan. He glares at me, naked hate filling his abnormal yellow eyes. Billy, it's me, Grubbs. He doesn't recognize you, Dervish says, stepping into the left. Billy's eyes snap to the adult and he crouches defensively. Behind him, Mira takes an automatic step backwards. No! Dervish barks. Don't move! You'll attract! Too late. Billy's head swivels. He spots Mira. Leaps. Mira gets, out of the Mira gets out the start of a scream. Then the beast is upon her, hissing as he hauls her to the ground. They land hard, Mira underneath. She tries to throw the animal off. He grabs her hand and bites hard into the flesh. She starts to curse, but is caught short by the creature's fist. It crushes into the side of her face. Mira chokes, stunned. The beast grabs both sides of her head and smashes her skull down hard on the pavement. The fight goes out of her, teeth glinting in the moonlight, fastening around Mira's throat. The monster's about to rip her head off, and all I can do is stand here and gulp like an idiot. But Dervish isn't so helpless. He moves as fast as Billy and gets there a split second before he bites. 
Grabbing Billy's ear, he tugs hard. The creature's head jerks clear of Mira's throat. He whines and lashes out. Dervish ducks the blow, shoves the animal down hard, head first. Pins it with his right knee, dicking it hard into the boy beast's back. Brings up his right hand and jabs the tips of the syringe into the side of Billy's neck. Pushes on the plunger. The liquid in the barrel disappears into Billy's veins. Billy stiffens and groans. Dervish whips the syringe out and tosses it aside. Billy thrashes wildly. Dervish uses both hands and knees to hold him down. Mad seconds pass. Billy stiffens again. More thrashing. Stiffens for the third time. Then collapses. Eyes closing. Limbs limp. Dervish lays Billy's head down, then shoots to Mira's side. Mira? He mutters, checking her pulse, putting his ear to her lips, rolling her eyelids up. No response. He straightens her legs and arms, checks on Billy, looks around to see if anybody notices the scuffle. But the road is deserted, except for us. He turns to face me. You... Bloody fool, he snarls. I stare blankly at my uncle, then slide to the ground and give myself over to bewildered tears. Dervish lets me cry myself dry, then hands me a handkerchief and says gruffly, clean yourself up, then help me with Billy and Mira. I wipe my face with a handkerchief, stand, still sniffling. You thought I was a werewolf? Dervish asks. Yes, I answer hollowly. You ass, he says, and manages a ghost of a smile. There's nothing more dangerous than someone half close to a terrible truth. What would you have done if I was? Taken an axe to me? Chopped me up into little bits? Buried me in the forest and told the police I'd gone out walking and never returned? I don't know, I moan. We didn't think that far ahead. We thought you'd lock yourself up in the cage in the cellar. When you started for the veil, we... You know about the cellar? He interrupts. You've been there? Yes, not Billy, just me. I saw the cage, the deer, the books. Dervish snorts, disgusted. <sighs> I knew you'd sniff it out eventually, but not this quick. I underestimated you, Sherlock Grady. He bends, ties Billy's legs together, then his hands. He slips a gag between the unconscious boy's jaws, then picks Billy up and drapes him over their shoulders, much as he carried the captured deer. What are you going to do with him? A whimper, flashing on images of Dervish cutting Billy's throat or caging him up for life. Dervish grunts. We'll discuss that later. First, we have to get him home. He'll be safe once we lock him up in the cage. There's water, and he can feed on the deer. We're exposed here. But, I begin. Save it, Dervish snaps. We need to move, now. I don't want to be the one trying to explain to Marspeline that our grandson's a werewolf. I smile fleetingly, then put the questions on hold. Dervish carries Billy to the van, which Mira had been hiding behind. He pulls the rear door open and bundles Billy inside then returns for Mira. I'm too terrified and ashamed to ask if she's alive or dead. Instead, I pick up my axe, Billy's dropped sword and the syringe. My right arm tingles fiercely where Dervish hit me, but I can use my hand now and put them in the back of the van beside the bodies. Dervish closes the door on, on the beast and the woman. Then we climb up in front and drive back to the mansion.
For a full minute, I say nothing, as if this is an ordinary drive home on a normal night. Dervish concentrate on the road, driving slowly for once in his life. His hands are shaking on the steering wheel. I watch him change gears. Then, unable to hold the questions back any longer, I spit it out. You knew Billy was a werewolf. Obviously. How long have you known? A few months. Since he started wandering from the forest in the days around the time of a full moon, killing animals. His head turns briefly. You know about that? Yes. That's what put us on to you. Billy saw you collecting the bodies and getting rid of them in the incinerator. Dervish winces. By disposing of the kills, making sure nobody else found them, I'd hoped to avoid suspicion and protect him. Guess I was a little too smart for my own good. Looking back over the seat's headrest, I can see Billy and Mira. Mira's chest is rising and falling. She's alive. I study Billy's face. No hair, no fangs, but his skin's a, dark, a darker shade than usual. His fingernails have sprouted, and his cheekbones have definitely changed shape, albeit slightly. And his eyes, if they were open, would be that eerie yellow color. And his mouth, there's teeth. Why didn't you tell me? I asked softly. That your best friend's a werewolf, Dervish snorts. I'd have believed you if you showed me proof. I was ready to believe it about you. I could have believed it about Billy, too. Perhaps, Dervish sighs. But I hope to spare you, the way I spared Billy. I didn't know until tonight how damaging the change would be. Sometimes the madness touches us, but passes. I was praying that he was merely moonsick that the disease was weak in him and wouldn't take hold. Dervish drives in silence for a while, gathering his thoughts. I don't say anything, waiting for him to choose how to explain. How much of this have you guessed? How much of this have you guessed? He asks eventually. Tell me what you think you know. The Grady's are cursed, I answer directly. Some of us turn into werewolves. It's been happening for centuries. Pretty good, Dervish commends me. Only it goes a lot back further. Only it goes back a lot further than centuries. And it's not just Grady's. It's the entire family line. What else? A shrug. Not much. We thought you had the disease, but that you could control it or at least lock yourself up when the moon was full. Nobody can control lycanthropy, Dervish says quietly. When the disease takes hold, as it has in Billy tonight, you're doomed. The change takes a couple of months, but once the wolf fall comes to the fore, the human never resurfaces. You mean, Billy's gone? He's... I can't continue. A terrible weight settles upon me. Not quite, Dervish says, and the weight lifts as suddenly as it fell into place. We can save him? I ask, excited. We can reverse the change? There is a way, Dervish nods. But we'll talk more about that later, and whether or not we wish to chance it. What do you mean? I snap. Of course we... Your sister had the disease. Dervish interrupts softly. I stare at him, horrified. To save Billy, we'll have to deal with Lord Loss, as your parents did. And if we do, we run the very real risk of winding up dead like them. And Billy along with us. What does he have to do with this? I croak. Later, Dervis says. One mystery at a time. We're nearly home. Let's get Billy locked away safely and sound. Then I'll tell you all about him. <sighs> we 
pull up around the back of the mansion, close to the tree stumps. Dervish turns off the engine and asks me to remove the sheet of corrugated iron and open the doors leading down to the secret cellar. He bundles... He bundles the pair of unconscious bodies out of the back of the van while I'm doing that. Did you gain access this way or through the wine cellar? He asks when I'm pulling the doors open. The wine cellar, I pant. The doors are, he the doors are heavy. Clever monkey, he chuckles. You'll have to tell me about it some other time. We have more pressing matters to deal with first. <sighs> he picks Billy up and nods me forward. Down the steps, steep, dark. Have to tread carefully, feeling for each stair. Do you, do you need any help with Billy? I ask over my shoulder. No, Dervish replies, coming down, blocking out the light of the moon. I'll be fine. Dart ahead and light some extra candles. I proceed to the bottom of the stairs where I find a door. Pushing it open, I enter the cellar. Studying the entrance I've just come through, I note that the material on this side of the door is disguised to look like part of the wall, which is why I didn't spot it during my previous visit. As I'm lighting candles on the main table, Keeping as far clear of the Lord Lost folder as I can, Dervish stumbles in, goes to the cage, opens it with his left foot, and sets Billy down beside the deer. He makes sure Billy's comfortable, then locks the door and removes the key. Don't go anywhere near the cage when he wakes, Dervish says. He'll howl like the devil, throw himself wildly at the bars, possibly injuring himself in the process, but steer clear regardless. All he needs is a sliver of a chance to rip you open. I'll bear that in mind, I comment dryly. Dervish goes back up the steps and returns a minute later with Mira. He lays her down, smooths her hair back, stares at her bruised, motionless features. How is she? I ask, dreading the answer. Okay, I think, Dervish says, and my fear lessens. But she'll be out for a while. He cracked her head hard on the pavement. We should get her to a doctor, have her checked over, but there isn't time. I'll take her to the house, out of harm's way, before... before we see to Billy. We'll just have to hope for the best after that. Dervish stands walks around behind the desk and collapses into his chair, sighing deeply. He tells me to pull up one of the other chairs, but I prefer to stand, too nervy to sit. I want to know about werewolves, I tell him bluntly. I want to know what Lord Loss has to do with them, how you know Gret had it, and how we reverse it with Billy. Dervish nods. Reasonable questions, but I'm surprised you haven't asked the most obvious one. Since this is a family disease, passed on from one generation to the next, how come Billy has it? I know all about Billy's connection to her family, I huff. Dervish stares at me, slack-jawed. Care to tell me how? Billy figured it out years ago. Like he said... It didn't take a genius to guess that you were his father. Now tell me about what? Dervish yelps, jerking forward. He thinks I'm his dad? Of course, I frown. Aren't you? Dervish sits back, groans and shuts his eyes. Ugh, I'm a horse's ass, he snarls. <sighs> Should have seen that coming. How can I have gone all these years? He clears his throat and levels his gaze on me. <clears throat> Pull up a chair, he commands. It sounds like a bad movie cliche, but you're going to want to sit down for this. 
I start to come back with a sarcastic reply. Spot the steel in his eyes. Drag over a chair and sit opposite Dervish, like a student before a teacher. There's probably some diplomatic, sensitive, compassionate way to put this, Dervish says. But one doesn't spring readily to mind, and I don't have time to go searching, so I'll put it plainly. No matter how upsetting it might be. I'm not Billy's father. I'm his uncle. I stare at Dervish uncertainly. I don't understand. People aren't perfect, Grubbs, he mutters. Even the best of us make mistakes. Life's complicated. We all... He clears his throat. <clears throat> Your mother never liked me and made no secret of the fact. What's that got to do with... I start but he silences me with a gesture. I visited Cal a few times over the years. She accepted that, but except for a single trip there years ago, he, she refused to step foot in Kashri Vale. So Cal used to come by himself. It was a serious bone of, con of contention between them. I tried many times to talk to Sharon about it, but she wouldn't. Dervish trails off into brooding silence, then begins again. <sighs> your father loved your mother and you and Gret, but he wasn't a saint. He traveled a lot on business alone, but he didn't always sleep alone. I leap to my feet, furious at what Dervish is suggesting. But before I can lay into him, he continues quickly. They were one night stands or short affairs, meaningless. Sharon never found out or so Cal would tell me. My brother had many admirable qualities, but fidelity was not one of them. He never wished to hurt your mother but he couldn't remain true to her. It wasn't in his nature. Why are you telling me this? I hiss, fingers clenched into fists, tears in my eyes. Dervish looks at me sideways, as though I'm a fool for asking. Because one year, he had an affair with a veiler while he was staying with me, and the woman wound up pregnant. She didn't tell him about it until after the baby was born and then refused all offers of his to get involved. Emily Spreen was headstrong, determined to live life her own way. She told Cal she wasn't. Stop, I gasp, stumbling back into my chair. Don't, I beg. <sighs> I took a vow early in life to never have children, Dervish says, ignoring my plea. I was afraid the disease would take hold in them. I was determined not to put them and myself through that torment. Cal didn't share their view. He thought life was worth the risk. I looked after Billy when Emily died because he was my nephew, not because he was my son. Cal was Billy's father, Grubbs. Billy isn't your cousin, he's your brother. Chapter 13, The Curse. A long silence, wanting to roar at Dervish, call him a liar, make him, take back, make him take the words back. But there's no reason for him to lie about something like this. Nothing but sad honesty in his eyes. Feeling sick, instantly mad at dad for what he did, but just as instantly glad. I'm not alone. I thought I lost everything when the demons attacked. 
Now I discover I have a brother. <sighs> this is crazy, I moan, torn between rage and delight. I don't know what to make of it. I can't handle it. Of course you can, Dervish snaps. You handled the death of your parents and Gret. This is a small fry in comparison. But I always thought... I shake my head, not sure what I'm thinking or what I feel. Why didn't you tell Billy? You should have, especially after his mum died. He could have come to live with us. Dad could... Cal could do nothing, Dervish barks. Not without revealing the truth and tearing his family apart. He runs a hand through this. He runs a hand through his short gray hair. But he tried to do it anyway. He came here to claim Billy when Emily died, despite the havoc it would cause. Why didn't he? Ma and Pa Spleen threatened legal action. He would have fought them in court, except he knew he'd lose. He'd simply point out to the judge that Emily hadn't told the boy who his father was, or allowed Cal access to him while, he was, while she was alive. He hadn't a hope. Couldn't you have cast a spell on them? Made them give Billy to him? <laughs> I'm not that powerful, Dervis chuckles humorously. I persuaded them to let me into Billy's life when Emily died, but that was as far as my influence ran. I think it over some more. Remembering Dad, how much he loved Mum, how happy they seemed together. I never suspected him of anything like this. I don't think Mum did either. I know it's a shock, Dervish says quietly. But can I ask you to put it to one side for the moment? You've got the rest of your life to chew it over. Billy doesn't have the same luxury. If we don't act soon. I let out a long, shuddering breath. Glance at the unconscious boy. My brother in the cage. His dark skin and twisted hands. Recall the photos of the creatures in Dervish's lycanthropy books. Warped and inhuman. <sighs> okay. We'll discuss Dad later. I lean forward intently. Tell me about the werewolves. I'll keep this as short as possible, Dervish says. Reaching under the table, he produces two cans of Coke from a drawer, hands one to me, and gulps thirstily at his. I sip mine while he speaks. The curse is ancient. We call it the Garadex curse, since the Garadexes were the first in our family to write about it. If other families have it, we don't know about them. Occasionally, we'll hear of a stranger who's changed, but when we research their family tree, we always find links to ourselves. Scientists who've studied the lycanthropic gene say it's a freak. They haven't found it anywhere else in nature. They don't know where it came from or why it functions the way it does. He finishes his coke, fishes out another, and continues. We've kept the secret to ourselves. We're a large family, wealthy and powerful. Those of us unaffected by the disease protect the secret. That's why you and Billy aren't under observation in some scientific institute. Why would I be under observation? I inquire. I'm not a werewolf. A pause at a horrible thought strikes. Am I? Dervish doesn't look at me. I don't know, he answers softly. The gene surfaces at random. Sometimes it strikes every member of a family branch, wiping them out. Other times it lies dormant for two or three generations. You're one of three children. Gret and Billy both succumb to the disease. I wish I could say that makes you more or less likely to turn, but there's no way of guessing. The change strikes, if it strikes, anywhere between the ages of 10 and 18. There have been a handful of cases involving younger children, but nobody past their teens has ever turned. 
That's why there are so many young faces in the Hall of Portraits, I exclaim. Those kids all turned into werewolves. Dervish nods glumly. There's no known cure. Those who catch it are doomed to live as deranged animals for the rest of their days. They normally don't last long, 20 years at most, if allowed to live. What do you mean? Dervish taps the side of his can with his fingernails, a distant expression in his eyes. <sighs> it's a terrible curse, he says softly. To see one you love changed into an animal, to chain them up and endure their pain. Many choose not to put themselves through the anguish. A lot of parents... He stops tapping and his expression hardens. They put them out of their misery. I gulp dreadfully. They kill them. He nods. They're beasts, he says quickly before I can express my horror. If they get loose, they kill. There are people in the family, a group called the Lambs, who handle the details if the parents can't. Family executioners, to be blunt. But you said there was a way to reverse it, I remind him, trying not to dwell on all those faces from the whole of portraits, the gruesome ends they must have endured. I'm coming to that, Dervish sighs. Though, be warned, when I tell you, you may wish that I hadn't. A long pause, then a groan from the cage, Billy stirring. When will he wake? I ask, eyeing him nervously. Soon, Dervish says. Let's go to my study. It won't be pretty when he starts bellowing. No, I mutter, gripping the edge of the table. I want to be here for him. Dervish nods, understandingly, then returns to his story. Our scientists haven't been able to crack the wolf and gene and find a cure. But science isn't the only way to fight a disease. Magic works too. Dervis reaches across the desk, roots through the books stacked to his left, and finds a thick tome. Opening it, he passes it to me, and I find myself gazing into the eyes of the family, gen of the family magician, Bartholomew Garadex. Old Bart devoted a large chunk of his life to trying to rid the family of the curse, he says. He believed, he, ha he believed it had its origins in magic. For decades, he cast spells, experimented, and sought a cure in arcane volumes, but nothing worked. He could change a normal human's shape, but could do nothing with a transformed werewolf. He was powerless, like everybody else. And then he met a creature who wasn't. Dervish's face darkens. Taking the book from me, he closes it, then reaches for the folder where I found the drawing of Lord Loss. Stop! I gasp. He looks at me questioningly. I found that when I was here before, I tell him, eyeing the folder fearfully. The drawing of Lord Loss spoke to me. Its lips and eyes moved. If I'd known you were so close to the truth, Dervish murmurs, I would have warned you about that. He cocks a thumb at the door leading to the wine cellar. As I told you, the house is safe. The land around is safe too, but I leave this cellar unprotected. There are times when I have to deal with entities not of this realm, and I need a base from which I can make contact. Dervish runs a couple of fingers over the leather cover, contemplating it with an expression of equal parts respect, sadness, and fear. Lord Loss can't cross the divide between his realms and ours uninvited, he says. An ordinary person could look at that picture for decades without seeing anything untoward. But you aren't ordinary. You face demons and tapped into your magic potential. When you escape through the dog flap, he was able to use your power to speak to you. He couldn't have harmed you through the book, but he might have been able to trick you into summoning him. But who, what is he? Lord Loss is a demon master, Dervish says. 
one of many supernatural beings who exist on the edges of our reality in magic realms of their own. We call them the demonata. Some meddle in the ways of humans. Most have nothing to do with us, while a few, like Lord Loss, feed upon us. My hands are trembling. I grip them tightly between my knees. Lord Loss is a sentinel of sorrow, Dervish says. He feeds him human pain and suffering. A funeral is like a three-course meal to him. A lonely, suicidal person's a tasty snack. He delights in our fear and grief, encourages it when possible, then drains it and grows strong on humanity's weakness. How does he do that? I croak. How does he feed? <laughs> I'd have to get deep. I'd have to get deep into metaphysics to explain that, Dervish snorts. Let's just say he has a psychic straw through which he can suck a person's pain. Now, old Bart knew about Lord Loss. He'd seen him feeding on grieving members of the family, but he didn't care. Bartholomew was only interested in lifting the curse, not warding off demons. But later in life, he spent time studying the demonata. They can live for thousands of years. I believe Bartholomew hoped to learn their secret. He never did, but at some point, he found out that Lord Loss had the power to reverse the lycanthropic change. You mean Lord Loss can cure Billy? I cry. If he chooses to. Well, then let's summon him, I shout, leaping from my chair. What are we waiting for? Let's call him here now and- The demonata are evil and selfish, Dervis interrupts. It's possible to strike deals with some of them but they'll do nothing out of the goodness of their hearts. As you know, some even don't have a heart. Then how? Dervish gestures for me to sit. I'm exasperated, but I obey. Bartholomew tried everything to get Lord Lost to help. He begged, he threatened, he even offered his soul. Souls are real, I blurred out. Oh, absolutely, Dervish nods fiercely and prized by demons above all other possessions. A soul can be tormented far worse than a body. If I was to lose my soul, my body would continue to function. But on autopilot, I'd be like a zombie, an empty shell, feeding, breathing, walking, but not thinking or feeling. Meanwhile, in the universe of the demonata, my soul would be put through every kind of hell imaginable, and many that aren't. If Bartholomew had been a longer man, if Bartholomew had been a younger man, he might have been able to tempt Lord Loss. Trouble is, a soul's only good, good to a demon as long as the human lives. Old Bart was close to death. Lord Loss judged it an inadequate trade-off. But Bartholomew was stubborn. He pursued Lord Loss and braved the attacks of his familiars, suffering many wounds which hastened the hour of his death. But eventually, Old Bart discovered Lord Loss's great obsession, which he guttural roars drowned Dervish out. Billy's on his feet, clutching the bars of the cage, shaking them, screaming. His face a dark mask of furious lines, teeth bared, tongue lashing wildly from side to side, his yellow eyes gleaming through the narrow slits of his eyelids. Billy! I yell, jumping to my feet, stepping towards the cage. Easy! Dervish says, grabbing my arm. Remember what I told you. He'll kill you if you get too close. I stare numbly at Billy as he screams, pulls at the bars, kicks and headbutts them, his eyes all the time on Dervish and me. Does he recognize us? I ask sickly. No, Dervish replies. Billy quits wrestling with the bars and turns away, disgusted. He stumbles over the deer, which shakes fearfully. Billy stops and grins savagely, circles the defenseless beast, sniffing, growling. Then he falls in its neck, claws, teeth, ripping, blood. My cheeks are wet. I'm crying again. Let's go, Dervish whispers. We can finish this in my study. I don't want to leave him alone, I sob. 
Werewolves don't get lonely, Dervish says. They feel only hunger and hate. He picks up Mira and nudges me towards the door leading to the wine cellar. I pause at the exit. One last horrified study of Billy Spreen, my brother. Then I follow my uncle to sanity. Chapter 14, The Challenge. Dervish lays Mira on one of the mansion's many beds. He examines her again, in more detail this time. He tries to wake her by calling her name and gently shaking her. When that fails, he goes to the bathroom, comes back with a glass of water, uses his fingers to flick drops at her face. She doesn't stir. Dervish steps away grimly. I could try to bring her around with magic, he says. But I'm not sure how serious the damage is. I could make it worse. Why don't you just leave her? I ask. She'll live, won't she? I think so. Then let her sleep. That'll be for the best, right? Dervish stares at me, troubled. Then walks out the room without seeing anything. I wrap a blanket over Mira, then close the door on her and head up to the study. After the dark of the cellar, the study seems warmer and brighter than ever. I lose myself in a large leather chair, knees drawn up to my chest, head tucked between them, weary and afraid. <clears throat> Dervish is standing by a chess set. This is his favorite set. The piece is based on characters from The Lord of the Rings. Devish pegs up a brightly painted Hobbit figurine and toys with it absently while he speaks. I don't think you've ever truly appreciated the complexities of chess, he says. So few pieces, yet so many possibilities. No two games are ever the same. You can learn the rules in an afternoon, yet spend the rest of your life trying to master them. Oh, stick chess up your ass! I shout, coming alive with fury. Billy's chained up in the cellar, twisted and insane. Mira's unconscious, maybe comatose, and all you can wobble on about... Lord Loss plays chess, Dervis interrupts quietly. The demonata are not, by nature, playful creatures, but he's an exception. I don't know where or when he acquired his hunger for the game, but by the time Bartholomew Garadix met him, he was a committed player, albeit one of limited experience. Where is this going? I grumble, though I have an idea. When you walked in on your parents, did you notice any chess boards? Breathing thinly, thinking back, the blood, web-like walls, the demons, and on the floor, Scattered chess pieces, broken boards, plus the gouged board in the study. Yes, I sigh. Dervish talks swiftly. Bartholomew played many games with Lord Loss while trying to persuade him to help lift the curse. His familiars weren't allowed to pester Bartholomew at the chess board, so it was the safest way to conduct a conversation with Lord Loss. Over time, he noticed that Lord Loss cared almost as much about chess as he did about feeding on humanity's sorrow. On a hunch, old Bart severed connections with the Demon Master and avoided him for several months. When he finally crossed the divide to the Demon Artist's universe again, Lord Loss was surly and irritable, eager to resume play. Bartholomew refused. Devils chuckles dryly. <laughs> it's dangerous riling a demon. They can be abominable angels of destruction when offended. Lord Loss could have unleashed all of his familiars upon old Bard, which would have been... He has others as well as Audrey and Vane, I snap. Oh yes, Dervish says. They're just his current favorites. He has hundreds of familiars. If he'd sick them on Bartholomew, then it torn him limb from limb, and all the magic in the world could have repelled them. 
But as old Bard had gambled, Lord Loris didn't send the demons in. As intense as his anger was, his fascination with chess proved stronger. Instead of crushing Bartholomew, he whined and complained and tried to bargain. So Bartholomew struck for gold. He told Lord Loris that he wouldn't play unless the demon master lifted the curse of the Garadexes. No bite. Chess was an obsession, but it wasn't that precious to him. So old Bart tried another approach. He proposed a series of contests in which he played for the lives of individual family members. After lengthy discussions, they agreed to a stage a number of matches. Best of five games per match. For each match that Bartholomew won, Lord Loss would cure a Garadex. But if Bartholomew, but if Bartholomew ever lost, Lord Loss would take possession of his soul. And so the contests commenced. Two or three games per week. Lord Loss set the rate. According to Bartholomew's records, Lord Loss hated losing. Like most of the demonata, he's despisingly proud. They consider themselves superior to humans, and to lose to one at anything is a great disgrace. Yet lose he did, Dervish chuckles throatily. Bartholomew gave his time over entirely to chess, playing for hours on end each day and night, with the best opponents he could find, learning and improving. He lost six games in the first three months. Then, never again. He had a 59-game winning streak, which showed no signs of ending. And then he died. Dervish shrugs. He was old, and his earlier battles with Lord Loss's familiars had drained him. It was peaceful in the end. He passed away in his sleep. What happened then? I asked, absorbed in the story. For a long time, nothing, Dervish says. Nobody in our family knew of Bartholomew's matches with Lord Loss. He never told them how he was affecting the curses. Several Garadexes were witches and wizards, but they were unable to unlock the secrets of his diaries, which had encoded with strong spells. Eventually, almost 40 years after the great magician's death, David McKay, a distant relative who had lost four of his five children to the curse, decoded the diary and discovered the demonic secret. He immediately contacted Lord Lawson in an attempt to renew the contest to reverse the change in his youngest child, who was just starting to transform. The demon master was slow to respond. Bartholomew had humiliated him. He was wary of suffering another string of defeats at the hands of a human. Also, Davy wasn't a magician. His soul was only of minor interest to Lord Loss, but Davy was resourceful. He saw a twist to spike Lord Loss's imagination, a challenge which would appeal to his warped sensibilities. Dervish lapses into a thoughtful silence. He's still playing with a hobbit chess piece. With his free hand, he pulls out a drawer and takes out a photo. Slides it across the desk. I look. Mum, Dad, Gret, and me. A snap taken on one of Dad's birthdays. David's solution was dreadful, Dervish says as I stare at the photo. But it had to be. Lord Loss wasn't interested in anything less. The rules he proposed were one match, best of five games, like before. If Davy won, his son would have his humanity restored and both would be free. But if Lord Loss won, he would kill both Davy and the child. Lord Loss was keen on Davy's idea, but he added a few kinks of his own. When playing Bartholomew, he told his familiars to stand at bay. He refused to grant Davy that privilege. Somebody would have to partner Davy and fight the demons while he played. As long as Davy's protector lived, the familiar wouldn't attack Davy, but if his partner was killed, they'd be free to slaughter Davy and his son too. Another new rule was that the games had to be played simultaneously, in a single sitting, to heap the pressure on Davy and his partner. In his final clause, if Davy won, 
he'd have to enter Lord Loss's realm and fight him personally for possession of his soul. What? I mutter, not catching the meaning of the last part. The games take place between the demon artist's universe and ours, Dervish explains. You probably noticed in your parents' room that there were bits of our world as well as bits of Lord Loss's. In that in-between state, that's where Davy would challenge Lord Loss. If Davy won, his son would be cured and the boy and Davy's partner could get on with their lives. But Davy would have to enter Lord Loss's world and fight the demon master in his home turf. If he beat him, he'd walk free. But if he lost, Lord Loss would take control of his soul, and he'd live out his remaining days as a zombie. Sounds like a raw deal to me, I grunt. It was, Dervish agrees. But those were the terms. Davy had to agree. Dervish pauses, then says softly, Davy lost. His brother stood as his partner. The demons overwhelmed him. Davy was killed before even one of the games was decided. His son, too. All three were ripped to pieces by the demons. He takes the photo from me and gazes at it in heavy silence. But Davy's sacrifice wasn't in vain, he resumes. Lord Loss developed a taste for this new contest. He approached Davy's relatives, those with magical powers, offering them the chance to compete for their lives as Davy had. Most refused. But two, both with young children on the verge of turning, accepted the challenge. One was defeated, but the other won. His victory gave hope to others, and a series of Garadexes and Gradies have sustained the challenge over the long decades since. Some win, some lose. Most who win subsequently lose their souls in the ensuing battle in Lord Loss's realm, but a few have made the journey back. Proof that it can be done. Dervish lays the photo back in the drawer and closes it slowly. He blinks owlishly and wipes a hand across his eyes. He's fighting back tears. Your parents didn't win, he says. Gret was infected. Your father and mother challenged Lord Loss. One of them proved inadequate to the task. All three died as a result. I was meant... His voice catches and he, and he turns away, rubbing his eyelids, trembling with emotion. Your father and I had an agreement, he says bleakly. If any of his children succumbed to the disease, I was to be his partner. I thought he was wrong to have children, but I loved him and I loved the kids he fathered. I wasn't gonna stand to one side in their hour of need. Then why weren't you there? I cry, tears streaming down my cheeks. He never told me Gret was changing, he croaks. Your mother must have convinced him to let her face the demons with him. I'm sure Sharon had Gret's best interests at heart, but I was the better chess player and a much stronger fighter. Cal should have helped me to my promise. You should have called. Maybe I could have. He breaks down. His eyes close. His hands clench into fists. Then he raises his face to the ceiling and howls. From the secret cellar, I imagine and I hear it. I imagine I hear an echoing howl as the transformed Billy Spleen pauses during feeding and answers his uncle's tortured call. I stop crying before Dervish does. I don't think he cries very often, so he has a hard time regaining control. When the tears finally cease and he's wiping his face clean with a denim sleeve, I put an accusation to him as softly as I can. Are you saying it was Mum's fault? Of course not, he answers promptly. But if Dad had picked you instead of her? Dervish hesitates, choosing his words carefully. I've got to be truthful. I thought it was I was the logical choice. But logic and magic don't always mix, 
Sometimes amateurs fight, fare better than professionals. Nobody ever really knows how they'll fare until they put themselves on the spot. He pulls out a handkerchief and blows his nose. In the end, it's all relative. Your father chose, rightly or wrongly, and the outcome stands. We can't change the past, and we'd be fools if we tried. But whatever my personal feelings about his choice, Dervish adds, don't ever think I believe it was your mother's fault. It wasn't. It was our curse, not hers. She deserves nothing short of absolute love and respect for taking on that curse and laying her life on the line to try and avert it. I nod slowly, thinking it over. But if they hadn't laid their lives on the line, I whisper, if they'd called in the lambs and not gone to Lord Loss, they'd be alive, Dervis says it bluntly. That's why I said you might not like the truth. They put Gret's life before their own, and yours. If they hadn't interfered, you'd have lost a sister, but kept your parents. I stare at him uncertainly, my lower lip trembling, part of me hating mum and dad for putting me through this, another part hating Gret, blaming her for the mess. Dervish reads my thoughts and shakes his head calmly. Don't go down that road, Grubs, he says. Cal and Sharon did what they had to. They'd have done the same for you if, you if you'd been infected. I know you feel cheated. I know you want them back. But if you look deep inside and recall the people they were, the love they had for you and Gret, you'll understand why they did it. They should have told me, I moan. They cut me out completely. I, I could have helped. I... No, Dervish says firmly. The rules are clear. Only two may challenge Lord Loss and his familiars. Telling you would have achieved nothing. It would have prepared me for the worst. I disagree. I don't think they wanted to think about that. Dervish sighs. Doubts have a way of easing a person from the inside out. Most who face Lord Loss choose not to focus on all that can go wrong because it makes it more likely that something will go wrong. But I begin. Grubs, Dervish interrupts curtly. We can sit here arguing all night, but that won't bring your parents and Gret back, and it won't help Billy. Letting go isn't easy, but you have to forget about your parents for a while. If you can't, you're no good to me. No good to you? I echo, frowning. What are you talking about? What do you want me to do? Dervish leans forward, his features impassive. I want you to be my second, he says. I want you to stand by my side and battle vein and artery while I challenge Lord Loss at chess. The world goes numb. Chapter 15, The Choice. You're loco, I scream. Sheer bloody nuts! I'm many things, Dervish answers calmly. But I don't think I'm crazy. You must be! Only a crazy man would ask a kid to fight a couple of demons. Dervish studies me quietly, then gets to his feet and picks up his Lord of the Rings chest set. He heads for the door. Where are you going? I snap, lurching in front of him, blocking the way. I'm taking this down to the cellar, he says. I need to have five sets in place before I summon Lord Loss. Each game is played on a separate board. Didn't you hear me? I hiss. I won't do it. I'm not... Grubs. He silences me with a smile. It's okay. I asked. You refused. That's the end of it. It was a request, not a command. I glare at him suspiciously. It was? He nods. There are others who can help. One of my friends is a near grandmaster. 
He'll face Lord Loss. I'll handle Vane and Archery. He nods at a plain chessboard to my left. But I'd be obliged if you would help me carry the sets down. My eyes narrow. If you're trying to trick me. No tricks, he says. And I believe him. Getting out of his way, I pick up the board and follow him out of the room. Down the stairs to the main hall, taking our time, careful not to drop any pieces, thinking hard about what Dervish said. If you've got friends who can help, I mutter, why ask me? Billy's your brother, Dervish replies. I thought you might want to be part of this. But it doesn't make sense, I press. You need the best person for the job. Why offer it to me? Ideally, I want to face Lord Lost with someone who's proved their courage and ability under fire, he says. Someone who's faced the demon and lived. I only, know, I only personally know six people who've done that. Mira was one of them, but she can't do it now. What about the others? Four of them are currently out of contact. He reaches the door to the cellar and stops talking. While he opens it with his elbows. Silence as we descend. I wait until we're at the wine rack, which hides the entrance to the secret passageway before asking. And the sixth? You're the sixth, he says, stepping forward into darkness. The secret cellar. Five chess sets lie in place on the three tables, which we shove together, piling the books and other odds in the ends of the floor. Dervish is lining up the pieces, making sure they're in the right places. Billy is still chewing on the deer carcass. He spits and snarls at us every so often. Dervish hasn't said anything since our trip down with the first two boards. We've worked silently, carting in the boards in pieces, clearing the tables and rearranging them. It's only now, while I watch him adjust the pieces, that I work up the courage to broach the subject again. I still don't understand why you want me to help. Why not wait for Mira to recover? You don't have to stage the contest tonight, do you? No, Dervish says. But waiting's dangerous. Lord Loss can reverse the change, even in one who's been a werewolf for several years. But often the mind can't be restored. Every day we wait drives Billy closer to the point from which it's not worth bringing him back. Besides, he adds... How would we explain his absence to his grandparents, teachers, the police? We're in the middle of an unreal adventure, but we're still part of the real world. Try telling a cop you've got a boy locked up in a cage because he's a werewolf. See where it lands you. I didn't think of that. I manage a sick smile, which quickly fades. I'm just a kid, I say quietly. I wouldn't be any good to you. Dervish wipes a spot of dust from the head of a king. You fought demons and lived to tell the tale. You've tapped into your magic potential. You can fight them on their own terms, even if you are just a kid. He adds with a grin. I want to help, I groan. I'd do almost anything to get Billy out of the hell he's in. But I saw Artery work Gret like a puppet and... Don't beat yourself up over it, Dervish interrupts kindly. You're under no obligation. You came here to recover, not get dragged deeper into a nightmare. I shouldn't have asked. And I wouldn't have, except... He doesn't finish, so I say it for him. Except you need me. He shrugs. Like I said, there's a friend I can call, but I'd rather have you. If I told you anything else, I'd be a liar. Studying Billy as Dervish fetches weapons, his face and hands red with deer's blood, patting his stomach, smiling jaggedly, gazing at me through unnatural yellow eyes, thinking about Lord Loss, recalling the ferocious power and speed of artery and vein, 
fearing for my uncle's and brother's lives. Dervish enters with a small axe, a mace, and a sword, lays them on the floor with the others he's already, he's already installed. Part of the rules, he can use as many weapons as he pleases. Would you want me to play chess or fight? I ask, wishing I could keep my mouth shut. I've seen you play, Dervish says. No offense, but you'd have to fight. Lord Loss will crush you on the chess boards. But you'd stand a better chance against Vane and Artery than me, I counter. You're stronger and experienced. I know nothing about weapons or magic. You don't have to, Dervish says. The magic knows you. That's what matters. You tapped into your potential when you faced the demons before. You tap into it again. Instinct. But you're the logical choice, I insist. You'd be better than me. Dervish nods somberly. Probably. And your friends are better and your friends better at chess than me. So you fighting and him playing is the ideal partnership, right? Dervish looks at me curiously. You don't have to talk yourself out of this, he says. You've said you don't want to do it, and I've accepted your decision. Yeah, but I feel lousy, I cry, like I'm letting you down. You're not, Dervis says. Ability and potential mean nothing if the will to compete isn't there. But even if I but even if I had the will, you'd still be better off with the other guy, wouldn't you? I press, hoping he'll agree. Dervis shakes his head and doesn't answer. The room where Mira lies unconscious. Dervis tries again to wake her. Again, he fails. He returns to his study, rubbing the back of his neck. Sitting behind the desk, he runs his fingers over a phone book. <sighs> Time to call my friend, he says, glancing up at me. Final chance to change your mind, Grubs. I don't say a word. Dervish opens the book. Dervish opens the book and searches for a number. Pablo should be here within a few hours. You can go stay in the Vale if you want, but you don't need to. You'll be safe here. The demons won't be able to leave the cellar. I don't reply. Thinking of the battle to come. Filled with shame. If Pablo and I defeat Lord Loss and his familiars, but I lose the one-on-one -on -one fight later, Dervish continues, you'll have to take care of me. What? I mumble. My body will survive if I lose the battle after the, after the chess match, he explains, but my soul and mind won't. I will, I'll be able to move about but I won't be capable of thought or speech. I won't be able to shop, pay bills, cook, clean the house, etc. You'll have to babysit me or hire somebody to do it. Dervish taps a drawer in this desk. The necessary forms and information sheets are here. Names and numbers of lawyers and bankers, details of various credit accounts. You have my permission, written as well as verbal, to manage my estate as you see fit though a large portion will remain in the hands of your legal guardians until you come of age. I don't want your money, I sniff. You won't feel that way always, he smiles. Picks up the phone, hesitates, lays it down. One last thing. If things pan out bad, I'll appear no better than a mindless robot. You might feel sorry for me, be tempted to put me out of my misery. I wouldn't do that. I shout. I'm not a killer. I couldn't... You could. Dervish cuts me short. Most people are capable of extreme actions when pushed. He licks his lips nervously. You mustn't. Time is different in the Demonazis universe. There's no telling how long our fight could last. The few who fought him and returned have been absent for months, years, on one occasion decades. No matter how much time passes, there's always hope, he says. Don't give up on me, Grubbs. Look after my body. I might have need of it again someday. He finds the number in the book, 
picks up the phone and starts dialing. Wait. I stop him. He looks up and he, he looks up expectantly. I lick my lips nervously. What happens if you don't win and I turn into a werewolf later? Dervish's features soften. And the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. Come again? I frown. It's a biblical quote. Isaiah. It's where the lambs got their name from. He jerks his head at the desk. There's a black folder in the drawer on, down on the left. Names and, num names and numbers for the lambs. Contact them if the need arises, but only do it if you're sure that you're changing. The lambs don't mess around. Once you set them in motion, they won't stop, even if you change your mind and try to call them off. How will I know? I ask. Billy didn't know, and he was changing. Dervis chews on his lower lip in thoughtful silence, then says, Nobody turns without warning. If lycanthropy strikes, there'll be at least two or three full moons during which you won't physically alter, but run wild like Billy did. You won't be able to recall such episodes, but you'll find blood under your fingernails, animal hairs between your teeth. Dervish stiffens and speaks roughly. That's when you need to think about calling in the lambs. As I stare at him miserably, Dervish returns his attention to the phone and hits the buttons. The phone at the other end is picked up almost instantly. I hear a man say, yes? Dervish starts to reply. Tell him it's okay, I interrupt softly. Tell him you rang his number by accident. Grubs, you don't have to. I won't live with the threat of the change hanging over me, or with the guilt of not fighting for Billy. Deep breath, thinking, crazy for doing this. But also, it's what Dad would have wanted. I'll do it, a wheeze. I'll fight vein and artery. The thinnest, most fleeting of smiles. Mock bravado. Grubs Grady. Demon killer. I'm your man. Chapter 16, The Summoning. The Cellar. Billy's be Billy beating at the bars of his cage for the bloody leg he's torn from the deer, howling madly. Dervish checking the chessboard and weapons, ignoring Billy. I want him to talk me out of it, tell me it's madness, reject my offer. But he says nothing. In the study, he didn't even ask if I was sure just nodded once and told Pablo he'd call him some other time. Then it was straight back here. No thank you, or well done, Grubs, or I'm proud of you. I examined the chessboards with forced interest, desperate to keep my mind off the weapons. Five boards laid in a line across three tables. The Lord of the Rings set in the center, flanked by a board of crystal pieces on one side and Incan fashion pieces on the other. The sets are either side the sets are either end are ordinary. Did you lay the boards out that way for a reason? I asked Dervish. No, he replies, testing a sword's handle, wiping it clean. The sets don't matter as long as there are five. Explain how the contest works, I urge him. The games are played simultaneously, Dervish says without looking over. When it's my turn, I can move any piece I like on any board. Lot Loss can then reply to the piece I've moved or move a piece on a different board. That must be confusing. Yes, but it's confusing for him too. Dervish holds an axe up to the light of a thick candle and squints, judging the sharpness of its blade. Lord Loss is an accomplished player and he's had centuries to work on this game, but he has no supernatural advantage. If I keep my head, focus on, focus on the moves and don't lose my nerve, I'll stand, a fair, I'll stand a fair chance. 
What sort of chance do I stand against Artery in vain? I ask. Dervish looks at me coldly, then wipes his arm forward, then whips his arm forward and sends the axe flying straight at me. Instant reaction. I spin. My left hand flies out. My fingers close around the axe handle in midair. I arc, I arc it down, taking the speed out of it, then raise it high to defend myself, heart racing, confused and afraid. Then I see my uncle's grin. Breathing hard, I stare at Dervish, then at the axe in my hand. That sort, he says. I still don't know how I caught it, I grumble, as Dervish searches among his books for a particular volume. You don't have to know, Dervish says. It's magic. He pauses and looks up at me. Your instincts have been sharpened by your previous encounter with the demons. Obey those instincts. Let vein and artery set the tone of the pace of the battle. React. Don't think. Suspend the laws of reality completely. Dervish returns his attention to the books, finds the one he's after, flicks it open, and stands. Make your inexperience work for you, he says. You can't outplan or outthink the demons, so don't try. Just go with the flow. You make it sound easy. It certainly won't be easy, but if you switch your brain off, you'll be amazed by what your body can do. Dervish lays the book on the floor, bend, bends over it, and reads a passage, running a finger over the words, muttering softly. What are you doing? I ask. Several spells must be cast to open a window between Lord Loss's world and ours, Dervish says. I have to make sure it's a small gateway. We don't want other demons following him through. That can happen? Sure. The demonata are always eager to cross the divide and wreak havoc. They'll seize any opening which presents itself. But don't you know the spells already? I frown. I thought you summoned them before. I did, Sturvish nods, several times, but some spells are best not memorized. He finishes the paragraph and closes the book, walks to the wall to his left and lays both hands on it. I'm starting now he says, but it'll be 20 minutes, maybe half an hour before the window opens. Stay close to the tables. Relax. Don't distract me. While I lean against the table, nervously tapping and scratching the wood, Dervis mutters arcane words of the wall, drawing signs upon it with his fingers. After a few minutes, steam seeps from a rough stone. Dervis leans into the steam, inhales, turns, and breathes out. A shadowy bat flies from his mouth and flits across the cellar. I duck instinctively, even though it's nowhere near me. When I look again, the bat has vanished and Dervish has moved on to another patch of wall. Fifteen minutes into the summoning, all the walls are steaming. The air of the cellar is moist and hot, like in a sauna. Billy makes a deep choking noise and flaps at the air with blood-red hands. Dervish has been breathing out a variety of smoky creatures. Bats, snakes, dogs, insects. As I watch, he turns and exhales his largest yet, a full-sized wolf. Billy gibbers wildly at the sight, hisses at it then ducks to the rear of his cage and crouches low, whimpering, as the spirit wolf floats towards him, evaporating before it touches the bars. Any other time I'd feel pity for the poor beast Billy has become, but right now there's only room in my heart for terror. Dervish steps away from the last wall, eyes closed, face contorted, walks directly to the folder containing the Lord Lost drawings, picks it up, and clutches it to his chest. This is where things get weird, he mutters, as steam pours from the walls and transparent worms drift in and out of his mouth. 
I can't wait. A half laugh, almost hysterical. Whatever happens, don't scream, Dervis says. We're at our most vulnerable while I'm searching the various portals for the ones which connects with Lord Loss's realm. A scream could attract the interest of other demons, and that might be the end of us. We'll probably end on a grisly note anyway, I say gloomily. Perhaps, Dervish agrees, but there are worse demons than Lord Loss. My thoughts threaten to spin out of control as I try to imagine anything worse than Lord Loss. Then Dervish spreads his arms and barks a loud command, and the world dissolves around me. Walls and ceilings fading, infinite space, a scattering of stars, meteors streak across the sky. But this space isn't black, it's red, an unending sky of redness encircling the cellar like the drapes of hell. The temperature escalates off the scale. Some of Dervish's book burst into flame and incinerate instantly. The bars of Billy's cage glow from the heat. All the candles in the cellar melt to the wick. I check my clothes and hair, expecting flames, but although I can feel the terrible heat, it isn't burning me. Dervish and Billy aren't harmed either, nor are the chest sets. Why aren't we toast? I cry. The words come out as a croak. My mouth and throat are unbelievably dry. Protected, Dervish wheezes in reply, then lays a finger onto his lips and shakes his head. No more speaking. He points to a meteor screaming across the sky overhead. And as I gaze up, I realize it isn't a meteor. It's some enormous, incomprehensible, reality-defying monster. Dervish squats and places both palms on the, on the floor, which ripples beneath his touch as if made of water. Muttering some spell or prayer, he turns in a circle. His eyes are yellow when I next cut, when I next catch sight of his face, his teeth sharp and gray. I open my mouth to scream, remember his warning, shut my lips quickly. Dervish continues turning. When he faces me again, he looks normal. Standing, he picks up one of the unburnt books, flicks it open, and starts singing. Long, complicated words, his voice unnaturally clear and beautiful. The red sky shimmers, then darkness, as Dervish sings. I lose sight of the stars and meteor monsters. The room slips into a hot, fearful blackness. No candles to shed any light. The last thing I see, dervish, eyes closed, singing as though his life depended on it. I feel alone in the darkness. Though I know by dervish's singing and Billy's grunts and whines that I'm not. Whistling of sounds around me. Something long and silky brushes against my cheeks. I swipe at it, terrified. Nothing there. Dervish stops singing. The sudden silence is as disorientating as the lack of light. Dervish? I whisper, not wishing to distract him, but needing to know if he's still there. It's okay, Grobs, comes his voice. Don't move. It's dark, I note redundantly. We'll have all the light we can care for soon enough, he promises. An object brushes my left ear. I flinch. There's something in the room with us, I hiss. Yes, Dervish says. Take no notice. Stand your ground. It isn't easy, but I obey my uncle's order. The whistling sounds increase in volume, and I'm struck in various places by what feels like thick strands of rope. I wince and rub in my flesh, but otherwise don't react. Gradually, I notice a dull gray glow all around me, which grows in strength, a 
illuminating the distorted cellar. The walls have been replaced by thick strands of cobwebs, which stretch away layer after layer, apparently endless. Many of the strands are stained with blood. Some are as thick as a tree trunk, while others are as thin as a line of thread. From one end of the, from one of the strands, hence the severed heads of Mum, Dad, and Gret. I can't hold back the scream, but Dervish anticipates this. He slides behind me and clamps both hands over my mouth. I howl into the flesh of his palms, wild sopping, reaching for the heads, while at the same time trying to back away from them. They aren't real, grubs, Dervish grunts, struggling to contain me. They're illusions. Let your fear go and they'll vanish. I thrash more wildly in response. Can't think straight. The head seemed to be growing, eyes huge, filled with sadness and pain. Mum's lips move silently. Gret sticks her tongue out at me. It's alive with maggots. They're testing you, Dervish growls, fingers tightening over my lips. My neck strained almost to snapping point. If they can drive you insane, I'll have nobody to protect me from artery in vain. The names of the demons penetrate. Fighting the terror, I stare at the faces of my parents and sister and spot minor mistakes. Dad's nose bends to the wrong side. Gret's hair shouldn't be that long. Mum's eyebrows are too thick. I stop shaking, lower my hands. Dervish releases me, but stays close, ready to gag me if I start screaming again. How do I make them go away? I moan. Show you're not afraid, Dervish says. Look at them, without flinching. It's hot. I know. For me too. But you can do it, Grubs. You have to. Deep breaths. Exerting control. I lift my eyes and train them on the three heads dangling from in front of me. Their features twist. Mom and Gret hiss at me hatefully. I don't look away. Under the strength of my gaze, the heads disintegrate, melting like the candles. The web vibrates. The air bubbles. The molten, waxy flesh of the heads rises, twisting, forming itself into three new shapes. A crocodile-headed dog, a murderous baby, and their master, Lord Loss. It begins. Dervish sighs and steps forward to confront the demons. <clears throat> Chapter 17 The Battle Dervish stops at the place where the floor gives way to the webs, spreads his arms, and shouts something unintelligible. Blue flames crackle from the tips of his fingers. He brings his hands together, then touches a thick strand of web. Blue fire runs up the thread to where it connects with another. Like lightning, it streaks from strand to strand, arcing ever closer to Lord Loss and his familiars. Lord Loss shows no signs of fear. When the blue flame reaches him, it sizzles and hisses around him, but he only smiles, waves a hand, and the flame sputters out. Lord Loss stretches his arms above his head. As he does, six other arms unfold from around his body, three on either side. No fingers, just mangled lumps of flesh at the ends. The demon master grips two strands, one with either, one with either set of hands, and climbs towards us like a grotesque spider. Vane and Artery follow close behind their master, Vane yapping, Artery snapping his teeth. Studying the demons with terror, so many details I'd forgotten. The tiny mouths in Artery's palms, the fact that he doesn't have a tongue in any mouth, the writhing cockroaches on his head, the fierceness of the flames burning in his empty eye sockets. Vane's tiny, cruel eyes, her long, leathery snout, bits of flesh caught between her teeth, the sleekness of her canine coat, female hands instead of paws. 
and Lord Loss, red skin stained with blood, which oozes from hundreds and thousands of ragged cracks, his strange dark red eyes, and the hole where his heart should be filled with writhing, hissing snakes. The demons come to the end of the web and hesitate, swaying on a thin strand like evil vultures in a vine. Dervish stands beneath them, cool as a chunk of ice, hands pressed together. Hello, Dervish, Lord Loss says, his voice even sadder than I remembered. It is good to see you again, my doomed friend. Good to see you also, Dervish replies tightly. Vane snaps at him, trying to frighten him, but Dervish only sniffs with his interest. And my younger friend, poor Grubich Grady, Lord Loss sighs, subjecting me to his eerie red gaze. Oh, your sorrow is still strong. So sweet. His face wrinkles and blood seeps from cracks on both cheeks. He licks the blood from his flesh with an inhumanly long tongue, then extends a hand. Come to me, Grubich. Let me feed on your pain. Misery should be celebrated not endured. In my world, you will be an emperor of suffering. Be mine, Grubich. Turn your back on this insane challenge and accept your true destiny. I find myself sneering, and without meaning to, I draw myself up straight, glare openly at the demon lord, and snap. Stick it up, you crack, you warped son of a mutant bitch! Lord Law's face drops. Vane and Artery gibber furiously. Dervish laughs. You will pay for that insult, Lord Law snarls, eyes glowing, blood flowing. Only if we lose, Dervish chuckles. You can't touch him if we win. Oh, but Dervish, you won't win, Lord Loss says, his voice reverberating with gloominess. I wish there was hope. You remind me of Bartholomew Garadex, a most rare human. But you must face facts. This night, you die. The boy is weak, unfit for such a challenge. Don't listen to him, Dervish warns me. He's trying to make you think you're lost before you start. I know what he's up to. It won't work, I grunt. But inside, I'm not so cocky. There's such sadness in the demon's voice and eyes. Is it true? Are we destined to lose? One final chance, Grubich, Lord Loss whispers. Give yourself to me now, and you can avoid the terror and agony. Your death will not be quick, but it will be pleasurable. Your mother, at the end, wished she had accepted my offer. She begged to serve me, but it was too late. I don't believe you, I say evenly. Mom would never have begged a piece of scum like you for anything, even her life. Lord Loss's eyes narrow. A second insult, he murmurs. You shall not make a third. He faces Dervish. I tire of these vain human posturings. I came to play chess. Are you ready? Yes. Who will take to the boards with me? I will. Lord Loss lays her hands over his mouth to cover a small smile. The boy is to fight vain and artery? I am astonished. I assumed Grubich was a chess maverick who would pit his wits against mine. But to throw him into combat with my savage familiars... 
Grubs will be fine, Dervish says, but his voice doesn't ring with confidence. <sighs> so be it, Lord Lars sighs. I would rather have fought a noble contest, but if you are to play into our hands, there is nothing for it but to sweep to a swift victory and make a quick end of you. Lord Lars lowers himself off of the web and hovers just in front of Dervish, the jagged strips of flesh at the end of his legs never touching the ground. Six of his arms fold around his ribs, leaving the upper pair free. Blood drips from his body and sizzles when it hits the stones on the floor. Dervish steps aside and points to the chessboards. Lord Loss drifts towards them, lips splitting into the closest he can get to a genuinely warm smile. He circles the tables, running his fingers over some of the chess pieces. On the web, vein and artery snap and spit, scratching impatiently at the silky strands, hungry for battle and blood. I hope you prove more worthy an opponent than your brother, Dervish, Lord Loss says spitefully. He was on the back foot from the fourth move. It was quite embarrassing, the ease with which he succumbed. I think deep down he secretly wished to lose, just as Grubich does. Shut up! I yell, taking an angry step towards him, hands clenched in the fists. Easy, Grubbs, Dervish mutters. He's trying to goad you. Ignore his rubbish. Clear your mind. Focus on the fight. Wise advice, Lord Loss nods. But Grubich is unable to heed it. He is full of fire and fury, like his mother. He failures to prove, her failures prove to be your father's downfall. He might have fared better had he not been so worried about her, just as Dervish is worried about you. What will you say to your uncle when you fail him, Grubich? How will you apologize for... If this continues, Dervish interrupts softly, the game's off. Lord Loss stares at him archly. I'm not bluffing. Let it be a fair contest. Me against you, Grubs against your slaves, or there'll be no contest at all. You would sacrifice the wretched Billy Spleen so cheaply? Lord Loss smirks. If I have to, Dervish says, his, and his face is stone. Lord Loss studies my uncle in troubled silence, then shrugs and sits on the side of the chessboards behind the black pieces. Very well. We shall dispense with the pleasantries. Take your place, Dervish Grady, and face your finish. Dervish walks across to me, grips my shoulders, stares hard into my eyes. You know what you have to do, he says. Fight hard and dirty, to the death. Piece of cake, I grin weakly. Good luck. We make our own luck tonight, he says in reply. He releases me and marches to the chessboards, sits, takes a breath, then, without any formalities, reaches forward, grips a pawn on the middle board, and moves it forward. Immediately, vein and artery leap from the web and zone in on me, screeching, snarling, the stench of death thick in the air about them. No time to check on Lord Loss's response to Dervish's opening move. I toss myself wildly to the left. Vane shoots overhead, crocodile jaws snapping together on thin air, human fingers wriggling. Artery lands on my back. His left hand grabs my neck. Teeth bite into my flesh. I howl and roll over, seeking to squash the hell child. He leaps free before I complete the move, chuckling darkly. In the cage, Billy roars and shakes the bars, sensing the threat of the demons, even in its beast-like form. Vane attacks again, bounding across the floor. 
My right hand snakes out, fingers open. An axe jumps into my palm from the pile of weapons several meters away. I sit up and throw. It arcs towards Vane, bounces hard off her snout. Only a scratch, but the wound makes her pause. I rise without using my, the muscles in my legs. Look down. I'm hovering in the air. Close my mind to the impossibility of the situation. Extend both hands. An axe flies into my left, a short sword into my right. I look for the demons. They're huddled side by side, glaring at me. Come and get it, creeps, I grunt, twirling the axe like a baton. A clever maneuver, Lord Loss notes, clapping dryly. Did you teach him that one, Dervish? Never mind the commentary, Dervish growls. It's your move. My eyes dart to the boards. Incredibly, dozens of moves have been made in the few seconds since the game began. Players at an advanced stage on all five sets. Artery attacks while I'm distracted, faster than my eye can follow. He crosses the room, jumps, dr- he, cr- he crosses the room, jumps, drags down hard on my legs. I kick at him, but he scrabbles up above my knees. The teeth in his hands sink into both my thighs. I scream. Artery laughs. Vane yaps excitedly. Billy butts the bars of the cage with his head and tries to bite through them. I collapse to the floor. Artery's shaken loose by the, by the jolt. I kick him backwards. He barrels into a pile of charred books, scattering them, squealing viciously. Veins on me before I can get up. Her teeth clamp around my outstretched left leg. She bites through my shin bone, rips her head left and right, flesh and bone tear. My foot and ankle fly across the room. Blood pumps from the lower part of my leg. Agony! Vane and Artery scramble to the wound, immerse their faces in the spray of blood, gulp it down, push each other out of the way, hungry for the taste of me. Shaking, going into shock, eyes rolling, room spinning, numb to the pain, watching the demons feed, defeated, dying. Use your magic! Dervish screams. My eyes half focus. He's standing. Face ashen. Magic! He bellows again as Lord Loss grins and takes one of Dervish's queens for the bishop. Staring at the demons, their faces red with my blood, imagining their next attack, the torment spurred into action. I'm still holding the axe, summoning all my strength. I lash out with it and bury it dead in the middle of Vane's hard, elongated head. The demon falls away, choking. Her strength deserts her. She falls in a heap. I've killed her! I almost shout aloud with glee until I spot Artery climbing on top of Vane. He pulls the axe out and pushes the edge of the wounds together. Blood glows. The wound knots itself closed. Vane gets to her feet, shaken, but very much alive. My heart sinks, then leaps. Dervish's cry makes sense now. If the demons can use magic to repair their wounds, so can I. While Vane's still recovering, I point at my severed foot on the other side of the room and will it back into place. For a long second, nothing happens. Then it vanishes and reappears at the end of my leg. Flesh, bone, and sinews meld. The pain is worse than it was bitten off, but it works. Within seconds, I have my foot back, though it's sore as hell. I don't test the weight on my foot. Instead, I calmly spread my arms and imagine myself airborne. With slow grace, I rise, tucking both legs up behind me. I face the demons, then stab at them with my sword. Artery bats my sword away. Vane jumps into the air and snaps from my legs, but I'm too high. I laugh at the demons, then slash at them again. (sighs) They scatter. Vane to my left, Artery to my right. Bloodlust. Sensing victory. I chase after Artery, hack at him with the sword. Missed by bare centimeters. Hack again, closer. He races from me, wailing, tiny limbs waving in an almost comical manner. Throws himself to the floor in desperation. I have him. Hurling myself forward, I take careful aim with my sword, bring it down, screaming, and hit the strands of web at the boundary of the cellar. Sharp resistance, like hitting a steel bar. Bones crack. Sword drops, but worse. I stick. 
The strands of web are coated with a gluey substance. It clings to my arms, body and legs. I'm, I'm a fly stuck to fly paper, struggling, trapped, helpless. Artery and vein gather below me. Their faces split into evil leers. The teeth in Artery's hands gnash dreadfully. Vane's eyes appear beadier than ever. She grips, she grips the web with her human hands, crawls towards me, Artery not far behind, thrashing, tearing at the web, trying to bite through the strand nearest my face. I call upon my magical abilities, wish myself off the web. It doesn't work. Blind panic. The demon's closing in. Here comes the kill. Chapter 18. A change of plan. Vane creeps closer. Artery slithers next to his demonic sister, both growling softly. My cries die away to a terrified whimper. Watching, sickly fascinated, accepting my doom. No! Dervish roars, and he's suddenly floating above the demons, grabs each, of the, grabs each by the scruff of the neck and hurls them across the width of the cellar where they crash into the webs on the opposite side. He reaches down, grabs my arms, rips me free of the sticky strands, presses his fingers into my back where the bones broke. A warm surge of power. The bones knit together. This is unpardonable, Dervish, Lord Loss mutters from his place at the chessboards. To abandon our game while it's in progress. He tuts disapprovingly. You have broken the rules of our agreement. I am now free to summon as many of my familiars as I wish and set them loose upon you and the boys. Wait, Dervish roars, and Lord Loss rises. I'll return to the game. Too late, Lord Loss sighs. Besides, what would be the point? Grubich is out of his depth. Let us put an end to this sham. You have disappointed me, Dervish, but there will be other Grady's and other matches. Lord Loss extends five of his eight arms, picks up Dervish's kings from each board, and starts to crush them. What if Grubbs plays you? Dervish shouts. Lord Loss pauses. That was not our deal. We'll make a new deal, Dervish hisses. The game continues where I left off. Grubbs assumes my position. I pit myself against your beasts. Why should I agree to that? Lord Lars asks. I have already won. No, Dervish disagrees. We may have forfeited the game, but you haven't won. You can take our lives now, quickly, or you can prolong the agony and save our Grubbs' desperation and sorrow as he loses to you. Lord Loss's eyes light up in the mention of desperation and sorrow, but he hesitates before replying. What if he doesn't lose? He finally murmurs. I will have sacrificed the pleasures of a certain victory, for the humiliation of defeat. It's a gamble, Dervish agrees. But Grubbs is a poor player. Our chances are slim. Imagine the satisfaction you'll extract as Grubbs slowly and painfully comes to the realize he can't win. You make it sound almost irresistible. Lord Loss smiles thinly. But what does the boy think? Dervish looks questioningly at me. I shake my head uncertainly. I just want it over with, I sob. We're going to lose anyway. Why drag it out? As long as there's life, there's hope, Dervish replies quietly. And it's not just yourself you'll be playing for. It's me and Billy too. Will you throw away our lives without a fight? I stare at my uncle's cold expression than at the howling Billy in his cage. Warily, 
I nod. I'll try. I mumble. If Lord Lars agrees to it, so will I. Dervish head, Dervish's head whips around and he glares at Lord Lars. Well, he barks. Can you match this child's courage? Will you flee with the easy victory? Lord Loss rolls the kings around in his stubby layers of flesh at the ends of his arms, considering the proposal. Then, with a smile, he replaces them on the boards. Come, he says, gesturing to the seat which Dervish vacated. Gliding to the floor, Dervish sets me down. Pain flares in my left foot. I ignore it. I hobble forward, gaze at the five boards, the ranks of white and black pieces, then into the demon master's cunning eyes, breathing raggedly, clearing my thoughts, trying to remember every lesson mum and dad ever taught me. I sit. Instant peacefulness, an unnatural silence. I stare around the cellar, startled. Everything seems to have stopped. Dervish stands motionless, facing the demons while Billy is frozen at the bars of his cage. Then I realize they are moving, only incredibly slowly. What happened? I gasp. I have separated our time frame from theirs, Lord Loss says. It allows us to play without distractions. I watch as Dervish's right hand slowly comes up. Fingers unfurling, red flames streaking from the tips. Slower than snails, vein and artery break to the sides, out of the path of the firebolts. Come. Lord Lars says, tapping the middle board. The fight is no longer your concern. Focus on the match. With an effort, I tear my eyes away from Dervish and the demons and stare at the pieces lined up in front of me. Assessing the damage, I immediately note that the game on the far right board is beyond saving. That's where Lord Lars took Dervish's queen with a bishop. The game on the center board also looks like it's a lost cause, with white down both knights and a bishop. Oh, depressing, isn't it? Lord Lost sighs, looking more miserable than I feel. Dervish was not at his best tonight. His fear for you affected his game. I warned him about that, but he would not listen. Lord Lars picks up the queen he took from the far right board and toys with it. It's your move, Grubich, he says. But take your time. There is no rush. Study the pieces. Plan a campaign. Search for openings. I reach towards a rook on the board to my immediate left. Pause. Withdraw my hand without touching the piece. Can I move any piece on any board? I ask. Of course. I run an eye over the five boards again, then pick up a pawn on the board to my far right and move it forward a space. The battle's already lost on that board, so I might as well start there and treat it as a warm-up. Hopefully, work my worst moves out of my system. Ah, Lord Lars nods. A cautious approach. Very wise, young Grubich. He moves a knight forward and checks my king. It will make no difference to the end result, but at least you may lose with some dignity. Perhaps that will provide you with a glimmer of comfort when you and your unfortunate companions roast tonight in the fires of my own personal hell. It takes Lord Loss nine moves to checkmate me on the far right. When he wins, my king melts into a foul-smelling white puddle. 
Lord Loz picks up the board, snaps it into pieces, and tosses it aside. And then there were four. Sweating, fidgeting, trying to concentrate on the boards, eyes constantly flicking to Dervish and the demons locked in slow motion combat. I'm trying to keep play confined to the board on my left, taking the contest one game at a time. But Lord Loss won't oblige. He makes a few moves on he makes a few moves on that board, then switches to another, then another. Though I have free run of the boards, I can't make more than one move on any board until Lord Loss has replied to it. So if I make a move on the middle board and Lord Loss then moves a piece of the board to my far left, I can't make a move on this board on the I can't make a second move on the board in the middle. I have to wait for Lord Loss to move one of the pieces on it. He's tied by the same rules as me, of course, but it feels like the odds are stacked in his favor, as if I'm the only one restricted. I've played chess like this before, but not often, and not recently. Dad tried me on multi-boards when I was younger, so, it was, so I wasn't able to maintain my focus, so I worked up on improving my individual game. Perhaps he could have tested me again when I was older, if he'd lived. It's impossible not to think about my parents and Gret. Did Dad sweat this much when he faced the Demon Lord? Was Gret half frozen in time, like Billy is, un- like Billy is now, unaware of what was occurring, but somehow sensing doom? Did Mum lose limbs to the familiars during the fight? I move a wizard-shaped rook across the middle board. The game here seems lost, but I'm taking it slowly, hoping a route to victory will present itself. Oh dear, Lord Loss says, and my stomach sinks. He takes one of my pawns with a bishop, exposing my queen. I'll have to move her now, but that's going to leave my king vulnerable. Any half-hopes I entertain of winning in this board vanish. So sad. Lord Loss whispers, red eyes glowing dully. To lose nobly is horrible, but to carelessly throw the game away. Stuff it, I half sob, knowing he's right, hating myself for surrendering so cheaply. You can concede defeat now if you wish, he says. I have no heart, but if I had, there would be room in it for mercy. I will let you. I said stuff it! I roar, cutting him off. I brutally push my queen to safety, then turn my thoughts away from the board in the middle and focus on the three on which I still stand a slim chance of winning. Lord Lost doesn't finish me off in the centre board, but chooses instead to flirt with me on the others, toying with me threatening my major pieces, letting me escape, then slowly moving back in for the kill. I'm playing through tears, fingers shaking, breath rasping in my throat. It's not losing that I despise, but doing so in such a humiliating fashion. I ignored Lord Loss when he spoke of losing with dignity, but now I understand what he meant. To crumble at the moment of truth, to allow your opponent to psych you out, to defeat yourself by playing dreadfully, That's a million times more sickening than coming, competing, and being beaten fairly. I could chase you forever, Grubich, Lord Loss murmurs, once again sliding a queen backwards on the board to my left, when he could have pressed on with her and ensnared my king. Perhaps I will, he smiles with evil pleasure. Time can barely touch us here. I could make this game last an eternity. I respond by moving a pawn sideways on the far left of the board. A blind move, born of exhaustion and resignation. I'm afraid that's an illegal move, Lord Loss says, putting the pawn back in its original spot. But I'll overlook it this time. Try again. Why don't you just finish it? I scream, picking the pawn up and throwing it straight at the demon's face. The pawn sticks in the flesh of Lord Loss's left cheek. He leaves it there a moment, while blood pools around it, 
then pries it free and places it back on the board. You should be grateful that I procrastinate, he chuckles, pressing a finger to the fresh cut on his cheek, then licking it clean with then licking it clean of blood with his long grey tongue. This is your final ever game as one of the living. It's only fitting that it should last a lifetime. Hitting brick walls. Every time I advance, Lord Loss drives me back. Every time I go after one of his pieces, he smoothly evades capture. Every time I fall back and group my pieces around my kings, inviting him on in the hopes that he'll get arrogant and make a mistake, he suckles like a vulture, patient, cold, mocking. My temper rises and drops from minute to minute. I scream at him, turn my back and refuse to play, then give in and beg him to enter torment. Through it all, he observes me with a slight, cunning smile, which spreads during my darkest moments as he feeds on my sorrow with relish. Since my cause is hopeless, I spend more and more time watching Dervish battle the familiars. He seems to have the upper hand. A pair are wounded in many places, but vein and artery are still active, tracking him, probing him for weak spots. A nasty Nick. Lord Loss notes, as Artery makes a pass that catches Dervish's left hip. Blood sprays into the air in slow motion, each drop vividly visible from where I sit. Dervish's lips press tightly together into a pained wince. I think your uncle might succumb before you do, Lord Loss says, reluctantly taking one of my pawns. And... As brave and resourceful as he is, he cannot continue forever. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I snarl. To see him fail. To be able to pin the blame on him and make him feel guilty. Bet you'd tell him I was enjoying great success on the boards. Torment him before you let your slaves finish him off. Lord Loss beams ghoulishly. You see through me, young Grubich. He purrs. I'm starting to, I mutter, and return to the game. I'm reaching forward to move a knight when I pause, thinking about what I just said. I am starting to understand how Lord Loss operates. He isn't a difficult creature to make sense of. As Dervish told me already, the demon master feeds on pain. He, dry, he thrives on the misery of others. Continue, Lord Loss encourages me nodding at the knight. That's one of your finer moves. You'll threaten both my rook and queen. I'll have to do some quick thinking to wriggle out of this one. <laughs> he laughs, as though my cunning delights him. But it's not my cunning he craves. It's my suffering. I withdraw my hand and jam it under the table, thinking furiously. My wits and chess skills are no match for Lord Loss's. I've tried all I can to upset his game plan and disturb his style of play. But what if the answer doesn't lie in the game? What if I can compete with him on an emotional level and undermine him that way? Thinking. He's a parasite. He feeds off the misery of others. He takes delight on my failings. Observing. His smile how it grows and my mood dips, the glow in his eyes when I run out of ideas and break down in tears, the eagerness with which he attacks, then withdraws. Wondering, what would happen if I robbed him of his grisly satisfaction? How would he respond if I cut off his supply of desperate grief? I close my eyes, forget the boards, the game, not loss. Think about Dervish and the speed with which he pushed me into his encounter. He could have prepared me for this in advance, told me about Billy and Lord Loss, worked with me on my weapons and chess skills, just like, he, just in case he ever had to use me. But he didn't. He dropped me in it. No training or commands except one simple core piece of advice. Don't act. React. Understanding clicks in. 
my eyes snap open. I've been going about this the wrong way. Thinking, plotting, planning, those are all things Dervish told me not to do. He warned me to obey my instincts, let the magic flow, react to the lunges and parries of the demons. He was talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat, but why shouldn't those guidelines apply to the chessboards too? I recall the way he launched into the game. No hesitation, no long study of the boards. I assumed it was because he had his game plan set clear in his mind before he sat down, but perhaps he didn't have one at all. Grubich? Lord Loss asks, fake concern in his expression. Are you well, my young friend? Can you continue? I stare at him wordlessly for a long, pregnant moment. Then I laugh. <laughs> of course I can, I boom, startling the demon master. <laughs> Forgive me for the long delay. I was trying to remember if I left the light on my bedroom before coming down. What? He blinks. <laughs> Dad hated it when I left the lights on, I tell him, casually moving my queen on the middle board forward, presenting her to Lord Loss's rook. Electricity bills don't pay themselves, you know. Your move. Lord Loss stares at me, astonished, then downs at the board. That was an unwise choice, he mutters. Born of haste, perhaps. No, I smirk. I knew what I was doing. You can retract the piece if you wish, he says. Really? It is not normally allowed. He smiles. But I will make an exception. Take your queen back. Recalculate. Choose a wiser course of action. Oh, very kind of you. I pull the queen back six places to her original position. Pause a moment. Then move her back forward into the exact same spot as before. Lord Loss's face darkens. I throw my head back and rock with laughter. <laughs> you would be well advised not to try my patience, he hisses. <laughs> to hell with your patience, I jeer. This game bores me. You bore me. Take my queen or drag things out. I don't care anymore. You wish to concede defeat? Lord Lars asks with undue eagerness. Nope, I chuckle. You'll have to come take me. And if you don't, if you play it coy, like you have been, I'll chase you. I'll give you no option but to rid me of my queens, rooks, and bishops. And you know what I'll do then, old friend? I'll giggle. I'll guffle. I'll positively explode with every last scrap of mirth I can muster. You've lost your mind, he croaks. No, I smile spitefully. You've lost your juicy meal ticket. I won't play the sad, bewildered victim any longer. You'll never feed from me again. You can kill me, but you won't squeeze one further drop of pleasure from me. Not if you keep me alive for 20 lifetimes. The demon lord's jaw trembles. His eyes flare with pale red light. The snakes in his chest slide under and over each other in a sudden frenzy. Then he reaches out, pushes his rook forward with a stubbly, ill-shaped excuse for a finger, and knocks my elfin queen from the table. In response, I look him straight in the eye and laugh. <laughs> Chapter 19. Spiral to the heart of nowhere. Lord Loss surrounds my king on the middle board. Checkmate. I giggle as my king melts. While it's still bubbling, I move a knife forward on the board to my right, then sit back and twiddle my thumbs, whistling tunelessly. This show of indifference does not become you, Lord Loss says stiffly, attacking my knight with a pawn. <clears throat> No show, I smile, switching play to the board on my far left. 
shoving a rook deep into enemy territory, barely thinking about it, not pausing afterwards to check my opponent's response. This is ridiculous, Grubich, Lord Loss says. He fakes an encouraging smile. If you throw the game away, you throw your life away too. You are already two games down. You cannot afford to lose again. You must concentrate. If not, you and your uncle. Chess is dumb, I interrupt. Like all games, it's silly and pointless. People who take it seriously are fools. I'm sorry, but I can't pretend to respect your foolishness any longer, regardless of what's at stake. The Demon Master's lips peel back from his sharp grey teeth. I could reach across and crush you into a million pieces, he hisses. But that won't silence my laughter, I giggle. Have you moved? I lean forward to advance a pawn on the ball to my left. Leave that alone! He shouts. I haven't had my turn yet. Well, hurry up, I tut. I've wasted enough time on this rubbish. Let's get it over and done with. Lord Lost trembles. Starts to say something. Catches himself. Mutters darkly and takes one of my pawns on the far left board. Before he's placed it on the desk, I push forward the pawn on the board to my near left. And once again fall back into studying my thumbs, twirling them mindlessly, thinking about summer, TV, music, anything except Lord Laws, his familiars, and chess. Lord Laws isn't smiling any longer. His features are contorted with hatred. He takes long, agonized pauses before each move, not to drag the torment out, but because he's unsure of himself. I think about cracking jokes or singing songs, but I don't want to go too overboard. Indifference is infuriating enough. He's unaccustomed to opponents showing no interest in the match of their fate. He's had long, delicious decades of pressure contests, feeding off the anxiety of those he faces, growing strong on it. He doesn't know how to cope with a vacant, yawning teenager. I don't play blindly, but I play recklessly, pushing forward on all three boards, taking wild chances, su surrendering myself to the random mechanics of chess. I'm presenting Lord Loss with more chances to finish me off than he could have ever dreamt of, but he fails to capitalize on them. He's too agitated to press for the kill. He fumblingly takes a few of my pieces, but doesn't follow up on the captures. And then I start taking his pieces. I capture pawns first, a few on each board. I line them up in neat little rows, toying with them while he contemplates his moves. Then one of his knights falls prey to my queen on the board to my right. On the far left board, I take a rook and a bishop in quick succession. While he struggles to shore up his defenses on that board, I push my queen ahead on the, ne on the board next to it, straight into the path of a black bishop. Lord Loss gasps, his face lighting up. He sweeps the bishop forward, giggling intensely, eyes shining evilly. I snort at the demon master's pleasure and slip a knight in behind his bishop. Check. He freezes, stares at the knight, then his king, then the captured queen in the mangled palm of his hand. His jaw quivers, then firms. A uh, clever strategy, he commends me with icy politeness. Actually, I only saw the opening as you were removing my queen, I answer honestly. Lucky, lucky I guess, though luck always plays a part in childish games like this. Lord Loss turns his face away in disgust. You are a disgrace to the game, he growls. So punish me, I goad him. Make me pay. Put me in my place. I adopt a very young child's t challenging tone. Dare ya, he hisses. Fixes his gaze on the boards, studies them feverishly. I pick at the nail on my left index finger 
I wonder if I should start using clippers instead of scissors. The balance of power lurches wildly between us. Lord Loss works hard to take three of my pawns. I respond by idly chasing his king with my knight on the board to my left, the one on which I lost my queen. He blocks my path, attacks my knight, and does all he can to repulse me. But I hang in there, amused by his failure to capture my knight. After a while, I start thinking how lonely he looks. A single white knight stranded amidst a sea of black, and to provide him with company, I press forward with a bishop and a rook. Lord Loss throws everything into smashing the three white irritants. He abandons attack completely and chases my knight, bishop, and rook as though they were responsible for some personal insult. After several frenzied twists and cutbacks, he traps my bishop and chuckles fiercely. Next move, it's mine. Yeah, I reckon you're right, I sigh, then grin impishly and push a pawn forward. I'm not quite sure how it got there, but it's now only one space away from the end of the board where I can exchange it for any piece I like. But on the move after that, my pawn becomes queen. Much preferable to a bishop, don't you think? Lord Lost stares at the pawn, then the knight, then back at the pawn. Two of his spare arms unfold around him. He covers his eyes and moans. Checkmate, I mutter the word motionlessly and scratch my left elbow. Can I make your king melt? I ask curiously. Lord Lost doesn't respond. His eyes are fixed on the trapped king on the board to my left, as though he can spot a way out of it that... As though we can spot a way out if he looks at it long enough. Hey, I asked if I could make your the black king the black king explodes into tiny shards. I duck to avoid the flying bits of crystal. When I look again, Lord Loss's face is peppered with shiny splinters. Blood trickles from the cuts. <laughs> you should take more pride in your appearance, I tell him. Never attract girls with an ugly mug like that. I'll see you suffer for this, he says hoarsely. Red eyes bulging. Win or lose, I'll find a way to make to pay you back for the insults you've dealt me tonight. I don't know what you're talking about, I smile. Surely can't be an insult to show no interest in a game in which I have no interest. Later, Lord Loss hisses, head shaking violently. Later. He turns to the board on my right, the one with the ink in pieces, and broods over it in menacing silence, collecting his thoughts. He pushes me hard on the ink board. Slow but steady advances, cutting off my avenues of attack, forcing me back, pegging me to my own half. I take no notice of the mounting threat. When I can't move forward, I slide sideways, dancing out of the path of his soldiers, shrugging it off when he captures one of my rooks, laughing as my knight leaps clear of the closing nets. Lord Loss's breath thickens as the closer he gets to victory. Bloody sweat seeps from his paws. He twitches on his chair, I ignore the danger I'm in, keep one eye on Dervish as I shift a pawn forward. He's locked in close quarters combat with the familiars, holding artery away from his throat at arm's length, while Vane chews on his left leg. It looks serious, but I observe with cool disinterest. Lord Loss grunts contentedly and takes my pawn. A path is opening up to my king. Another few moves, and I'll have to sacrifice my queen. You're not laughing now. Lord Loss notes sadistically. Only because my laughter seems to disturb you, I smile sweetly, sending one of my knights to the right of the board to cover my queen. Lord Loss brings up a rook, blocking my queen's path of retreat. I move my knight again, lodging it between my queen and his rook. Grinning wickedly, he swiftly takes my knight with a pawn. 
I wince, then wink. <laughs> I can't believe you fell for that one, I chortle. Picking up my queen, I slide her diagonally far up the board, through the gap left by the pawn he moved when capturing my knight, and knock Lord Loss's black queen clean off the table. His breath stops, his mouth closes, his stomach rumbles. Checkmate in four moves, I note dryly. Or is it three? In response, Lord Loss picks up his king and crushes it softly between his mangled fingers. Two, two, he croaks and turns to the board on my far left, the final board, the decider. Lord Loss moves his pieces sluggishly. He plays with sad remoteness, face cast in dull misery, flinching every time I capture one of his pieces, handing the game to me without a real fight. I feel a bubble of joy rising in my chest and swiftly move to burst it. If I show any emotion now, he might seize upon it and revive with a flourish. Although it's difficult, I remain detached, moving my pieces instinctively, automatically, not dwelling upon thoughts of victory. Gradually, I rip his defenses to shreds. I check his king, and he beats a sad retreat. For a couple of moves, he threatens my queen, but then I drag her out of the way and check him again with a rook. For a second time, his king is forced to flee. A short while later, I trap him on the left side of the board. He's caught between my queen, two knights, and a bishop. He starts to move his king, pauses, does a double take, sighs deeply, and slowly tips the king over. <sighs> Checkmate, he intones morosely. I blink. I hadn't seen it. Are you sure? I ask, frowning. In response, he pushes himself away from the table and floats out of his chair. Face impassive. Real time crashes over me. I'm hit by a wave of hot air. Sounds, Billy's howls, the snapping of vein and artery's teeth, dervish's grunts. I spin. My uncle's on the floor, furiously wrestling with the demons. Blood everywhere. His leg, his left leg cut to ribbons. His right hand chewed off. Stop them! I scream, starting to dervish's aid. Artery hears me, turns and snarls spreads his hand wide. Morsels of dervish's flesh caught between his teeth, rises to meet me. Peace, artery, Lord Loss says, and the demon stops. Cease, vain, he commands, and the crocodile-headed monster quits chewing on dervish's arm and looks questioningly at her master. I have been beaten. We must respect the rules of the game. The demon... The demons chatter and gibber madly. The flames in Artery's eyes flare and he hisses at his lord, shaking his head negatively. Vane snaps her jaws open and shut, then turns on Dervish again. You will obey me, Lord Loss says softly, or I shall have your heads. The demons pause. Then Vane clamps her teeth around Dervish's arm. Dervish screams. A blinding red light fills the cellar. I shut my eyes and cover my face with my arms. When I dare look again, veins lying in scraps of bloody flesh around my uncle. Artery is backed up to one of the webs and is whimpering fearfully. Lord Loss floats over to Dervish and studies him blankly as he sits up and sets to work on his injuries, using magic to patch himself back together. A one, I remark carefully approaching my preoccupied uncle, wary of Lord Loss. He might have killed the rebellious vein, but I still don't trust him. So I see, Dervish says, not glancing up from his wounds. I'm bitterly disappointed by his reaction. I expected cheers and tears, hugging and backslapping. Not this. Well, you needn't sound so excited about it, I sniff. Dervish looks up at me. A thin smile crosses his lips, then vanishes. 
I'm delighted, Grubbs, he says. Truly. But this isn't over for me. I have to fight Lord Lost now, and it's a fight I probably won't win. So while I'm ecstatic for you and Billy, I'm a little too worried about myself to celebrate. What are you talking about? We won. I beat him. We can... I stop, recalling the full rules of the challenge. Lord Lost is under an oath to cure the person affected by lycanthropy if he loses a chest, but the one who beats him has to travel to the demon artist's universe and fight him there. But I beat him, I cry, stooping to catch Dervish's eye. I'm the one who has to go with him and... No, Dervish interrupts. The player always goes, while the one who fought the familiars remains. But since we swap roles, we can choose who goes and stays. Isn't that right? He asks, he asks Lord Loss. Lord Loss nods slightly. It is an ambiguous point, but I have had enough of the boy. I shall seek him out some other time. As I vowed, he will pay for his humiliation of me. But for now, I wish only to wash my hands of him. But you're wounded, I protest. You're not fit to fight anymore. Let me. I know how to beat him. I can do it. I'll... This isn't a debate, Dervish says gruffly. He grips both of my hands in his... In his and squeezes tightly. You performed brilliantly on the board, Scrubs, but this is a different matter. He's far stronger in his own universe than he is here. Leave it to me, okay? Tears roll down my cheeks unchecked. I don't want to lose you, I sob. But you must, he smiles, at least for a while. He finishes healing himself and stands, groaning loudly, turns to Lord Loss. The cure? Lord Loss sneers. I had not forgotten. He floats across the room to the cage. Billy backs away, snarling fitfully, but a gesture from the demon master, he flies across the cage and thrusts his arms through the bars. Lord Loss wraps two of his own arms around Billy's and slides the other six through the bars of the cage, encompassing the struggling werewolf. He exerts pressure until Billy goes stiff, then presses his face forward, places his lips over Billy's, and exhales heavily, as though giving the kiss of life. Billy's fingers fly out rigidly, then curl up into a tight fists. His legs shake fitfully, then go slack. After 10 or 12 seconds, Lord Loss breaks contact and releases Billy. He floats backwards, coughing and spitting. Billy teeters on his feet a moment, then crumbles to the floor. I start towards my brother, concerned. Dervish stops me. Wait, you'll be okay. There are things I must tell you before we say goodbye. I face my uncle, who speaks quickly. You know where the forms, credit cards, and contact numbers are. Use them, act swiftly. Don't be ashamed to ask for help, and don't let the authorities take you away from here. They might interfere when they discover the condition I'm in. <sighs> Seek to separate you from me. Don't let them. His face is grim. Lord Loss has threatened you. That's serious. He can't harm you in Castle Vale, as long as you stay out of this cellar. But you're vulnerable elsewhere. In time, you'll learn spells to protect yourself. Friends of mine will help, but for now, you mustn't leave the veil. What can I do to stop them? I ask. Stand up to them. Sick my lawyers, your lawyers on them. Be brave. Prove you're fit to live independently. Don't give them any excuse to take you away. Mira will help if she recovers, but you'll have to do a lot. You do, but you'll have to do a lot of it yourself. Lord Loss has drifted to the edge of the cellar while we've been talking. He's floating in front of a thick bank of webs, gesturing at them with all eight arms, muttering something inhuman. Artery has crept up beside his master and squats sullenly next to him. As I watch, the webs shimmer, then twist in a clockwise direction, 
winding and wrapping together. The center of the web pulses outwards a couple of times, then stretches backwards at lightning speed, cutting a path through the layers of webs behind it, creating an impossibly long rotating funnel from the cellar to make an indefinite point beyond. Take care of Billy, Dervish says. You won't remember any of this. It's up to you to tell him. It's up to you how much you tell him. I won't advise you one way or the other on that. If you start to change, he hesitates, then presses on. Mira and one of my other friends might challenge Lord Loss on your behalf. If you want to make a fight of it, ask Mira, and she can... No, I interrupt softly. I won't put anybody else through this. It wouldn't be fair. If the Kurtz hits me, I'll abandon myself to it or call in the lambs, but I won't ask anyone to face Lord Loss for me. Dervish smiles wildly. You might lose some of those noble ideas when you get a bit older. His smile softens. But I hope not. It is time, Dervish Grady, Lord Loss says. The spiraling funnel he's created grows, glows redly. The web's revolving rapidly. Artery leaps onto the web at the rim of the funnel. He's sucked into it instantly. Spins around several times, head over heels, then vanishes down the funnel's moor, never to be seen again in these parts again. I hope. Must you go? I sob, clutching Dervish's hands. Yes, he answers simply. If I refused, he could bring his hordes of familiars through and destroy us all. How will I know if you're successful? I gulp. As long as I'm fighting, I'll be an emotionless shell here, he says. If I lose, that won't change, and you'll never know. I'll simply die of old age. But if I win, he winks. <laughs> Don't worry. You'll soon find out. Dervish faces Lord Loss in the funnel, takes a deep breath, holds it, lets it out nervously. Remember, Grubs, he mutters. Don't give up on me, no matter how much time passes, even if it's decades. There's always hope. I'll look after you, I promise, weeping uncontrollably. Your mum and dad would have been proud of you tonight, Dervish says. Gret too. With that, he turns his back on me and marches to the funnel. Lord Loss bows politely as he approaches, then unfolds all eight of his arms and strikes for Dervish's throat. Dervish ducks swiftly, avoiding the Demon Master's lunge. Ah, <laughs> uh ah, -uh, he laughs. You won't make that quick a finish of me. Leaping over the demon, he grabs a hold of a thick strand of web, spins around, hollering wildly, then disappears down the funnel, becoming a speck, then nothing. Lord Loss floats towards the opening, glances back at me, cold, eyes cold and hateful. In the past, I've respected those who bested me, he snarls. But you belittled both the game and me. I will be keeping a close watch on you, Grubich Grady. And if you ever... My name's Grubbs, I grunt, cutting him short. I step forward, wiping tears from my face. Now sod off back to your own world, you motherless scum, and save your threats for those who care. For a moment, it looks like he's going to abandon protocol and rip me to shreds. But then he snarls, whirls away from me, and hurls himself into the funnel of webs. There's a flash. The world turns red, then black. The webs fade. The funnel blinks out of existence. Walls and ceiling slowly return. It ends. Chapter 20. The Change. Working numbly. A quick trip to the, a quick trip to the house to fetch new candles. Then I sweep debris, broken chessboards and pieces out of the way. Methodical, 
chasing every last splinter and shard, stacking them neatly against the walls. Need to keep active, not dwelling on the game on the fight or dervish. His body rematerialized as, it re as reality returned, but only his body, not his mind. He stands by the wall to my left, vacant, unresponsive, eyes glazed over. Billy regains consciousness and, and humanity as I'm coming towards the end of my big cleanup. Ah, uh, where am I? He mutters. What's happening? He stands shakily and stares at the bars of the cage. His voice rises fearfully. What am I doing here? Where's Dervish? What's... It's okay, I shush him, fetching the key and unlocking the door. Dervish is over by that wall. There's no need to be afraid. Billy stumbles out of the cage and glances nervously at this eerily emotionless man in the candlelit shadows. What's the story? He asks. The last thing I remember is following Dervish and nothing. I haven't thought about what I'm going to tell Bill E. So I say the first thing that comes to my head. We were right. Dervish was a werewolf. He knocked you out and brought you here. I tracked him and fought with him. He recovered. He was grief stricken when he realized what he'd done. The change had never affected him this way before. He gave me a book with a spell in it and told me to cast it. What sort of spell? Billy asks, edging closer to Dervish. A calming spell, I improvise. He'd been saving it for an emergency. It stops him from turning into a werewolf, but it also robs him of his personality. He's like a zombie now. He can't speak or respond. I don't know how long he'll stay that way. Maybe forever. But if he recovers, he'll be safe. He won't change again. Billy waves a hand in front of his uncle's eyes. Dervish doesn't blink. He's crying when he looks at me. I didn't want this, he sobs. I wanted to stop him harming people, but not this way. There was no other solution short of killing him, I answer quietly. Dervish had controlled the beast all these years, but it had grown stronger and was close to overwhelming him. And you don't know how long you'll be like this? Billy asks. I shake my head. A week? A year? A decade? There's no telling. Billy smiles weakly. He must have really loved me to do this to himself, he notes proudly. Only a father would act this selflessly. I start to tell Billy the truth, that Dervish is his uncle, not his... With my... My dad was his dad. I'm his brother. Then stop. What would it achieve? If I told him, he'd have to come to terms with his real dad's death and being an orphan. This way, he believes he's not alone. I think it's better to have a zombie for a father than no father at all. <sighs> yeah, I nod tiredly. He was your dad. No doubt about it. Stepping forward, I take hold of one of Dervish's hands and press the other into Billy's. Now let's get the hell out of here. This place gives me the creeps. Days. Mira recovers the following afternoon. No memory loss or serious injury. I tell her the whole story while Billy's at home with Ma and Pa Spleen. She weeps when she sees Dervish, cradles his face, calls his name, scours his eyes for a trace of who he was. Nothing. Weeks. Lawyers. Social workers, bankers. Mira goes through Dervish's drawers with me, sets the bureaucratic wheels in motion. My world becomes a flurry of legal papers and professional advice. Concerned officials kept at bay by, David, by Dervish's lawyers. 
regular inspections, visits from doctors and welfare workers, tests, under observation, having to prove myself capable of looking after both myself and my uncle. Dervish isn't that difficult to care for. I lay out his clothes each night and dress him as soon as he wakes in the morning. He can go to the toilet himself, once I point him the right way. When I lead him down to breakfast, he sits and eats. After that, he does whatever I tell him. Rests or exercises or walks with me to the Vale to stock up on supplies and prove to everybody that he's healthy and unharmed. He's empty, distressingly so, and I have to spend a lot of time on him. But I can cope. Months. Autumn trundles around and I have to start school, leaving Dervish alone in the house. I'm nervous the first few days, worrying about him, but when I realize he can't come to harm, I relax and settle down. I sit next to Billy in most classes. I've had to repeat a year to make up for all the work I missed. We get on better than ever. Occasionally, he'll make mention of that night in the forest and cellar, but I always change the conversation quickly. I've no wish to dwell on such matters. I enjoy school and making friends, even homework. This is reality, the normal, dull, everyday world. It's great to be back. A year. I grow 10 centimeters, broaden. I was always large for my age. Now I'm positively massive and still growing. Billy calls me the impeccable Hulk and refers to the two of us as little and large. He spent a lot of weekends with Dervish and me, watching DVDs and MTV. He says we should hold a party and invite some girls over. Says we could act like lords in a castle. Talks of getting a monocle for his lazy left eye and crowning himself King Billy the First. I just smile and say nothing when he starts up with fantasy stuff like that. Of course I'm interested in girls, but I'm not ready for dating yet. One step at a time. The demons were scary, but girls? Well... Girls are really terrifying. Dervish hasn't changed. As lifeless as ever. Eyes blank, never smiling or frowning, laughing or crying. I talk to him all the time, telling him about school, discussing TV shows, running maths problems by him. He never shows any signs he understands. But it's comforting to treat him like an ordinary person. And maybe somewhere far away in the midst of a bloody battle, he hears. And perhaps it helps. I take him to the barbers once a month to have his hair and beard cut, buy new clothes for him every so often, experiment with various brands of deodorant, keep him respectable and in shape, so if he ever does return, he won't have cause for complaint. Mira drops by every few weeks or so, keeps an eye on us, drives me outside the Vale to hit the bigger stores, I tell her what Dervish said about not leaving Kasri Vale, but she says it's okay as long as she's with me. But we're careful not to linger, always back a couple of hours before the sun sets. Demons are more powerful in this world at night. She usually sleeps over when she comes. Billy jokes about it and says we're having an affair. <laughs> I wish. I often dream of Lord Lawson as familiars. I worry about his threat and what he'll do to me if he ever gets the chance. I block the entrances to the secret cellar with thick planks of dozens of nails. Avoiding Dervish's study as much as possible for fear I'd find a book about Lord Loss, which might somehow allow him to latch onto me and break through Dervish's magic defenses. But even more than the Demon Master, I worry about changing. Every time a full moon comes, I sleep nervously, if at all, tossing and turning. Imagining the worst, checking under my nails first thing in the morning, examining my teeth and eyes in the mirror. I've memorized the names and numbers of the lambs, the Grady executioners. If I have to call them one day, I pray that I have the strength to do it. The morning after a full moon. Fourteen months since my battle with Lord Loss. A crisp, sun-crowned morning. Stretching, yawning, thinking about school. Also about a girl, Rennie Gossel. 
I like Rennie. She's very cute. And she's been giving me the sort of looks, which make me think that maybe she thinks I'm cute too. Wonder if it's time to hold that party Billy's been pressing for. My cheeks feel sticky. Curious. I rub a few fingers over them. They come away wet and red. My head flares. Heart pounds. Stomach clenches. Thoughts of school and Rennie forgotten. I fall out of bed. Desperately check under my nails. Dirty with earth and blood. Hair stuck to my hands and around my mouth. Moaning. Slapping off the hairs. I reel out of the room and down the stairs, almost falling and breaking my neck. Head spinning, lights exploding within my brain, vomit rising in my throat. Telephone numbers flash across my eyes. And the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. Into the kitchen. Dervish is sitting at the table, slowly spooning cornflakes into his mouth. I turn in circles, wringing my hands, tearing at my hair. My eyes fixed on the telephone hanging from the wall. I stop panicking. Calm falls on me like a sudden cold rainfall. I know what I must do. Best to do it now, as soon as possible, before I lose my nerve. Call the executionist. Give myself over to the lambs. Arrange for others to take care of Dervish. Bid this world farewell. I start towards the phone, resigned to my fate. A solemn voice behind me. Rubs? I turn slowly, reluctantly, for some reason expecting to see Lord Loss. But there's only Dervish. He's holding up a tin of red paint, a small pot of earth, and a tatty woolen scarf which, he, which has been ripped into hairy fragments. <laughs> the look on your face, my uncle says, and grins. And that's it. See you next time.